listen what I say. The captain is a tyrant and I no longer obey. I'm sick of taking orders from the madman in command. So let's drop him on an island and leave him in the sand. Cause it's a mutiny. It's a mutiny. It's a mutiny. And I will take Hello and the welcome ship. to the History of the it's Atlantic World podcast, a member of the Big Heads Media Network. This is part six of the Conquest of the Americas. I am your caffeinated host, Jesse Wiest. Thank you for listening. Now, as you know, Big Heads Media is sort of like the Netflix of podcasts. And because that's because what they do is penetrate the deep, dark forest of the internet. They find and hew down only the very best of podcasts. And they do that so they can present only the finest of timbers to people like you and me who enjoy listening to podcasts. Now, needless to say, this means that we are part of an excellent lineup of history shows, uh, like Body Count, for example. Uh, let me tell you, this show is fucking mahogany. So thanks for checking out their promo, and then we'll get to the show. Well, you may think that history is, eh, vaguely interesting, the truth is it's fun and metal AF. Echoes of the past are still reverberating through our world today, and Body Count is here to show you how our shared history affects your life on the daily. Whether you know it or not. So, are you past the point of higher education? Feel like you didn't learn anything from your high school history teacher? Or just didn't give a flying crap about it? Are you tired of always missing out on the yellow history pie piece and trivial pursuit? Are you the horror of all your friends' game nights? Did you once proudly announce that Napoleon Bonaparte was a super short little nutsack? When in reality, he was an average-sized nutsack. Have you been thinking about living under a faulty dam? Or perhaps an active volcano? <laughs> well, we have good news. It's not too late for you or your homeowner's insurance. Come on over and listen to Body Count, the podcast that explores death and disaster through the ages with only one rule. Someone, or usually a lot of someones, dies. dies. Because history doesn't repeat itself, it rhymes. A proud member of the MSE Podcast Network. It's been far too long, folks, and I mention that specifically because for those of you listening within, say, a few days of me having uploaded this, I imagine that probably means, unless you're just checking out my ad, that you really enjoy this show a lot. And so I want to apologize to you for how long it took me to complete this episode. Now, if you're listening to this show later, I want to timestamp it for you to help you understand. Today is November 7th, uh, 2020. Obviously, this has been a very difficult year for a lot of people. I essentially had to take uh, basically a couple of months off from the show, from where I would, the time uh, I would normally be working on the show, I had to get a, a part time job, and money was just a little tight around my household for a while. Um, August and September and into October of this year. Uh, so it took me a long fucking time to finish writing this script. Um, now, anyway, my troubles, frankly, pale in comparison to what a lot of other people have experienced this year. Um, so, frankly, that's enough of my whining, anyway, uh, because this is not the story of Jesse Wiest. This is the story of the fall of the Mexica. I mean, hell, I'm not the only one who had to take the, a hiatus, anyway. I mean, they fucking canceled sports for a few months. Sports! Well, just like this show is back, so are sports, folks. The Maya and the Mexica, for example, they loved gambling on the sports that they used to play. And now you can, too, with MyBookie.com. Beyond that, you can double your first deposit. With the return of winning season, that means Survivor, Super Contests, and Squares. And if you want to make like Montezuma and celebrate the NFL season, then check out MyBookie.com because signing up now means you'll get a dollar for dollar match all the way up to a thousand dollar bets. And that puts you in the MyBookie Super Contest. Now, to do that, you pick five NFL games against a spread. Never pick the Cowboys. And whammo, you've got a chance at a $100,000 grand prize in prizes. Excuse me, 100000 in uh, grand prizes. I'm talking cash. Uh, it's simple. You make your picks, you win big, you collect your cash. 
It's really a no-brainer. Uh, your winning season begins today, only at mybookie.com. Now, folks, thanks for supporting the people who support this show. Uh, now, technically, I want to point out that my audience isn't really big enough that I am getting any kind of fat check from any kind of advertisement I do. The uh, tiny bit of revenue from ads I do uh, goes, I put straight into marketing the show to help, you know, keep growing the audience. Um, but you can help support the show directly. Uh, first, if you haven't, take a moment to share, subscribe, rate, review the podcast if possible. Um, and uh, if you're really feeling generous, head on over to patreon.com uh, backslash Atlantic World. Become a patron of the show. Uh, by doing that, you'll literally be helping me buy books for future episodes. You can do so for as little as $1 per month, which is, frankly, a pittance in exchange for some great history content. Uh, you can check out the show notes for links to all this great stuff. And in addition, I've also got the uh, bibliography for this episode listed there if you would like to read and learn more. Um, so, that means the conquest of Mexico is upon us here at the History of the Atlantic World podcast. Inarguably, this is one of the most influential moments in the history of the world. Uh, this is a story of courage, treachery, and conquest. In fact, it is perhaps the greatest conquest of all time, wherein Hernan Cortes and a handful of Spaniards conquer a vast empire of millions, behind a backdrop of two completely independent worlds meeting one another for the first time. I mean, if you tried to argue with me that the conquest of Mexico was more important even than what we've already discussed about what happens in 1492? Well, I'm not going to lie. Maybe you could convince me. Now, moreover, this is a story that has been told before. It's been told so many times, in fact, that even people with barely any passing interest in uh, history could probably tell you a little bit about Cortes and Montezuma. Of course, the details... Uh, however, are often poorly understood. Well, like the popular understanding of any historical event, frankly. But in part, the history of the conquest of Mexico is a bit obscure because even though it has been told many times, the accounts conflict. Uh, conflict, I don't know why I said that's so weird. On some, at any rate, they conflict on some of the most important events of the conquest. The participants, too, were biased, starting with Cortes himself. He wrote several letters back to Spain talking about the conquest, but the political motivations he had are kind of obvious, frankly, uh, especially if you're reading, even if you're just reading them and you don't even know anything about this beforehand. Um, when, and especially, they're especially, uh, Cortes, you can see some of his bias if you compare the descriptions of some of the events that take place with the descriptions that some of his fellow conquistadors give of those same events. Um, Cortes regularly minimizes both the efforts of his Indian allies, which might not surprise you, but of his fellow Spaniards. Um, luckily for us, several conquistadors, though, however, also wrote about the conquest. And... Um, they do some justice, so quite a bit of justice, towards correcting some of Cortez's bias. But they still suffer from misinterpretations at times, especially of the actions of the Aztecs. Uh, to the Spaniards, human sacrifice and cannibalism were horrifying in the extreme. Now, even though the Spanish had no problem with, say, burning people alive, or cutting the hands off of someone who they suspected was a spy, or... Uh, you know, trying a criminal and then killing them without trial. Um, those, just so you know, were practices that would have horrified na the natives in, in Mexico. But in contrast, the natives in Mexico had no problem cutting out someone's heart, turning their skin into a cloak, wearing it, and then eating part of their thigh. Now, those particular practices, combined with the Mexican worship of what looked like bloody heathen gods, um, or what were, I guess, bloody heathen gods, um, 
To the Christians of the 1500s, this all seemed to basically add up to devil worship. They could not comprehend how Mexicans even put up with such practices that, you know, like they were being imprisoned in this religion by the priesthood. Um, now, that is a little funny, a little ironic maybe, because they venerated Jesus Christ and various Christian saints who were often depicted as crucified, decapitated, uh, had their breasts cut off, or otherwise mutilated with swords, arrows, or hot pokers. Um, so the fact that they, they didn't like the bloody heathen gods is a, li it's a little ironic, but um, regardless... Whatever bias we might find in the Spanish accounts, one thing is clear. Cortes was only accompanied by a few hundred men, yet somehow he decisively defeated an empire of millions, and he did it in a very short amount of time. Or at least we could make that claim if we completely disregard the account of the natives. Uh, or accounts of the natives, excuse me. That's what quite a few early writers of the conquest did. Um, Europeans who attributed the conquest uh, to Cortez, or attribute Cortez's success to things like um, European cultural superiority or Cortez's psychological superiority, for example. Uh, uh, the early European writers often saw those things as at least as important or as guns or horses uh, in an attempt basically to make the, the conquistadors into heroes, um, which helped justify the conquest of the Americas, frankly. Uh, the most important primary source of the conquest, though, um, is probably the work of the conquistador Bernal Diaz del Castillo. It's entitled The True History of the Conquest of New Spain. Now, the reason Diaz titled his work The True History was specifically to dispute what other writers were saying about the conquest. Uh, at the time, uh, and which Diaz felt was too focused on the actions of Cortes. Diaz believed that the ordinary Spanish soldier, and he was one of them, deserved a lot more credit. So he made it a specific point um, in his uh, work to, to tell people uh, a lot about a lot of the different conquistadors, um, their, even even what they looked like and their personalities sometimes. And, and combined with the fact that Bernal Diaz's memory, just it, it just seems to have been a lot better than a lot of his uh, fellow conquistadors who wrote about the conquest or were interviewed about it. I mean, his account, his big book is an invaluable source. Now, there are far fewer texts that exist from the indigenous point of view, but they do exist, and they help provide a counterpoint to some of the Spanish claims. A Franciscan friar named Bernardino de Sahagún, and I want to say I will probably mm. massacre the uh, pronunciations of um, some of the some of the stuff here, especially in Nahuatl. Uh, I apologize in advance, of course. Um, anyway, Sahagun uh, gathered testimony after the conquest uh, from survivors, uh, which sh really showed that the conquest of Mexico was anything but a simple battle between Spaniards on, Spaniards on one side and Indians on the other. Rather, Sahagun's informants, as they are known to history, are in the small assortment of other native texts from the era, show that a variety of opinions and political considerations went into the uh, decisions that various native groups made when they decided to side with either the Aztecs or the Spanish. Now, the Spanish, uh, living as we are in the future, undoubtedly come out of the conquest as the victors. But many indigenous groups were victors as well, militarily at least. Now, the victory, however, is made complicated, and that's because smallpox arrives from Europe for the first time at Hispaniola in 1518 and reaches Mexico during the events which I'm about to tell you all about, uh, which is going to take place basically from uh, for the actions of Cortes, anyway, from 1519 to 1521, basically, and we'll get to all of that in due time. Uh, but at any rate, most other indigenous accounts of the conquest weren't really available to anyone uh, 
at least any any of the writers um, until about 450 years after the conquest. Um, and that's because the scholar Miguel Leon Portilla did not translate the 16th century accounts of Nahuatl, or the, he did not translate Nahuatl uh, until uh, about 450 years after the conquest. Um, Miguel Leon Portilla's uh, book um, uh, has been since translated into dozens of languages, including English in 1962. It is called The Broken Spears. It is an invaluable source. Um, and so because th that wasn't written until the late 50s or early 60s, I think the late 50s um, is when he translated into Spanish originally, um, that means most of the histories written about the conquest of Mexico are incomplete by that fact alone. Um, now, I wouldn't even begin Though, to speculate how many books in total have been written about the conquest, or I mean, and you know, if you include biographies of Cortez and Montezuma, um, yeah, countless. But for what it's worth, there are three critical texts written in English, anyway, about the conquest. In my humble opinion, one is William H. Prescott's History of the Conquest of Mexico. It is the original historical account of the conquest in English. Um, now, Prescott was writing in the late 19th century, and so, as you might imagine, he might be... Well, he's pretty racist. He really hates the Aztecs. He can barely believe any of their cultural accomplishments, and he makes it a point to condescend towards their accomplishments at every opportunity. Now, with that said, he doesn't really like the Spanish all that much either. It's kind of funny, on account of them being Catholic. Um, now, with that said... Prescott, though, the reason this book is important, other than it's like kind of the first one, first really good history uh, uh, written in English, um, Prescott writes some very flowery po prose. Uh, despite his views, um, the history he writes is a good one, and um, but and you know as you might know, he wrote a long time before the Broken Spears were published. Now, the next uh, important. A uh, book written about this is by Hugh Thomas, I, in my opinion, uh, who is an excellent historian uh, of the Atlantic world. He published Conquest in 1993. It's a great tomb. To me, this is essentially the Bible of the conquest of Mexico. I can't recommend the book enough. If you want more info uh, on the conquest after this episode, I would suggest more than anything this book. Now, while Prescott kind of writes with the most descriptive and flowery prose on this topic, you know, uh, people don't write like the way he wrote in the, you know, people just, in the 1800s, people just wrote better. They weren't, <laughs> they, had, they had more time. Uh, and we're going to be quoting a, a few of his passages today, but, but Thomas is no slouch. It, it's a good read. And in addition, there's a lot of materials that were not available to Prescott when he wrote. Uh, Thomas, though, examined key texts, not, not just the Broken Spears, but also uh, a, the Residencia of 1524 against the governor of Cuba, Diego Velasquez, uh, who was Cortez's one-time superior, uh, and the papers of Cortez's boat builder, uh, Martin Lopez, and uh, several other uh, statements uh, which had not yet been published by conquistadors until Thomas found and, and wrote about uh, them in his book. Now, so this, uh, combined with the native accounts, uh, makes this, just Thomas's work, incredible. Now, with that said, as fantastic as conquest is, Hugh Thomas's conclusions, in my opinion, leave a lot to be desired. Basically, Thomas concludes that Hernan Cortez was just indispensable. Spain would not have conquered Mexico without him, and we'll talk about that at the end of the episode as to why I think he's wrong. So definitely read Hugh Thomas if you're so inclined, but don't sleep on this one last book either. That's Mexico and the Spanish Conquest by Ross Hassig. Hassig didn't write the same sort of book as either Thomas or Prescott, who both provide just loads of description. They, they kind of make you feel like you're there, if you, if you, if you want. Um, Hassig provides a very bare-bones account of the conquest. He focuses on the major events only, and I know that sounds horrible, but trust me, by 
Him not spending any time recounting the splendor of the Mexican costumes or the debates that the conquistadors had or the details of minor battles or diplomatic engagements, Hasik is freed to focus on something else, which nobody really before him had focused on to nearly that extent. And it's very important. And what Hasik focuses on is logistics. Now, on the one hand, this might seem boring. But by focusing on, quote, mundane yet crucial issues as logistics and march rates, unquote, Hasek presents a fuller and more accurate interpretation of what happened in Mexico. He even goes so far as to state, uh, and provides a very compelling case for this, that the Indians were the key movers and shakers of the conquest, that the Spaniards were exploited so that indigenous people of Mexico could free themselves from Aztec control. And I, I'm not sure if I'd go entirely as far as he does. But uh, it's not really, it's hard to dispute that the conquest of Mexico was anything other than the result of an alliance of Spanish and indigenous armies and motivations. Excuse me. Now, I suppose then that we should get started on our tale. But before we do, uh, just one more quick point of business to discuss, and that's that we won't be talking, uh, if you are kind of new to this show, um, we will not be talking this episode, broadly speaking, about indigenous Mesoamerican culture. Um, not because it's not important, au contraire, because it is so important, it deserves its own episode. Uh, if you are interested in that, uh, I published Blood Oath. It's a deep dive into all things Aztec, Maya, and more in pre-Columbian Mesoamerican history. It will provide a lot of context and a general history of Mesoamerica up to the eve of contact. So by all means, check out Blood Oath if you want to learn more about the Mexica, the Maya, and everything else. I assure you that episode is not for the faint of heart. I can also assure you that I hope to never again attempt another six-hour-long episode. That was really rough on me. Okay, well, so for this episode, uh, we're not going to get into any Mesoamerican culture or society, at least not in like an explanatory way, except for uh, this one thing about uh, language, I guess, in addition to me apologizing for mis, uh, uh, you know, mispronunciations if I, if I do that. I will occasionally use the terms, you know, Mexico and Aztecs, obviously, as you have heard. But that's not really how those people really talked about themselves. Uh, Mexica and Mexico are probably more correct phonetically to talk about people of this period of time. And other than that comment, or if you're if you're wondering where Mexica and Mexico come from, stuff like that, that that's why. Um, other than that, uh, we're basically about to focus on the events of the fall of the Empire of the Mexica, specifically from about 1517 to 1521. Now, with that said, I still do want to be able to understand the Mexica, for us to walk a mile in their shoes and empathize with them if we can. That's because this is a culture that we have more in common with, perhaps, uh, than you might realize. Um, and because these are fraught times where our future is uncertain, perhaps it might be to our, be, uh, to our advantage to learn from the downfall of the Mexica. Um, because, if nothing else, well, their story will show you just how bad things could get. Now, now, unfortunately for me, the storyteller, there's a giant mountain in the way of me trying to help you understand just how alike you are to the Mexica. Now, that mountain, of course, is basically a mountain of skulls, which make up the remains of the hundreds of thousands of people who were the victims of human sacrifice as a result of, say, them losing war against the Aztecs. How could we possibly believe that we are similar to such people? They believed in human sacrifice. They practiced it regularly. Well, lucky for you, we can cross that mountain and better understand the Aztecs, because I am an excellent guide, and I know of a secret pass through that mountain. Yes, friends, you might not believe it, but I promise you right now, you believe in human sacrifice, too. Now, 
For those of you who have already listened to Blood Oath, you already know that you believe in human sacrifice, and pardon me for basically telling the same story twice. I promise to try to never do this again in the future. But if we're going to understand Mesoamerica, we really need to understand human sacrifice. Aztec family structure, schools, monetary systems, construction and engineering accomplishments, all of that you can learn by listening to Blood Oath. Today we'll just get by on this. The Mesoamericans practiced all sorts of sacrifices, human and otherwise, through their history. Bloodletting is one that's uh, basically a sacrifice of blood without the death, and that was a regular religious event. Needles are used a lot to take blood from tongues, lobes of ears, even uh, penises, and that blood would then be obtained via straws and fed to the gods. Animals and birds, especially uh, especially birds, uh, were often also sacrificed. And, and in fact, human sacrifice actually was practiced um, on what you might call a modest scale um, for thousands of years throughout Mesoamerica. In 1428, these human sacrifices began increasing, during the reign of the emperor Itzcoatl, who stressed the greater role of Huitzilopochtli to the exclusion of other gods. He burned numerous books in order to see that this happened. Itzcoatl was served by his nephew named Tlaquelel, a general who engineered a great military expansion of the Mexica under the war god Huitzilopochtli. The emphasis on continual war and the emphasis on a cult of the war god, Huistilopochtli, meant that sacrifices ha started happening more regularly and on a more lavish scale. And one chronicler, for example, Andres de Tapia, reported upon reaching Tenochtitlan a skull rack, which he claimed contained 136,000 skulls on it. Now, modern researchers have pointed out that by using Tapia's own measurements, the skull rack would have only been comprised of roughly 60,000 skulls, but you get the point. Over time, with the Mexica's success in war and conquest, captives became more scarce, and previously conquered regions began offering up more and more commoners, especially the children um, of commoners as victims for the sacrifice. Hugh Thomas tells us that, quote, mercy was as foreign to the Mexica as it had been to the ancient Greeks. What, after all, are life and death, but two sides of the same reality, as the potters of Tatilco suggested when they made their double faces, one part alive, the other a skull, unquote. Mexica boys were educated in war and in a philosophy that taught them to look forward to receiving a, quote, flowery death, unquote, via the obsidian knife, that this was something honorable. The gods had no interest in a death via disease or old age, and in fact the afterlife for me for me in Mexico was reserved only for those who died honorably in battle or who died via sacrifice. Ordinary souls went to Mictlan instead of paradise. Mictlan was the great underworld of annihilation. Now, just in case that wasn't enough motivation for any Mexica about to be sacrificed, say, victims were usually given a hallucinogenic, uh, or at least a heavy dose of alcohol in the form of pulque to make them very compliant just before the ceremony. Now, it's hard to believe that there was a lot of people who found this not only acceptable but necessary, but friends and foes alike of the Mexica not only believed in this human sacrifice, but seemed spellbound by the beauty and terror of these dramatic religious festivals. Now, even with that uh, knowledge in our heads, it's hard to accept, I think, that there were commoners who could have their children stripped away and sacrificed, and then they would be happy about it. Um... And that's probably true to some extent. Not everybody would have been, but that wasn't the point of why the, Me the uh, Mexica were doing these sacrifices on these grand scale. That wasn't the only point, I should say. Uh, Friar Diego Duran, a writer in the 1550s who interviewed some Mesoamericans, stated that 
visiting rulers who went to Tenochtitlan, often did so in secret, were shocked by the scale of the human sacrifices they saw the Mexica perform, which was likely exactly the intention of the Mexica rulers. And I apologize if you hear some. <laughs> uh, Joe Biden won the presidency uh, today, so that's why there's fireworks going off in the neighborhood. Okay, so it was uh, the exactly the intention of the Mexica rulers was to shock people with these human sacrifices, to intimidate and shock their neighbors into submission. In 1473, a revolt occurred against the practice when the king of Tlatelolco, uh, Mokwehuix, went around trying to get help from neighboring cities to fight against the practice. He was complaining that Tenochtitlan was waging wars solely in order to keep their priests happy with captives as victims, and presumably Mokwehuix didn't really like the fact that his people were probably being conscripted to fight in these wars. Um, now, but with all of that said, it's unquestionable that many found all of this acceptable. According to Father Duran, quote, Many times did I ask Indians why they could not have been content to offer quail, turtle doves, and other birds. The answer he received was that such were, quote, offerings of the poor, while to offer prisoners of war or slaves was something suitable for great lords and knights, unquote. However, the reason it's so important that I want to bring all of this up is because, believe it or not, our morality and beliefs maybe aren't quite so different than the people of Mesoamerica. Now, at the end of Blood Oath, I talked about someone named Specialist Ross A. McGinnis. Specialist McGinnis, if you didn't watch that episode or listen to that episode, was, uh, if I remember correctly, he was 21 years old when he used his own body to cover an explosive device which an Iraqi insurgent had tossed inside of the Humvee that he was in alongside four other soldiers. And in order to uh, prevent that device from detonating, because it got lodged uh, in the dashboard, apparently, and to keep it from killing his four friends, McGinnis used his body as a shield. He gave up his life when the blast came so that others would live. Uh, posthumously, he was awarded the Medal of Honor. It is a paltry prize, in my opinion, for paying uh, for the payment of your life, if you ask me. But uh, Specialist McGinnis, and to use the parlance of our times, made the ultimate sacrifice. Now, the Aztecs abused this concept of human sacrifice to build an empire, which rested upon a foundation of fear. And so in this episode, the fall of the Mexica, they will come across as villains, and when they lose, it will be in large part because fear of the Mexica evaporates for the people, the other peoples of the Valley of Mexico. Now, what happens to the survivors of that collapse will technically actually be worse when the Spanish are in charge. Uh, what, in fact, will happen after the Spanish are in charge is worse than what these people could have ever imagined before uh, when the Mexica were ruling. And even still, the Aztecs will kind of come across as villains in this story. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't try to understand them. Uh, why we need to understand why the people of Mesoamerica would put up with all that human sacrifice. Well, like I said, I'm, we're not going to do a deep dive into Mesoamerican beliefs. You can get them from Blood Oath. But briefly, the cyclical nature of time in Mesoamerican belief um, meant that time, uh, Mexico, people in Mesoamerica, the Maya, all these people, did not t understand time as a linear process, a straight line. Instead, they understood it as something that repeated over and over again. Hence the, the calendar and uh, the, the fact that Mesoamericans, they, they studied history in order to predict the future. Um, they believed they could decipher the future if they understood the past and uh, what they understood about the future by learning about the past is that one day the gods were going to destroy the earth. And in fact, American peoples on multiple occasions through their history experienced apocalyptic situations, extinctions of mammoth herds and other megafauna, volcanoes, 
asteroids. These are all events recorded into the cultural memories of American peoples. And so for a sophisticated society like the Aztecs, perhaps it should not surprise us they took such lessons to heart. The Aztec calendar was 52 years long, and Mexica belief was that at the end of this 52-year cycle, their god, Huitzilopochtli, would awaken from his slumber, view creation, and decide whether or not he wanted to destroy the world and the universe. At the end of one 52-year cycle, he would definitely do that. And the only thing that you could do about it was to show your appreciation to Huitzilopochtli, uh, and if you showed your appreciation enough, he would give you another 52 years on this beautiful planet. Now, as was the case with many ancient peoples, the people of Mesoamerica therefore were faced with a very important spiritual question. How does a mortal show respect to the gods? The gods have everything. They created everything, and in fact they may even be insulted if their creations do not show a proper appreciation for life and existence. In Mesoamerica, then, like in all other parts of the world, the answer to that question of how to show respect to the gods was to offer the gods life itself. So in Mesoamerica long ago, people began offering flowers and fruit and crops and the products of hunts to the gods, in addition, blood itself. Since perhaps by offering the gods the life of beautiful and important things on earth, then the gods would understand how appreciative people were to live here. In fact, the ultimate sacrifice then one could offer the gods would be a human life. Now that's why I thought this episode, uh, or excuse me, that's why I thought it was so important in the episode of Blood Oath to tell the story of Specialist Ross A. McGinnis. Not because dying on a battlefield in Iraq has a lot to do with getting your heart cut out on a stone table on top of a pyramid, but because the essential motivations for those deaths are, shall we say, eerily similar in some ways. Mesoamericans believed that human sacrifice was a way to save their friends and loved ones, in the same way that Ross McGinnis believed that his actions would save the lives of his fellow soldiers. There were Mexica people who were willing to be sacrificed to the gods, to have their hearts cut out, because they knew that if they did that, then their families would live. Now, you might be thinking, sure, some crazy religious nuts back in Mesoamerica probably were willing to be sacrificed or even sacrifice their children or whatever, but that doesn't mean it's the same thing. Well, I'd reply that maybe dying for your fellow soldiers in a desert halfway across the world so that General Electric and Halliburton can make a trillion dollars on no-bid contracts is also a little fucking nuts. In fact, personally, the Iraq war is probably, in my opinion, the maybe no probably about it, is in my opinion the biggest tragedy and mistake that the United States has made in my lifetime. I hate everything about it, why it was fought, why we fought it. In fact, I don't think offensive wars are a good thing in general to go about waging. Um, and I, but anyway, I, I remember how angry I was when all that happened. Um, how eagerly I voted for the first time in my life as a result for John Kerry. Just an, a vote out of anger. I did it again recently. Unlike uh, what recently happened, uh, I was very disappointed when John Kerry lost. It was heartbreaking. Uh, ultimately, uh, the war was heartbreaking too. But all that still adds up to nothing more than a hill of beans. When I consider the sacrifice that Specialist Ross A. McGinnis made when he decided to jump on top of a grenade, which was tossed into his Humvee and got stuck. Because McGinnis' decision wasn't to leap out and save himself. He could have done that. Instead, he jumped on the grenade, which blew up, killing him. But those other four soldiers in the vehicle lived. And I hate the Iraq War. I will never forget or forgive George W. Bush or Dick fucking Cheney. And I'll always be more suspicious of my nation as a result of it happening. And uh, if, if there had been no Iraq War, we probably literally wouldn't have had a Donald Trump. But that doesn't mean I don't respect the hell out of Ross A. McGinnis, what he did, 
And if I were in his position, I hope that I would have the same courage and conviction that he showed that day. And I think that even if you feel the same way as me about the Iraq war, maybe you might still be able to appreciate the decision, the sacrifice that Ross A. McGinnis made that day. Well, the ruling class of the Mexica abused the belief of Mesoamericans, uh, the, be the belief of Mesoamericans that the gods would destroy the world to transform a relatively rare event in Mesoamerica, the act of human sacrifice, into a tool of the state. Um, they used human sacrifice to create an empire based on fear, and there were a, probably a lot of people in Mesoamerica who hated the Aztec what their oppressive rule consisted of, but yet felt a profound sense of respect for the institution of human sacrifice, even as the Mexica abused that belief to gather more wealth and power. So I don't know why Ross McGinnis went to Iraq. Maybe he believed, like some people do, that the Iraq war was part of a struggle that's been going on since the 7th century. It was part of a crusade or a fatwa between Christians and Muslims. Maybe instead he thought, they hate us for our freedom. Maybe he thought he was spreading democracy. Maybe Ross McGinnis hated the Iraq War just like me. Maybe he went because he just needed money for college or to start a business. Maybe he was just from some shitty little small town, and he just wanted a good job and to see the world. I don't know if it fucking matters why McGinnis went. At least not for our story about the fall of the Mexica. All I know is that his sacrifice was an honorable thing. It was a brave thing. It was a good thing. So, too, was the sacrifice of Staff Sergeant Travis Atkins. He was standing near three other soldiers. One an insurgent wearing an explosive vest approached them, activated the detonator for the device, and Atkins then jumped on the suicide bomber. He bear-hugged him to the ground and he gave his life in the process on June 1, 2007. Those three other soldiers lived. Corporal Jason Dunham of the Marine Corps made a similar sacrifice as well on April 14, 2004. On that date, Corporal Dunham leapt on a grenade dropped by a detained insurgent and later died of his injuries, though two other Marines standing around lived. Master at Arms, second class, Michael A. Monsoor was a naval seer, a Navy SEAL, excuse me. He jumped on a grenade as well. He saved the lives of three Americans and three Iraqi soldiers who were on a rooftop with him. Mansoor leapt on the grenade to smother it. He saved the lives of the others in the process. If you heard the ticking of a bomb and you knew you could act to save people you loved, would you do it? Tick, tick, tick. You're running out of time. It's time to make a decision. Now, if you can understand why men like that would give up their lives and protect people, I think maybe you could understand why Mesoamericans would accept human sacrifice to the gods as a perfectly acceptable practice, even if the Aztecs were abusing it. And if you can understand that, then maybe you could envision yourself. Were you a person? who lived in, I don't know, 1518 in Mesoamerica. And you might even become a willing sacrifice to the gods. Well, if that were the case, you would not hear a tick, tick, tick. You would hear boom, boom, boom. The boom of the drums that accompany the spectacle that would be your death. Shrill whistles and horns would play. Music. Music would play in your honor as majestically dressed dancers and costumes with huge feather plumes would start taking part in choreographed dances for you. Which, to you and your zonked out as you were on sacred mushrooms, would look like a spectacular flower unfurling before you as if to offer the flowery death, the one path to an afterlife of paradise. 
Upon reaching the flat summit of the pyramid, the sound and dancing would be accompanied by a powerful light. The Mexican sun would be shining down and reflecting off the brilliantly white stuccoed pyramid top. The drugs and the light would make it difficult to see much of what happened, as you would be stripped down of your feathered costume, laid on a stone table, your arms and legs stretched out, and with one final breath, one final heave of your chest. Your priestly executioner would cut asunder your ribs with a sharp razor, thrust his hand into the wound, and tear out your still beating heart. Your last vision on earth, as your eyelids begin to close, would be the priest depositing your hot and reeking heart into a golden censer in front of the idol of Huitzilopochtli. Your body would then be hurled down the steep steps of the pyramid and mutilated by those below. Your arms and legs would be eaten, your head cut off and stuck on a skull rack, and your torso would be fed to the beasts of the emperor's zoo. But were you a true believer at that moment? You would die with the satisfaction that your sacrifice saved not just your loved ones, but all of creation. I think it's very important to begin our story in an attempt to get into the minds of the Mexica, because our story begins from their perspective. In the year 1502, at the trading post in a city called Zicalanco, constructed by the Aztecs on the Gulf of Mexico to serve as a gateway of trade between the Valley of Mexico and the Yucatan Peninsula. The indigenous accounts mention a number of omens and a bewildered Montezuma in the face of increasing evidence that an outsider group of powerful and dangerous warriors was near the border there are eight reputed omens. Sets of eight were important in Nahua culture. But it's unclear whether or not these omens were really even seen as such before the invasion. It seems, actually, that after the conquest, indigenous accounts sought to explain the Mexica's defeat via supernatural means. And as a result, Montezuma is depicted as indecisive and practically impotent in the face of the Spaniards. But the indig indigenous accounts, now all of which were written after the conquest, might have been adding a quote-unquote post-conquest gloss to the story. That's what Stuart Schwartz, editor of Victors and Vanquished, Spanish and Nahua Views of the Conquest of Mexico, believes. He believes that the Spanish accounts, which were the, the Spanish and the Nahua accounts written after the fact, started to latch onto the idea of these omens as having happened as a way of underlining the preordained nature of the conquest. Now, regardless, um, Sahagun's inform us, informants tell us that, quote, ten years before the arrival of the Spaniards, an omen first appeared in the sky like a flame or tongue of fire, like the light of dawn. It appeared to be throwing off sparks and seemed to pierce the sky when it came out at midnight. It appeared like the dawn. For a full year it showed itself. And when it appeared there would be an outcry. People would hit their hand against their mouths as they yelled. People were taken aback. They lamented, unquote. It is said that this comet was visible in the sky every night until dawn for a whole year. And I should point out before I get going any farther, uh, if, if, it, if a lot of times Nahuatl even translated sounds a little weird, it's because often a lot of things are repeated in Nahuatl uh, speech. Uh, sometimes the way they would write things, they would say things, they would write it l the literal way, and then also they would repeat it another, like a metaphorical way. Uh, you'll know, if, you, if you didn't notice that, you'll, you'll notice that. The second omen was that, quote, of its own accord, the house of the devil Huitzilopochtli burned and flared it up. No one set fire to it. It just took fire itself. When they threw water on it, trying to extinguish it, it blew up all the more. It could not be put out. It burned entirely. The third omen was a disaster at another temple. 
A temple was struck by lightning, hit by a thunderbolt. It was just a building of straw at the temple complex of Zuitokle. <laughs> Excuse me, I'm sure I said that wrong. The reason it was taken for an omen was that it was not raining hard, just drizzling. It was said that it was struck when the sun was shining, nor was thunder heard. The fourth omen was that while the sun was still out, a, a comet fell in three parts. Now, likely, if you ask me, that was the same comet that had been in the sky every day for a year earlier, if you ask me. But anyway, the fifth omen was that the water of the lake boiled up. It was not wind that caused it. It bubbled and made exploding sounds, rising high in the air. It reached the foundations of the houses. It flooded them, and they collapsed. This is the great lake that extends around us here in Mexico. Now, the Valley of Mexico is a volcanic region, and if you asked me, this sounds like some, probably some seismic activity took place. The sixth omen was that many times a woman would be heard going along and weeping and shouting. She cried loudly at night, saying, Oh, my children, we are about to go forever. Sometimes she said, Oh, my children, where am I to take you? The seventh omen was that once the water folk were hunting or snaring, they caught an ash-colored bird like a crane. On top of its head was something like a mirror. It was round, circular, seeming to be perforated, where the sky, the scar stars, and the fire drill, a constellation, could be seen. They took it to show Montezuma, and the emperor took it to be a very bad omen. And the second time he looked at the bird's head, he saw something like a multitude of people coming along, coming bunched, outfitted for war, carried on the backs of deer. Then he called soothsayers, the sages, but when they were going to answer him, what they saw disappeared, and they said nothing more. The final, eighth omen, was that many times people appeared with two heads but one body. They took them and showed them to Montezuma. When he had seen them, they disappeared. Now, I think the eight omens are probably mainly a result of people looking backwards and searching for signs and meanings to explain their present. But that doesn't mean the Mexica didn't foresee the coming of the Spaniards. In 1512, two survivors from Jamaica landed on the shores of the Yucatan, though they probably had trouble communicating since neither Maya nor Nahuatl were spoken in the Caribbean. The stories that those two survivors told would have been terrifying. So rather than omens, it was news from Zocilanco, the Aztec trading post on the Gulf, where the Mexica heard rumors of bearded white men in the Caribbean, beyond the Yucatan, probably starting, it seems, around 1502. Stories about what happened in the larger islands of the Caribbean are especially likely to have reached the Valley of Mexico via pre-Columbian trade routes. Those stories wouldn't require exaggeration either to be terrifying. Now, a Spanish trunk washed up on shore that was brought back to Tenochtitlan around that time. It held several suits of strange clothes, jewels, and a sword like none that had ever been seen in Mexico. Montezuma divided the gifts, uh, divided the contents as gifts, excuse me. He gave some to the king of Tacuba, some to the king of Texcoco, two of his allied cities. Around that same time, a merchant from Yucatan brought a folded manuscript to the Aztec capital. It depicted three white temples at sea, floating on large canoes. The Aztec merchants, the Pochteca, were a class who also acted as spies or informants for the emperor, in addition to uh, long-distance luxury traders. They sent reports from abroad of the strange new men, it seems. Other Mexican outposts existed farther south of the Yucatan on the Central American Isthmus. These, too, started sending reports of strange warriors, and so Montezuma heard about the colony established at Darien in 1513, a thousand miles southeast of the Yucatan Peninsula, and from Darien, stories of men riding deer probably reached Mexico. The king of Texcoco, Nezahualpilli, even went to his deathbed in 1514, convinced 
then the Mishika would be ruled by strangers. So it seems regardless about whether or not eight omens were taking place that at the time the Mexica t- the Mishika took to be bad omens, um, it's clear that uh, Montezuma and perhaps some of the other Mexica people knew at least a little bit about the Spanish before Cortez landed in Mexico or any of the Spaniards who came before him. At least they knew enough to be seriously worried. And some of those omens were indisputably historical events. A, a comet was reported as spotted in China, Japan, and Spain in 1506. And incidentally, in Spain, that comet was thought to have foreshadowed the death of King Philip. Uh, So, you know, how do we even know what omen that comet was bringing? And in fact, most of the portents probably really did occur as factual events, though Hugh Thomas is especially skeptical of omens regarding two-headed beings or a bird with a mirror for a head. He thinks those, quote, sound as if they were figments in the imagination of someone who had eaten sacred mushrooms, unquote. Now that brings us to Montezuma, which, for what it's worth, I don't know the correct pronunciation of his name, Neither apparently did many of the conquistadors who met him, um, so I don't feel too bad about knowing his name. Uh, But it's definitely not Montezuma. Montezuma? 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 Moctezuma? Motecazoma? These are all possibilities, amongst others. Cortez is known to have spoken Nahuatl horribly, and he used Montezuma, which is, I think, almost certainly wrong, probably, though I'm not 100% sure, and I I'm also almost 100% sure that Montezuma is wrong, but for clarity's sake, I'm using Montezuma, so do forgive me, or maybe not. Maybe I'm right on accident. Difficulties with his name aside, we know more about Montezuma than any other Mexica person. Seriously, at least of the era. In the words of Hugh Thomas, quote, most of the others remain two-dimensional, dominated by their offices, their unpronounceable titles, often confounded with difficult names, leave them hidden in the anonymity of the collective splendor, unquote, that is the Aztec Empire. Montezuma came to the throne, or what Mexica, the Mexica understood as the sacred mat, in 1502. In 1518, he was about 50 years old. Before he was the uh, emperor, Montezuma was the chief high priest of Huistilopochtli for a time. Uh, And before that, in his youth, he also served as a general. His background as priest has led many historians to wonder whether or not his spiritual beliefs were responsible for his behavior in response to the Spanish threat. And I'm not sure if that's true. Um, I, I don't know. You know, sometimes I wonder if some of Montezuma's personality traits are maybe they're the result of extreme opulence and inheritance. Um, Mexican rule didn't strictly transfer from father to son, at least not very often, but Montezuma bears the title Montezuma II or Montezuma the Younger because his great-grandfather was emperor by the same name, who he was a great conqueror who ruled in the mid-15th century. Uh, Montezuma, he was known for laughing. He, would, he could even have these bouts of helpless giggling and could often be kind. And these were traits that went side by side with his inclination to rule uh, with fear, not affection. Like his predecessor, Ahuitzotl, Montezuma often used his authority like a complete authoritarian. Uh, His predecessor and him were the first two uh, and only two emperors in, in the, the history of the Mexica who had sometimes stopped consulting with the Supreme Council, uh, which Mexican leaders were, were always supposed to consult when making important decisions. Um, Montezuma once had seven corrupt judges jailed in cages and then killed when they procrastinated upon giving a decision he wanted. Uh, his meals he would eat alone but would be attended by... I mean, in numerous servants and guards, jugglers, jesters, dwarfs, hunchbacks. His halls were lined with musicians that kept him amused from day to day, as did his several wives and numerous concubines. He had something somewhere in between 100 and 150 children, three of whom were the daughters of his chief wife, 
Four times a day, he changed his clothes. He never wore the same tunic twice. And his life was pretty opulent. He was a capable commander, or known to be in his time, and he extended the Mexica influence to the coast. He defeated as many cities as his predecessor, and most of his conquests were on the fertile coast of the Yucatan, which meant he gave the Mexica a steady supply of the green quetzal feathers they desired, which was the first time in the history of the empire that this had taken place. Now, of course, recently conquered cities don't make for happy vassals. In addition, inequality with the, within the empire grew almost out of control during the reign of Montezuma, but these issues aside, Montezuma was having a great time as emperor right up until about 1518 when he received terrible news. The bearded strangers from the sea were now off the coast of the Yucatan. When Montezuma began hearing rumors of Spanish activity near his borders, he sent for wise men, magicians, men who would take hallucinatory plans to assist their magical divinations of the future. But Montezuma didn't really like the answers they gave him. Presumably, these magicians would have been familiar with the situation in Central America, because what they told them about was that they foresaw men with beards, riding deer, coming to Mexico. In response, Montezuma had his magicians arrested. When they escaped from prison, the emperor had their families imprisoned in order to force the magicians to reappear, and when that didn't work, he had their families executed. Or maybe the magicians never escaped. Montezuma just executed them and subsequently executed their families. It's not even entirely clear. Montezuma also apparently began asking some of the prominent citizens of Tenochtitlan about what he should do, about the foreboding trouble that he saw coming, and when those ordinary citizens gave their candid opinions about the bad things that they thought might happen, Montezuma had them imprisoned and starved to death. Uh, next, he considered building a new colossal shrine to Huitzilopochtli to, ward, to help ward off whatever evil was coming his way. And he consulted with one of his vassals, the ruler of the city of Quitlahuac, which was a smaller city on the lake, and whose rulers were supposedly directly descended from another god, Mixcoatl. The king of Quitlahuac told Montezuma that his plan would exhaust the people and offend the gods. Montezuma had that king executed, along with his supposedly holy family, although he did abandon the idea of building the new temple. Now, in short, you could say that Montezuma did very little in preparation of hearing the rumors of Spanish invaders that we might consider useful. Instead, he went on a quote-unquote frenzied witch hunt, to use the words of Hugh Thomas, while his actions did little to prepare for an invasion, uh, much less an invasion of technologically superior Europeans with steel and gunpowder and horses, Montezuma's witch hunt does show the kind of freedom which the emperor of Mexico had to carry out basically any kind of brutal action against the people of Mesomo America he so desired, both inside and outside the city of Tenochtitlan. In the spring of 1518, a commoner, who was said to be roughly dressed without ears, thumbs, or big toes, quite unfortunate, arrived from the Eastern Sea. He brought news to Montezuma of, quote, a range of mountains or some big hills floating in the sea, unquote. And like everyone else who gave Montezuma bad news, the man was promptly put into prison, Montezuma then sent an official to go to the coast and find out if the man was taking the, telling the truth. Excuse me, and that agent, whose title translates into Keeper of the House of Darkness, just so you know, which I think is really cool, had some scouts go about and hide in some trees near the coasts, and there those scouts witnessed the truth of what the deformed peasant spoke. Mountains on the waves. Further, they saw men leave the mountains in a small boat to fish, using metal hooks and nets in ways that would have been very familiar to the Mexica. But the language they heard was not familiar. 
The Michigans watched until the Spaniards got back in their canoes and went back to, quote, went back to the thing on the sea with the two towers and went into it, unquote. Montezuma reportedly was very dismayed by the news of the bearded men with white skins at the coast, but he also prepared a gift for the foreigners. A series of gold and feathered objects were made, bracelets, fans, chains, and two large wooden discs covered with gold and silver were also fashioned into calendars that were to be used in the Valley of Mexico, um, were, were ordered to be constructed. But complete secrecy was also ordered by the emperor regarding who the commissioned goods were for. Like the magicians of the year before, the deformed peasant was either murdered or escaped uh, from prison in secret, uh, whatever it was, something likely to keep him from talking, I'm sure. The giant gold calendars took time to manufacture. But Montezuma sent the other gifts to the coast, along with ample scouts to watch uh, the entirety of the Eastern Sea. The next time ships appeared, a Mexica delegation rode out to the ships, albeit they were larger than they'd imagined them even being, uh, and they gave the gifts to the newcomers. They spoke through an interpreter, whose skill was also apparently quite lacking. Still, the Mexicans were able to relate some pieces of information to the Spaniards. In answer of, who are you, and where do you come from, they told the Spaniards, we have come from Mexico. And in response to what the name of their ruler is, they replied, our Lord's name is Montezuma. The Spaniards also told the, Mexican, the, the Mexicans that they were soon to depart to Castile, but they would not delay in returning to Mexico. In response, the Spaniards gave the delegation some gifts as well, clothes and beads, and quickly learned that green was the most valuable color in Mexico. The Spaniards also gave some food, which was not very appreciated. When Montezuma examined the presents, he reportedly liked the beads. But when he ate a Spanish biscuit, he said it tasted like tufa rock. And then to satisfy his curiosity, he weighed the biscuit against a tufa rock. The biscuit weighed more. The emperor fed his dwarves some of the bread, um, probably yucca bread. The dwarves said that tasted good, but the rest of the food was buried at the foot of the shrine to Huitzilopochtli. The Spaniards left quickly after that meeting. And the few Mexicans who knew of their arrival in the first place were threatened with death if they ever spoke about it. The emperor had artists compose pictures of everything they could while the Spaniards had been on the coast, but his archivists in the libraries of Tenochtitlan found nothing in the past we could, that could prepare them for this future. It was very difficult for them to understand mysterious arrivals for which there was no precedent some of Montezuma's predecessors had burned most of the older histories anyway, so Aztec research was quite literally hampered by Aztec political correctness, um, even if precedent for such strange ships had existed. But there was one old man named Kualatzli who lived in the city of Zocamilco who had a personal library of old pre-imperial codices. He said the artists' renditions of the Spanish and their ships meant that they were people long dead, returning to their homeland led by Quetzalcoatl. Now, this interpretation did not make Montezuma very happy at all, and Quilatzli was promptly imprisoned in Tenochtitlan. Hugh Thomas tells us, quote, A year passed. Montezuma became once more immersed in his imperial duties. His favorite concubine brought him a new son. The court, the court hunchbacks danced, the dwarfs sang, and the jesters made their master laugh. Jugglers lay on their backs, with their feet turned upwards, and spun balls round in the air. The regular program of sacrifices continued. There was the dancing and the music of flutes and drums, the dressing up and the painting of faces, the singing, the collecting of flowers, and no doubt the uncontrollable laughter caused by the eating of sacred mushrooms. The priests kept the fires burning in the great temples, 
another year's tribute came in on the backs of patient bearers. Merchants brought back beautiful, long, green feathers of the Quetzal bird and rumors of war from the Pacific. Workers in precious stones rejoiced that Montezuma had conquered the territories where there was good sand with which to polish their raw material. Ordinary men and women, the Mesualtan and Mayeques, they pursued their regular patterns of work, celebrated pregnancy and childbirth, educated children, sought to instill moral codes, died and descended to Mictlan, that place of gloomy emptiness to which everyone who lived an unadventurous life expected to go. Poems were composed at Texcoco by courtiers, mourning the brevity of life and the decay of empires. The emperor made a fine speech about his forebearers. He almost forgot the strangers of 1518. But the strangers did not forget Mexico. As they had promised, the next year, year of one read, 1519, they came again, unquote. It's in my opinion perhaps Thomas's best passage, certainly a great example of his writing at, at his finest. At any rate, the, the Mexica don't meet the Spanish until a second Spanish fleet arrived off the coast of Mexico. I briefly talked about the two pre-Cortez voyages a few episodes ago, but it's worth going them uh, again in a little more detail now. That first one was captained by Hernandez de Cordoba, and he is credited with the quote-unquote discovery of what he believed to be the island of Yucatan. Technically, uh, Juan Ponce de Leon may have visited it uh, after on their return trip to Florida, but he uh, apparently doesn't count. Cordoba is the first discoverer. He came to that opinion when he asked the natives where he was, and they replied, Yucatan? Yucatan is Maya, for I do not understand you. Cordoba's discovery of Yucatan did not go well for the conquistadors involved. The Spanish claimed to have come ashore peacefully to trade, and they were immediately and quite treacherously attacked. Now, no Maya accounts... Uh, were recorded that we know of, but Ross Hassig reminds us that the Maya had advanced knowledge of who the Spanish were, and even if this was the first time the Spanish had seen the Yucatan, Columbus himself had met with seafaring Maya traders, and who knows whether other ship sightings, shipwreck survivors, or stories about the Caribbean were going on in Maya cities. At any rate, the quote-unquote peaceful Spanish trading delegation, came ashore with their crossbows and arquebuses, so who knows if what they claimed to be true was even true. Now, the Maya fought with similar weapons as the Spanish had encountered before in the Americas, bows and arrows, slings, lances, and shields. But this was the first time that the Spanish encountered an American army. The Maya fought in well-ordered ranks, with discipline that did not exist in Caribbean societies. The battle began thus, with a Maya initiating a barrage of arrows and sling stones that wounded 15 Spaniards and then was closely followed by the Maya closing in for hand-to-hand -hand combat. This placed the conquistadors on the defensive immediately, uh, and luckily, for them anyway, the metal armor and swords they wielded prevented a complete rout. Once they were able to organize themselves in response, the effect of the crossbows and arquebuses were devastating. Ross Hassig is an excellent historian for providing us with the logistics of this period. The military crossbows of the early 1500s were insane in comparison to bows and slings used by American armies. Crossbows weighed between 5.5 and, and 6 kilograms, or 15 to 16 pounds for my American fellows, and they could fire wooden bolts that weighed between 1.5 and 3 kilograms, a distance of roughly 320 meters in an arc, that's roughly 1,050 feet, which compares to a maximum range of about 180 meters, or 600 feet, for the indigenous bows. Now, reloading a crossbow was slow in comparison to a bow. Six arrows could be fired at the rate of one crossbow bolt. But the crossbow's greater range also came with the greater power to pierce armor, and further demanded far less skill to use. 
So crossbows might have been even a more important weapon to the Spanish than the arquebuses of the early 16th century, which were less accurate and had a shorter range, about 137 meters, and accurate to only about half of that. And the rate of fire was something like once a minute to once every 90 seconds. Now, in addition, on long marches, the gunpowder, sometimes separated into its component parts and then had to be mixed thoroughly before the battle started or in the middle of the battle, but regardless, the arquebus was a devastating psychological weapon, especially in the Americas. Cordoba's men brought 15 crossbows and 10 arquebuses on shore, and these were used in this first battle between Spaniard and Maya where 110 Spanish conquistadors faced a Maya force that probably numbered somewhere in the hundreds. And after 15 natives were killed, the Maya broke contact and retreated strategically. The Spanish responded by looting their houses and the temples of the town they lived in. They also took two Maya children as slaves, who were later baptized as Juanillo and Mel Melcorejo, uh, and were taught Spanish so they could serve as translators. Now, after that, Cordoba was much more careful. He landed a few more times as he went along the coast, but gold was relatively rare in the Yucatan, which is what he was after. And he was careful not to simply plant his forces down on the coast somewhere so they could face another ambush. But he didn't simply avoid the Maya. In fact, he couldn't. Fresh water is hard to come by on the Yucatan. So the Spanish were actually forced to repeatedly ask for, Ma for water at Maya cities, despite the danger of another battle. Now, at any rate, that is why the Spanish landed near the city of Campiche to fill their water casks. They were led into the city by a party of Indians, and from there directed to the local political capital at another city, Chanpotan. There... The Spanish camped ashore, and they were surrounded uh, while they camped by a force of Indians overnight, and they were attacked at dawn. Eighty conquistadors were wounded from the barrage of arrows, darts, and stones before once again the Maya forces engaged in hand-to-hand -hand combat um, against the men wielding iron weapons and armor. Now, the Maya had great numerical superiority, but only the first rank or two would actively engage the Spanish, and that really kind of diminishes the fighting ability of their numerical advantage. And um, eventually they pulled back and resumed the onslaught of arrows and stones instead. Then Maya reinforcements arrived. The battle lasted only an hour, but the Spanish were def decisively defeated. Of the 110 men under Cordoba's command, only 50, uh, 50 were killed. Two were carried off alive, and all but one of the survivors were wounded, and some of those died shortly thereafter. Cordoba was actually forced to burn one of his ships, since he was so short-handed. He returned to Cuba in defeat on April 20th, 1517. Now, I said there wasn't a lot of gold in the Yucatan, but that doesn't mean there wasn't any gold in the Yucatan, and tales of golden jewelry on Maya nobility made for some thirsty-ass conquistadors back on Cuba. So, of course, Governor Velasquez was super stoked about sending another expedition. Cordoba, was, therefore, was basically in and out of Mexico real quick, but the second voyage would spend a little more time there. Thanks to a conquistador named Juan Diaz, who left an account of the voyage, we have a pretty good idea about what happened. Diaz, as for him, shipped, was shipped to the Indies in 1512. He was a secular member of a religious order, the Mercadi Mercedarians. Excuse me. It was the first order to be sent from Spain to the New World. And after six years of what was allegedly missionary work in the Caribbean, Juan Diaz was then chosen to accompany Juan de Grijalva to follow up on Cordoba's discovery and discover the secret of the island of Yucatan? Grijalva was better armed and equipped with supplies and men than Cordoba had been, but the latter's defeat made Grijalva maybe a little too cautious, at least for uh, Velasquez's liking. Either that, or Grijalva just wasn't as bold as some of the other conquistadors sent on such voyages. Either way, he absolutely did not go off in search of any cities that weren't Campiche, the one Maya town that had not been up in arms against Cordoba's expedition. 
Diaz let us know that Grijalva and his men, though, did get into plenty of trouble with the Maya at Campeche uh, before the Mexica delegation ever showed up. Things didn't start out so bad, with some light trade and the sharing of religious festivities between two cultures, but nevertheless, a battle began to brew. The Maya probably got tired of feeding the 100 Spanish soldiers who'd come ashore, marched into the center of their town near the temple, and promptly began demanding food and water. But at any rate, a force to uh, began to gather uh, to uh, attempt to force Grijalva and his men out. But Grijalva had a secret weapon that Cordoba had not brought. Cannon. I don't know how many he had, but it was several. And I don't know, I don't know what kind they were, but probably falconets, according to Ross Hassig, since at the time, falconets were mounted on the rails of ships topside and thus much more easily transportable than the larger guns, which might have been in the sides of Grijalva's three ships. The gun ports cut into the sides of European ships were a recent innovation anyway. At any rate, falconets were light guns, which meant they, they weighed about 500 pounds or 225 kilograms, so they could be up to double that size. Now, generally, the caliber is about 6 or 7 centimeters or 2.3 to 2.7 inches, and the balls they fired could be fired point blank, or they could reach a maximum distance of 2,000 meters. Now, the falconets were also breech-loading guns, so that meant they were pretty fucking dangerous, since breech-loading guns of that era tended to explode on occasion, but it also meant they could be fired twice as rapidly as other cannon or arquebuses. Now, the disadvantages, anyway, of breech-loading weapons in the 16th century were very minor in comparison to the Indians who did not have gunpowder weapons at all. The only big drawback of the cannon against the Native Americans was their lack of mobility. 500-pound guns might be light in comparison to other guns, but that's not exactly an easy thing to shift around into position. And the Spanish conquistadors didn't even have wheeled carriages in Mexico to use. So added into their relatively slow rate of fire, um, and, and, and how hard you add that and how hard it is to move them around, the indigenous people were actually pretty quick to adjust to the terror of cannon after a battle or two. Now, at any rate, however, this was their very first deployment, and those breech-loading cannons saved Grijalva and his men. Though one man died and 40 more were wounded before the battle ended, um, those cannons were fired and the Maya retreated immediately, not long after the Spanish sailed away to escape. Now, Grijalva followed the same route as Cordoba, so this meant that he was going to be near the city of Champotan, uh, but Grijalva was aware that Cordoba had lost half his men there, and so when some canoes approached his ship, he just fired two cannon shots to scare them away, and left without trying to land. Instead, he continued to sail along, and he reached a river, which shortly thereafter was named the Grijalva River. There, the Spanish were able to convince the locals, about 2,000 of whom had gathered in war canoes to follow the Spanish ships, uh, that the only reason they'd come was to trade. And this appeal succeeded. Grijalva continued sailing along uh, from that point on, trading with uh, some Mexica-ruled Mexica cities like Cortezualco and Nahualtan, um, in addition to some Maya cities. And, and thus, the Spanish conquistadors met the Mexica and the, and the Mexica delegation. Now, Grijalva did not have instructions telling him to settle. He was supposed to just trade and explore and look for gold, but nevertheless many of his men wanted to, including Juan Diaz, and in fact despite his instructions to the contrary, the governor of Cuba, Velazquez, will make fun of Grijalva when he returns for not having settled. At any rate, Grijalva ended up getting in two more minor battles, one at Champoton and one at Campeche on his way back, so maybe it was best for his health that he didn't try to sell anyway. Um, now with that said, I guess we'd better start talking about Diego Velasquez, the conqueror 
and governor of Cuba, who we discussed way back in Song of the Taino, episode 2 of Conquest of the Americas. Now, within the first few years of his initial conquest, Velazquez founded seven, seven colonial townships. He had also depleted the indigenous population and afterwards might be best be described as idle in comparison to many of his other colleagues. Cuba was quickly becoming a semi-failed backwater colony under his leadership, and he was searching for opportunities for more wealth, just maybe not as searching uh, with as uh, much energy, excuse me, as some of the other adelantados. Um, and that's because Velasquez basically considered his conquistadoring days behind him. He preferred sending others out on expeditions like Grijalva and Cadorba, for example. But and even in his more active years, he delegated a lot of responsibility to his chief lieutenant, Panfilo de Narvaez. Velázquez was involved in the massacre at Zaragua and the burning of Hatway, which we also discussed at the song, in the Song of the Taino. But with that said, he was still far from being the most brutal of the conquistadors, or at least by all accounts... Velasquez, at least, was not the type of person who liked to torture and mutilate people for fun. So I guess he's got that going for him. Um, so Velasquez is not really thought of as the most competent commander in the Caribbean at the time, but he was still a scheming bastard like the rest of them. He got his governorship by being disloyal to Diego Columbus, for example, who had rights to Hispaniola, and from there, Velasquez had fled to partake in the conquest of Cuba, and he damn sure didn't share any authority or gold with Diego Columbus once he was finished. And that meant Velasquez had a great relationship with the crown, which was involved in legal battles with the Columbus family over the rights of the Caribbean, was happy to recognize Velasquez as, um, a, a, as legally separate shall we say, from Diego Columbus. Two other captains, or caudillos, in the Caribbean were Francisco de Garay and Juan Ponce de Leon. They ruled Jamaica and Puerto Rico, respectively. And in addition to these, Pedro Arias de Avila, or Pedrarius, was the caudillo of the Castillo del Oro, or the Spanish Main. At least he was after the execution of Vasco Nunez del Baboa, of course. Episode 3. Now, from the perspective of Velasquez, all of these other caudillos represented threats, especially after he received news on April 1st, 1514, that, quote, certain Indians had come from the islands beyond Cuba, towards the side of the north, navigating five or six days by canoe, and there gave news of other islands that lie beyond, unquote, according to a letter that Velasquez wrote to King Ferdinand. Now, no other accounts still exist of whatever expedition it was that Velasquez was writing about. But five or six days' travel would have meant a delegation of either Maya or Mexica, in all likelihood. Now, perhaps that expedition from Mexico, Mexico into the Caribbean was the one that began building the legend of fear of the Spaniards in Mexico back in the mainland. Velasquez was curious, but he didn't immediately investigate. The native population of Cuba was dwindling, and for the next few years, Velasquez was very busy, uh, and all the ships in Cuba were very busy and doing the same thing that all the other caudillos in the Caribbean were doing, which was sending, uh, launching slave raids to the Bahamas or off the coast of Nicaragua or Honduras in order to obtain replacement slaves for their work camps. At any rate, it wasn't for three years, in 1517, when Velazquez finally took advantage of what happened, probably uh, doing so quickly to try and beat Ponce de Leon or Francisco de Garay to the punch. Both of them were also quite hungry for more land and Indian slaves. Thus was launched the expedition of Hernández de Cordoba, and subsequently, in 1518, that of Juan de Grijalva. Um, which, by the way, was sent before Cordoba even returned. And the next year, before Grijalva returned, Velázquez was already preparing a third expedition. And this one was going to be much, much larger than the first two. Now, Velázquez considered sending Penfilo de Narvaez, and in retrospect, he probably should have. But he thought Narvaez was perhaps capable of doing something treacherous, like, say, declaring independence as soon as he reached foreign soil, like Velazquez did to Diego Columbus, for example. 
He also asked some of his family members. They were all very happy on their estates, and they recommended he give Grijalva another shot. But Velasquez was still very angry that Grijalva had not broken his instructions and settled on the Yucatan. What can I say? People can be very hypocritical sometimes. Velasquez was scared that Narvaez would rebel, and he didn't trust Grijalva, so instead he selected Hernán Cortés to lead the expedition. Cortés was born sometime around 1484. He arrived in the Caribbean around the age of 22 when he reached Santo Domingo in 1506. Velázquez selected him to take charge of the follow-up to ex- the expedition of Grijalva when Cortés was 34, quite the, quote, the right age for leading an expedition, unquote. Hugh Thomas also tells us that Cortés was, quote, descended from some of the most turbulent families in the most undisciplined of towns, Medellín, in Extremadura, the wildest part of Castile, unquote. He came from an immense family of hidalgos, or minor noblemen, who, despite their nobility, were apparently very poor. Hernán Cortés' father, Martin, for example, gave his son a noble lineage, but he could not afford to buy a horse to take him off to war, when Martin, as a young man, rode off a generation earlier, and himself fought in several private wars as an infantryman, in an era where the noblemen of Extremadura fought one another for control of castles, land, and cattle, battles that became part of the Civil War of the 1470s. Hernán Cortés grew up uh, until he was ten in a multicultural land, at which point he witnessed the expulsion of his Jewish neighbors, amongst them the 10,000 Jews from Extremadura who were banished from their homes. When Cortes was about 12 years old, he fled Medellin, his home, the result of a feud with a local lord, wherein one of Cortes's friends killed one of the powerful lord's friends, and, you know, I mean, some, really, just some ludicrous Capulet and Montague shit. Uh, and ultimately this ends when Cortes, when he, he has to go to Salamanca in about 1496, which was allegedly the city where his father had been born, and he lived with his aunt and her husband. In Salamanca, Cortes had the opportunity to learn Latin and grammar and ultimately entered law school. He did not graduate, but when you examine Cortes' letters, it's clear he made the most of his time studying Spanish law, at least for his own purposes. Las Casas who did not like Cortes, agreed he was a good Latinist or Latin speaker and that he had a good amount of knowledge in the law. Cortes, though, also spent a significant amount of time learning to use arms and learning to gamble in Salamanca. And eventually, though, he returned to Medellin at the age of 17. 1501, his parents were reputedly very angry. They wanted him to graduate from law school, um, like a perfectly reasonable pair of parents. But Cortes was determined to live a life of action. He considered going to Italy to fight under Gonzalo Hernández de Cordoba, the great and legendary, quote, great captain of Spain. But ultimately, Cortes instead chose to make his fate in the Indies. He nearly left on the fleet of Nicolás de Ovando, but while waiting for the ship to be ready to Seville, Cortés hurt himself trying to climb through a young woman's window, and while recovering, he caught malaria. Perhaps he was lucky with this mishap, because the fleet of Ovando caught a horrible fever in the Caribbean, and half of the 2,000 men who arrived died of a mysterious illness shortly after arriving. So Cortés ended up spending a few more years in Spain, It wasn't until the summer of 1506 when he finally set off at the age of 22 to Hispaniola. There, Governor Ovando favored Cortes, perhaps because they were related to Cortes' grandfather, illegitimate though he was, or maybe it was because they were both extremeños. Perhaps it was nothing more than the fact that Cortes was clever and eager for action. Whatever it was, Cortes was amongst those who took part in the brutal pacification of Zaragoa, Afterwards, Cortes obtained work at a sugar mill, though exactly what he was doing is unclear, um, and after that he became the scribe of a town in Hispaniola. Uh, eventually, though, Cortes was bored. He got started getting in fights, and he got in some trouble, and he thought of leaving. 
Once again, he was saved by his own poor health. He developed some sort of infirmity in his leg, and that prevented him from sailing off with Diego de Nisueza as he was planning. That expedition was doomed to nothing but failure and death. And since Cortez wasn't on that expedition, that meant he was later free to join with Diego Velazquez in the conquest of Cuba. Cortez, like Las Casas, was probably present at the burning of the chief of Hatue, and so his time in the Caribbean was spent learning lessons in brutality. Hugh Thomas thinks that Cortez probably helped Velazquez also draft letters, which he then sent back to the king to inform Spain of his achievements. But not long after the conquest, Cortez began quarreling with Velazquez. At the age of 30, in 1514, Cortez joined a group of malcontent colonists. They didn't like the way Velazquez was doing things, especially the way he was, say, divvying up Taino slaves. The next year, Val Cortez really got under Velazquez's skin. He was courting and seducing a young woman named Catalina Suarez, who came with her two sisters to the Caribbean. And after seducing her, Cortez suddenly got cold feet and didn't want to marry her. Well, Velazquez was married to one of Catalina Suarez's sisters, and so that caused another rift between the two men. Catalina later threatened to sue Cortez, and when Cortez continued to refuse to marry her, Velazquez had Cortez put in jail. Cortez somehow managed to break out of that jail, took sanctuary at a church for some time, and perhaps with the aid of the priest of that church, at any rate, somehow at its uh, later, things got mended up ultimately between him and Velazquez. Cortez accompanied Velazquez to West Cuba, quote, to put down certain rebels, unquote, and, and upon their return, Cortez finally married Catalina. The pair settled down on an encomienda far from the capital, and Velazquez and Cortez lucked into Oh, excuse me, far from the capital and Velazquez, and Cortez's encomienda was a good one. He lucked into a good spot for finding gold, and this got him to buy his share into an expedition of his own. Now, by this point, Cortez had a good amount going for him. He had uh, wealth, enough to put down as an investment on his own expedition if he wanted. He was in pretty good with Velazquez, despite the battles he and Velazquez had earlier had. And Cortez had a coolness to him. He never seems to lose his temper when things get wild in battle. But on the other hand, he did not have much experience with command or tactics. He had experience fighting, but no experience with anything close to the sort of battles for which he was going to encounter in Mexico. At any rate, Velasquez told Cortez one day that Grijalva was a complete failure. And because Grijalva was having such difficulty that Cortez should go to the island of Yucatan, Velasquez would provide Cortez with two or three ships. Cortez would find money for the other vessels, and in fact, everything else. Hugh Thomas surmises that Velasquez did this because he believed Cortez would be able to rally men under him. Cortez, of course, accepted the commission. Both were pressed for time. Velazquez wished def desperately to control the Yucatan and whatever else was around it, and specifically to uh, find a strait through the Americas to China. And Velazquez believed rightly so that if he didn't do it quick, then someone like Pedrarius, the governor of Darien, might do it first. The goal of finding a route to China was an, uh, a great encouragement for send. What, 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 excuse me, was perhaps even a greater encouragement for sending Cortez, perhaps than even the riches that might be stolen in Mexico. Excuse me. I, I want to point this clear, that when this is happening, uh, these guys sure don't know that Balboa has discovered the Pacific, but they think there might be a, a route. Um, Cortez uh, receives his orders and immediately begins preparing. Now, he had town criers start spreading the word to conquistadors on Cuba uh, that anyone who wished to roll their dice on Mexico ought to join up with Cortez. And in the meanwhile, he bought five or 6,000 Castellanos worth of rations on credit. He borrowed another 6,000 Castellanos from his many friends, including an unknown amount from Velazquez. Um, another chief financier was Pedro de Alvarado. He financed his own ship, horses, and men, and because of that became one of Cortez's most trusted lieutenants. Incidentally, Alvarado 
was so interested in financing his own stuff because he was on a previous voyage to Mexico, either Grijalva or Cordoba, I'm not entirely sure. But Hugh Thomas speculates that Alvarado had seen quite a bit of the, quote, secrets of the land, unquote, of Mexico. Maybe he'd even specifically encountered Totonac people, a recently subjected ethnic group on the coast of Mexico, wherein the Mexica delegation was stationed. And Thomas I mean, he's kind of speculating here, though I think I agree with him. He says that Alvarado might have specifically realized that the Totonacs were enthusiastic about the arrival of the Spanish as a potential ally against their Michigan masters. At any rate, Alvarado will play a key role in the conquest. Beyond that, there are times when Cortez, afterwards, will show unquestionable support to Alvarado, even when he doesn't deserve it. And it helps explain, perhaps, um, at least Alvarado, uh, the knowledge he probably has about Mexico. Uh, Hugh Thomas thinks that explains, quote, why Cortez, a cautious man, was persuaded suddenly that here was the great opportunity which the goddess fortune had reserved for him, and why he invested everything he had in the expedition, unquote. At any rate, Cortez also viewed the expedition in spiritual terms, as well as an opportunity of wealth. And that doesn't mean those are separate in his mind, by the way. And it doesn't mean at any time that at any point he wasn't just cold-bloodedly logical, because a lot of the time he is, at least judging by his letters. He went about the conquest in a practical manner, to put it as plainly as possible. But rather, I mean, Cortez very much understood that what he was doing was the stuff of legends. The Yucatan, Mexico, and whatever lay beyond were massive places. And immediately from contact, even with just the Maya who lived in city-states, excuse me, and having received a delegation from the Mexica, it was apparent to quite a few people on Cuba that whatever Mesoamerica was, it was an urban place of empire and cities. The skylines were all dotted with these populous cities with massive pyramids, palaces, temples that spoke to a civilization that even if it was lacking in iron and horses, was nevertheless a literate society capable of incredible feats of engineering that astonished the uh, Spaniards when they saw them, and, and agriculture that mystified the civilized barbarians from Europe who gawked at these Mesoamerican cities, that, I mean, literally, these, a lot of these places dwarfed all but the largest of metropolises in Europe, just in size alone. At any rate, because of that, it seemed to the Spaniards involved, even as these events unfolded, that the conquest of Mexico, what they were engaged in, was one of the most important events in world history. Well, at any rate... Maybe that is why Cortez really started dressing to impress as the scale of his operations began ramping up, preparing for departure. And in fact, it began to occur to Velazquez, in fact, what Cortez was planning maybe was a little bit beyond what his instructions had been, which hadn't quite called for such a massive force, which was starting to look to Velasquez as a much larger and more massive colonial venture than he had envisioned. In fact, nearly every man in Cuba with a sword was signing up with Cortez. And it probably didn't help the governor's paranoia either that some of his friends, who'd earlier turned down the part of leading the expedition, started to express regrets for having not done so. Or that Cortez was now walking around town in with a hat, with a plume of feathers, a golden medallion, and a black velvet cloak with golden knots. Velasquez's jester, named Cervantes, teased that Cortez was going to make off with his master's fleet. Velasquez mentioned that joke to Cortez, but Cortez did not laugh. He insisted instead gravely that the, that the jester was insane. Well, insane or not, Cervantes ended up joining the expedition, too. Now, just two weeks after getting his instructions, Cortez had already procured three ships, 300 men, which 
and, and this is something that would have normally probably been expected to take someone two or three months. And when Cortez learned that Velasquez was starting to have second thoughts, he redoubled his efforts and started preparing even faster. From Cortez's perspective, he was worried that, Cort that Velasquez wasn't going to hold up to end his end of the bargain, that he was going to steal whatever profits that Cortez tried to obtain. And he understood that one day, there was going to be a royal ship was going to show up. And it was going to inform everyone in the Caribbean who the Adelantado of the Yucatan was going to be. And Cortez knew that if he didn't get to the Yucatan quickly, there was no way that it was going to be him. Well, after a few weeks of advertising, conquistadors also began arriving from Hispaniola and Puerto Rico. Cuba hardly had a monopoly on grumpy Spaniards who wanted more treasure. Velasquez also finally decided to put Cortez out of control of the operation, but he didn't want to cause a scene about it. And in retrospect, Velasquez probably could have replaced Cortez right then and there if he had been firm about it at this point, because Velasquez was also very, very popular in Cuba. As long as he was just replacing Cortez and not canceling the voyage, it's doubtful that anybody would have stopped him. But Cortez was his brother-in-law, you know, and he decided instead to send an agent to Cortez to inform him that just, you know, you know, not to tell him he was fired or anything, but that just to ask him if he wanted to recuse himself, because if he did that, then the governor would reimburse him for everything he'd spent. Velasquez also attempted to stop Cortez from buying more food. Cortez declined the polite offer to please step aside, and instead decided to leave Santiago ASAP. He promptly sent armed men to the city slaughterhouse to buy the meat, which he had been forbidden from buying, and when the butcher refused, on the grounds that the meat he had was, by contract, meant to feed the town, Cortez's men simply seized everything. In payment, Cortez then pulled the gold chain he wore around his neck off and gave it to the butcher, which presumably, we are left to hope, covered the cost of the meat, though, uh, how the city of Santiago fed itself for the next few weeks is not recorded to history. The next morning, after the butcher informed the governor of what happened, uh, well, Velasquez was mad and finally decided to confront Cortez, who uh, the two finally spoke. Albeit Cortez was flanked by armed men and on a small boat offshore while Velasquez stood on the beach. Cortez asked for forgiveness for not having said goodbye earlier, and promptly instructed his captains to set off. It was November 18th, 18, uh, excuse me, 1518. Unfortunately for Velasquez, who I'm sure was very upset, he didn't have a fleet anymore. Cortez basically enlisted every ship at the ready, so Velasquez couldn't follow even if he wanted to. Cortez made a couple of stops on the other side of Cuba, where he continued to inform various merchants that they would be selling him their supplies, or else he would be taking them free of charge. He even sent one of his ships, he had six by this point, to seize a ship carrying provisions, which he heard was headed to Darien. That brigantine returned to Cortez's fleet with a load of 4,000 arrobas of bread, 1,500 flitches of bacon or salted chicken, too, and I have no idea what an aroba or a flitch is, but I mean 1,500 flitches of bacon sounds like an awful lot of bacon. Cortez picked up the con more conquistadors on the other end of Cuba, who uh, joined up in the expedition, and a lot of these were people who had returned uh, from Grijalva's expedition, who by now had returned, and uh, despite everything that had happened to them, were very eager to go back. And this is the first time that Cortez and a lot of the others on the expedition got to see firsthand some of the treasure which might be obtained in Mexico. And so if you think they were amped out about going to the Yucatan before this, well, let me tell you something. By the time Cortez sailed across the Gulf to the Yucatan, he was nearly fully provisioned and commanded a fleet of 11 ships. Four large ships, capable of carrying between 60 and 100 tons, his flagship being the largest, and seven brigantines. Pedro de Alvarado's ship was late to the final muster, and Cortez sailed without him. 
Or maybe instead of being late, he sailed ahead early. It's not entirely clear. But this is the first of many instances where Alvarado fucks up during this expedition. He receives leniency from Cortez afterwards, though, every time. At any rate, Alvarado sailed later and caught up, and altogether counting those late arrivals. Cortez was in command of 530 conquistadors aboard 11 ships. 30 were crossbowmen, 12 had arquebuses, perhaps 50 of the men were sailors by trade, a crew which was multinational. There were Portuguese, Genoese, Neapolitans, and a Frenchman as part of that crew, in addition to numerous Spaniards. Besides the sailors, there were Portuguese, Italian, and Greek conquistadors, which made up the part of the 530. But by far, the majority came from Spain. Specifically, a third of the conquistadors came from Andalusia, or Old Castile proper. Another 16% came, like Cortes did, from Extremadura. And there were even women who traveled. One conquistador, Diego Ordaz, brought his two sisters and in addition, three or four maids and two housekeepers are recorded as being present. Also along were the 16 horses Cortez had at his disposal, which Cordoba and Grijalva had not brought. And in addition, numerous war dogs, probably Irish wolfhounds or mastiffs, though the difference in dog breeds in the 15th century is a bit obscure to us today. So with that said, when I say they were provisioned, or nearly fully provisioned, I mean they were provisioned for crossing to the Yucatan, maybe for a couple of weeks max. There was not enough food to be sufficient for long, but that did mean they were free and clear from Velazquez, who, in addition to have to take some time to get a fleet together, also governed an island with a population of maybe 1,000 white males, 300 or more of which had left to join uh, uh, up with Cortez's 500 plus. It was February 18th, 1519, when Cortez officially sailed across to the Yucatan as the third Castilian to lead such an expedition. When he got there, he found a surprise, Alvarado and the missing ship, who insisted that he'd arrived at the rally point before Cortez, that bad weather had forced him out to sea, and that's definitely the only reason he arrived first. A likely story, perhaps. At any rate, when Cortez and his men landed, he found the inhabitants of the coastal villages had fled. Probably because Alvarado and his men had been seizing turkeys, men and women as slaves, and whatever golden ornaments they could find from the local temples. Cortez reprimanded him that this was no way to pacify the country, and Alvarado denied merely even having done anything unusual, and that was that. At any rate, after the Spaniards spent some time pillaging, um, an old woman, probably the wife of one of the nobility, showed herself to the conquistador. She was accompanied by her servants and children. Cortez gave her some clothes, another, uh, cosas de Castilla, or things from Castile, to- like, uh, for example, toys for the children and mirrors and scissors for the servants. The translator for this meeting was Melkor, one of the two boys uh, who'd survived since being taken a couple of years earlier during Coronado's expedition. Melkor wasn't a great translator, apparently. After he was kidnapped, for some reason he just wasn't all that interested in learning Castilian. Um, The Spanish just couldn't understand why. But enough communication was possible that Cortes successfully asked the Maya women to invite the chiefs and others of Yucatan back to the town. He promised they would be well treated, and beyond that he promised that the things stolen by Alvarado's men would be returned. In fact, Cortes was so friendly with the Maya and Cozumel that much of the city even patiently listened to him when he extolled the virtues of the one true God and his son Jesus Christ, how their own deities were devils, and that human sacrifice was a horrible sin. In fact, he told the people of Cozumel that they should break their idols. And beyond that, Cortes even interrupted a Maya religious ceremony to begin to sermonize about how the Maya were going to be doomed to hell if they did not change their ways, um, as he tried his hand at giving this impromptu mass. Well, either that or maybe the Maya were just enthralled by the candles, which was uh, a technology not previously known to the Americas. More so, in fact, even than the horses, the guns, or anything else. 
candle made an immediate impression amongst the literate peoples of Mesoamerica. Um, I need that, they said. From the Maya perspective, besides the immediate attraction to candles, they also liked the fact liked uh, the fact that to accompany the mass, the Cortes and the Spanish had built a cross and hung it up on top of a high tower in the made pyramid of Cozumel, along with an image of the Virgin Mary, which they hung with native clothes. Now, it doesn't might not sound to you that people would like if uh, you went to their temple, a non-Christian temple, and then just nailed up a cross on the wall. But believe it or not, the cross was a holy symbol to the Maya in addition to being a holy symbol of Christianity. So it may very well have been that the Maya believed that Cortes was simply telling them that they needed to show better respect to a deity that already existed in Mexico. In any rate, the Spanish were pleased, because while the Castilian state at Cozumel, no sacrifices of human beings took place. With that said, I, as I explained at Blood Oath, the Maya didn't really sacrifice a whole lot of people in comparison to the Mexica. And in fact, normal Maya sacrifices instead included partridges, quails, and dogs. Now, Cozumel is an island off the coast of the Yucatan. And after some time of friendly relations, the locals of Cozumel informed Cortes that on the mainland, in the land known as Yucatan, there were two Christians who had been carried there a long time ago on a boat. And a lord of that land held them as captives. Well, that's a story that got Cortes's attention. Though the chief also mentioned that he would not be sending his servants as messengers to Yucatan because he was afraid they might be captured and eaten but Cortes was resolved to send someone. He paid some Maya who were willing to do the job. They went along with one of Cortes's friends, Juan de Escalante, on three brigantines with 50 men. That expedition was gone for over a week, and that concerned Cortes greatly, though it's hard to say whether or not he was more concerned with the missing 50 men or the potential of missing out on better interpreters. Melkor's ability in Castilian, as befitting a children who had been kidnapped and then spent two years learning a language, was not the best, obviously. The messengers searched for the captives. One of them carried a concealed message written from Cortez hidden in his hair. This brief letter stated that Cortez had arrived with 550 Spaniards to discover and settle the lands of Mexico. When Escalante returned, though, he did so without the two missing Spaniards. Cortez sailed on to the Yucatan without new interpreters. Well, the expedition was not long on the mainland without events happening. On March 12, 1519, a canoe approached the fleet. It carried, quote, three naked men, except their private parts were covered. Their hair was tied as woman's hair is tied, and they carried bows and arrows. They made signs that the Castilians should not be afraid and reach the shore, unquote. One of them approached and spoke in Spanish. Gentlemen, are you Christians? Whose subjects are you? One of the conquistadors replied, they were Castilians and were vassalos of the king of Castile. The man began to weep with joy and asked them to give thanks to God with him. His name was Geronimo de Aguilar, and he was one of the two men who had been kept alive at Yucatan in captivity. Aguilar had read Cortez's letter. He was about 30 years old at the time and was a minor celebrity back in his hometown as a result of his misfortune. His mother, having heard that her son was the prisoner of cannibals, henceforth refused to eat meat. And in fact, the sound of anything frying apparently brought her tremendous difficulty. That is the flesh of my son, she would cry. Or, am I not the most unhappy of mothers? Well, I certainly hope for her sake that she live long enough to hear about her son's rescue. Aguilar explained in spring of 1511 that he was on a ship under the command of a conquistadorman named Valdivia, and was headed from Darien to Santo Domingo in order to report on the quarrels between Sueza and Balboa. That ship struck shoals, and Aguilar ended up sending off in a boat with 20 other men with no food or water and only one pair of oars. 
The current took them far to the west. When they reached Yucatan, half the men were dead. The Maya captured the rest, promptly sacrificed Valdivia and four others, and ate their bodies at a fiesta. Aguilar and the others were put in cages, fattened up, and were apparently to be eaten at the next banquet, but they broke out and fled. They were sheltered by a Maya chief named Zemazanga, or excuse me, Zemazana. He kept them as slaves. By the time Cortez arrived, though, all but two were dead. Aguilar and Gonzalo Guerrero, Guerrero, excuse me. Unlike Aguilar, Guerrero did not return to the Spaniards. Aguilar was very ready to return to Spanish life. Very, one account stated he even kept with him throughout his captivity a well-used book of prayers. He claimed to the conquistadors that his strength of faith had kept him from the temptations of women offered to him by his Maya hosts. A likely story, perhaps, but regardless, one that differed tremendously with that of Gonzalo Guerrero. Guerrero now had a Maya wife, who was the daughter of the lord of Chetimal. That was a city hundreds of miles south of Cortez. He had three children, a pierced nose and ears, and his face and hands were now tattooed in the Maya style. Aguilar said that Guerrero was too ashamed to show his new features to the Spanish, and in addition, wasn't exactly just some enslaved captive like Aguilar. Instead, he was a military advisor of Na Chan Chak Khan, the lord of Chatamal and his father-in-law. Hugh Thomas says, too, that it's possible that Guerrero had unhappy memories of his hometown, Niebla. In his youth, a famine there had reduced the population of Niebla to cannibalism. Guerrero was probably far less shocked by this aspect of Mesoamerican culture than the average European, and Mexico might not have been the first time he'd tasted human flesh. William H. Prescott says it took us... It took some time for Aguilar to report all of this. And in fact, he became acculturated back to the Spaniards in generally rather slowly, even if he had not gone fully native like Guerrero. In my opinion, this is one of Prescott's best passages. Quote, Aguilar was simply clad in the habiliments of his country, somewhat too scanty for European eye. It was long indeed before his tastes, which he had acquired in the freedom of the forest, could be reconciled to the constraints of dress or manners imposed by the artificial forms of civilization. Aguilar's long residence in the country had familiarized him with the Maya dialects of Yucatan, and as he gradually revived his Castilian, he became of essential importance as an interpreter. Cortez tested Aguilar as interpreter with the temp and with attempted an attempted excuse me with an another attempted sermon to the Maya, wherein he extolled the virtues of Christian salvation, and even went got so bold as to destroy some of the Maya idols. Then afterward, the con expedition continued on, now with a much better interpreter, or at least one who knew a lot more Castilian than Melkor. They sailed along the same routes, taken first by Cordoba and then by Grijalva, since Cortez had the same pilots. But he also had one brigantine sail closer to the coast in order to find, quote, whatever secrets of the territory, unquote, he might discover. Those pilots persuaded Cortez not to stop at Champotan. The Cordillo was thinking about attempting to avenge the defeat of Hernandez de Cordoba. The pilots warned him that the water was shallow. So they went past Champotan. Instead, they stopped at a harbor which had been discovered by Grijalva, quote-unquote discovered, and named by that discoverer, Puerto de Sillado. There, they found a mastiff dog left behind by the previous Spaniards. It had still alive, eating rabbits and other game for the entire year, very happy and apparently without much difficulty, and the conquistadors took this to be a good omen, along with another incident. A storm, a thunderstorm, uh, separated one of the ships from the fleet, but it was quickly recovered and without loss of, of life. And between that and finding the dog, uh, they were all in very good mood. Cortez sent Alvarado and Alonso de Avila on foot, each with 50 men, to explore each side of the Grijalva River. When Cortez's party, parties found natives who lived in a town called 
Patonchon, they immediately read the Requerimiento. Cortes allegedly took possession of the Yucatan there for Spain then, though obviously the Maya would not have understood that document, and even if they did, I'm sure you would agree with the questionable nature, to say the least, of such illegal proceedings. Regardless, the next day a Maya delegation brought food in eight canoes to the Spaniards, and Cortes received this delegation with all the grace that the average conquistador offered native peoples. He accepted the food and informed the Maya that he needed more food. That it was very rude, in fact, of them to let the Castilians starve. And, in fact, if they were to let the Spanish into their city, then Cortes would do something very good for them. In fact, he would give them very good advice. Really, really great advice. He assured these diplomats that the, their lord was going to want to hear what he had to say. Well, the Maya replied that, actually, they didn't need any advice. And frankly, the Spaniards should go away, and also that they should stop bullying them. The Maya continued to warn the Spanish, saying that, in fact, if they did not leave, they would all be killed. Cortes replied that he would enter their town that very night. And even if they got very pissed off about it, well, the Maya and Cortes read some sort of statement um, in which he demanded the acceptance, their acceptance of his king. And when they did that, the Patonchon forces were immediately mustered and attacked the Spaniards. This attack was organized with bows and arrows and stones flinging from slings that were fired at the Castilians as the units of Maya soldiers attack Cortez's uh, forces along the shore of the river. Some of the Maya units even waded out knee-deep into the water to attack the boats and the men in the ships to make the rescue of the land forces more difficult. Cortez might have actually been defeated right then and there had it not been for the cannons, which he ordered fired, and that frightened the Maya soldiers for a bit, but not for long. The Maya were skilled in combat, their leaders rallied the army, and continued the battle, shooting more arrows, flinging spears from addle addles, and maybe even using the wooden swords with obsidian blades, which the Mashika preferred. Now, beyond the organization of the Patanchan army, individual Maya warriors were likely far more experienced than the Spanish conquistadors in, in this combat, few of whom had ever experienced an actual battle against a large organized force. Now, the conquistadors were very experienced in violence, of course, but the largest armies, quote-unquote armies, most of them had seen before this engagement, um, belonged to much smaller societies of the Taino and the Caribs. Twenty conquistadors were wounded quickly, but luckily for them, they had a technological advantage, and ultimately the Spanish rallied. The horses, in particular, were effective, Remember, this is the first time uh, horses are used. And they enabled a Spanish pincer, which routed the Maya from behind. 400 ultimately were taken prisoner. The Castilians moved into the center of town, just like Cortes promised. And they slept in the patio of the main temple. A beautiful ceiba tree stood in the center of the square. Cortes took symbolic possession of the battle by making three cuts with his sword. The only Castilian casualties, though, were 20 injured men, uh, except for Melkor, the young interpreter slave. He used that opportunity to hang up his old clothes on a tree and escape into the night. Uh, of course, we do not know if he ever succeeded in rejoining his own people, but I hope he did. In which case, perhaps he reunited with his family and led a good life as a fisherman on the Yucatan coast. Cortes specifically learned after the battle from the captives that Melkor did just go beyond simply escaping them. The prisoners uh, to, uh, that he obtained, the 400 prisoners, told him that Melkor came to them and told them that the Spaniards were most certainly mortal and that the Maya should attack them unceasingly. But Cortes was also learning lessons. First, that his artillery was of primary importance to his victories. The shock effect of his guns had a consequence out of proportion to their lethality, and this 
uh, made them incredibly valuable. Excuse me, I'm going to have a sip of water. Second, the Indians fought to secure captives, not to kill on the battlefield. And that was a far more difficult ca task. I mean, if you can imagine, I, I, you know, just how more difficult it is than, say, if you're not interested in trying to shoot someone with an arrow, you're interested in running over and grabbing them. Um, well, at any rate, because of that, <clears throat> sometimes uh, it was possible for a small number of Spaniards to have great success against a much larger number of Mesoamericans. The more difficult it was to capture someone in the Mesoamerican rules of warfare, the more valuable they were to capture, if that makes sense, at any rate. Now, it's bad enough for the Maya that their wooden and stone weapons had trouble penetrating iron Spanish armor, but despite the large number of Maya soldiers, there were Maya men who could have killed Spaniards, but some warriors were willing to, quote, impale themselves on the points of Castilian swords so as to lay their hands on their owners, unquote, according to Bernal Diaz. Taking captives was necessary, of course, for fulfilling the requirements a community had to the gods, and beyond that, slavery was widespread in Mesoamerica. Most people were not killed and eaten, believe it or not, but rather, for example, many, many families in Tenochtitlan had slaves. I mean, slavery in the Aztec Empire kind of operated like slavery in the Roman Empire, in that it was very widespread. Obtaining captives for the Flowery War, is what it was called, was a prominent practice in Mesoamerica. What this meant um, was, like I said, it just took significantly more effort to capture Spanish soldiers. And on numerous occasions, from this point onwards, and even twice to Cortez himself, conquistadors will be saved because their attackers are trying to capture them alive rather than to try to kill them on the spot. Now, I know this sounds crazy, but it also sounds crazy uh, to me that someone might wear metal armor in the hot Mexican sun. Well, that's what the Spanish were doing until after this battle. The third lesson Cortez learned was that he didn't need his troops wearing metal armor. The quilted cotton armor, which the Maya and other Mesoamerican armies used, was actually superior for protection against arrows and sling stones, and not only did you not get all worn out wearing metal armor in the hot sun, but also arrows and stones did not ricochet off the cotton armor instead of the metal armor, which could still, you know, an, an arrow could ricochet off you and hit pokey in the eye, so just like your mother always did. From this point onward, in fact, the Spanish actually basically used their metal armor for psychological effect. And in that way, this metal armor becomes more similar in function to the feathered costumes that the indigenous captains wore. At any rate, the day after the attack, Cortez had the prisoners brought before him, and he informed them that what happened was their fault, since he had peacefully begged for food and shelter. Cortez stated that he wished to talk to their king. He let them leave, which they did. And when no Maya king arrived... Cortez thought hmm, maybe that was a mistake, because he noticed that the Maya were reassembling for another attack. So Cortez sent troops out his reconnaissance in all directions. Um, he captured as many as the Maya as he could, and for the rest of that day, he just tried to obtain intelligence. Uh, they were surrounded in the town. Two days after the attack, um, the army surrounding him still had not attacked, and instead the leaders of Pantanchan came before Cortez. They greeted him in traditional Maya style. They told Cortez that if he did not burn down their town, which he was sieged up in, they would bring him food. But the impasse continued, because the Maya only brought some fruit, and apologized, well, that's all the food there was. Cortez got very angry, and he sent out parties of men to go secure food. And that is how Gonzalo de Alvarado, in command of 250 men, uh, Gonzalo, the brother of Pedro, uh, found some maize fields uh, belonging to the Maya and went to steal the crops, but those fields were guarded. A battle ensued and when the Castilians found that the maize was not for sale. 
Ultimately, the Spaniards were forced to retreat, even after Cortes and reinforcements arrived to assist. Um, the next day, fighting continued, and for the first time, Cortes brought out most of the horses. The battle took place near irrigation ditches, where the resulting trench warfare made the crossbowmen and arquebusiers very ineffective. Even the artillery was unsatisfactory in the performance against the Maya by this point. In this region, as the Cortes, every time, I mean, basically the longer Cortes fought against uh, a single city, the, the better the uh, defenders would become at overcoming their fear of the artillery. And uh, in the ditches, they could kind of just duck. But horses were another matter. The Maya thought that actual real-life dragons had descended to the earth, or at least centaurs. One horseman in particular, Francisco de Morla, was in his steel helmet and cuirass and on his armored steed, shining in the sun. He did a lot of damage. Even his fellow Castilians, who, just for your information, were nearly as credulous as the Maya, who thought Morla was a centaur, thought for some time that Morla was Santiago himself, the patron saint of Spain, who apparently had magically, in this case, descended from the heavens to assist them. Um, that would have been quite a miracle. Uh, ultimately, the Maya withdrew. The Spaniards won the field. Uh, Sixty of them were now wounded, and some very badly. And shortly afterwards, a hundred more were temporarily out of action and sick from a water bug from one of the streams nearby they, they caught. But as a result, um, what happened was both sides were very eager for peace. The Maya lord of Patanchon finally came out to meet Cortes. He brought gold, turquoise, and 20 women for the conquistadors, which when Cortes divided those up, his captains were very happy. Cortes was quick to question them about the gold. Where were the gold mines? The Maya told them they didn't have any of those, but that the Mexica had plenty, which incidentally was a frequently claim by uh, various Indian groups to the Spanish, who it would often just be something you would say just to make the Spaniards leave. At any rate, the Maya explained that unlike Grijalva, who wanted gold, Cortes had asked for food. And that is why the trouble started. Uh, the Spanish were lucky, in fact, from the Maya perspective, as they went on to declare, the Maya lord did, that uh, if his soldiers had not been so dazzled by metal, swords, gunpowder, and horses, all of the Spaniards would have been destroyed. Well... At any rate, peace was declared, and afterwards Cortes spent three weeks at Pontonchon, trading with the Maya, attempting his best to explain the benefits of joining with Spain to them and serving the emperor and the Christian god. And in fact, the Maya were eager to become vassals of Spain. It's not entirely clear if they understood the difference between vassal and friend in these early communications, but at any rate, the Maya likewise enthusiastically joined in on Spanish ceremonies like the, such as the Mass, just as they had earlier with Cortes. Uh, and again, it's not really clear if they understood what the Mass was about. Um, and again... It seems like they were probably more interested in the candles. And the Spaniards' willingness to teach the Maya how to make their own candles greatly helped the popularity of these uh, early masses. And regardless um, what you think of them or how this might have gone down, these early weeks at Pontonchan were the important first steps that were taken in Mesoamerica in the process of syncretism between Mesoamerican religion and Christianity. Anyway, the Lord of Pontan also offered Cortes uh, a girl who spoke both the local Chantal Maya language as well as Nahuatl, the language of, Mex of the Mexica, and this is of extreme importance. Important because while Aguilar could communicate with the Maya, he did not speak Nahuatl. And by having these two interpreters, Cortes could communicate through Aguilar and then through this woman and then to the Mexica. So a double translation. Her name is Malina or uh, Malinche. Anyway, this took time and isn't obviously the most efficient way of communicating. But nevertheless, Cortes could communicate with the people of Mexico in a way that the Spanish on the Caribbean had not been able to before, that no other one before him could do. And 
Cortez gave her at first to one of his captains, but after a while she will eventually become Cortez's mistress. Like I said, uh, her name is Malina, or Malinche, although originally her name may have been something more like Malinali, at any rate. Uh, that is Malinali being the name of the 12th Mexican month. But she was christened Marina. She is without a doubt, um, including even including Montezuma and Hernan Cortez, uh, amongst the most important individuals in the story. Uh, La Malinche, as she was called, uh, was born around the year 1500 to a noble family of Nahuatl speakers in a region called Ulutla along the Cozalcocos River. It was east of Tenochtitlan. Her family seems to have been very high-ranking. Bernal Diaz reports that her family ruled the region, but it also seems that her family fell into disfavor. She was sold, as a consequence, to a backwater of the Aztec Empire near Pontonchan in the Maya realms. She exhibited quite a bit of intelligence with skill and skill with languages, and after some time, Aguilar was even basically disposed of as an interpreter, to be clear, not as a conquistador. And ultimately, um, after some time, Cortes will get by with only La Malinche as interpreter once she learns some Spanish. Uh, before that, um, and around that time, she also becomes Cortes' mistress. In certain ways, her life is powerless. In the same way, I mean, women did not have power either in Spain or in Mexico, really. But from this poet, um, she does get a little bit of power, and she leverages it well, I think. She plays a pivotal role in the conquest of Mexico. Indigenous depictions of the meetings between Montezuma and Cortes always feature La Malinche prominently between them. A lot about her is mysterious, uh, probably a result of the sexism of both of these societies that minimized her role to some extent, um, but both Spanish and Me Mexica accounts give what I would call a begrudging token of respect, like, you know, yeah, I admit this woman was pretty important. Um, but the Mexica was shocked that, that Cortes was using a woman, for example, to speak to them. Uh, you know, the, the, the high-ranking ones. Hugh Thomas writes that despite her importance, quote, neither her mistakes in translation nor her prejudices will ever be known. Her loyalty to Cortes seems to have been absolute. Her value was certainly equivalent to 10 bronze cannon, unquote. Um, Cortes's ships reached the island discovered by Grijalva, and which that conquistador earlier christened San Juan de Ulua, on May, in May of 1519. The island is less than a mile from the mainland of Mexico at the modern port of Veracruz. And at the time, it was very close to the Totonac town of Chalchiquayacan. Veracruz was home to the Totonac people, and it was and who they had been recently conquered and were now under the control of the Aztec Empire. The, uh, Mex the Mexica lord of the region sent out a delegation to meet Cortes. Uh, they reached the ships and canoes and were given wine and some glass blue bleeds. The next day, on Good Friday, Cortes landed. He hadn't received permission, but he there wasn't an army ready to oppose him either. Anyway, he brought about 200 of his conquistadors, along with some horses, artillery, his Cuban slaves, and a few dogs. A veteran of Italy named Francisco uh, Mesa uh, was in charge of the guns. He placed them. They were probably breech-loading, like uh, I had mentioned earlier, taken from the ships. Once Cortes landed, he was received with signs of love, he repeats. Uh, he reports, excuse me, not by Nahuatl speaking Mexica, but by the local Totonac population. The Totonacs were a people who had been recently conquered by the Mexica, like I said, and they weren't very happy about it. They took the appearance of these militarized strangers to be a very good thing, obviously, and Grijalva was remembered fondly there after leaving both Patonchon with the Maya and by the Totonacs of uh, Chalchiquayacan, uh, just trading um, peacefully with them. He was remembered fondly in the region. And historians believe that the Totonacs had been anticipating a possible Spanish return 
and were already thinking about how that could lead to a war of liberation against their oppressors from Tonesh Titlon. The Totonex presented beans, meat, fish, maize cakes, turkeys, and other foods, in addition to cloaks and silver and copper plates to Cortez. The Caudillo offered back presents to the Totonac chiefs. Gold belts, Spanish breeches, two red shirts and berets. Red, incidentally, is the color, color which Quetzalcoatl symbolically was painted, and it's recorded as a joyous day. One man, Benito, a tambourine player who was on the voyage of Grijalva, did as he had done on that voyage. He played music and danced with the Totonax. Now, despite the lack of horses in Mesoamerica, the Mexica developed a very speedy system of messengers because the Spanish arrived on a Thursday, and it was only four days later, on Sunday, when a Mexica delegation arrived to speak with Cortes that had been sent by the emperor. A slave named Quitlalpitoc, excuse me, led a train of servants to the coast. They brought enough food for the expedition for several days, as well as jewels, and Cortez banned this expedition, excuse me, banned his expedition from privately trading gold. He put up a table just outside the camp where trade was to be officially conducted. In addition, local Mexica, the local Mexica steward came out to meet Cortez in person. His name was Tudile. He came with many warriors. He was unarmed, but uh, he wore his feathers and his embroidered cloak, and so did his warriors, and he was also bearing many provisions for the Spaniards. He said that Montezuma had heard of the Battle of Potonchan and presented Cortez with more gifts. His name was uh, two dial, like I said, excuse me, and he ordered his men to build huts for the Spanish, since it would soon be the rainy season. This was done quickly. The Spanish were stunned at the 2,000 servants put at their disposal, the first indication that they had the of the tremendous population that lived in Mexico. Um, there was no shortage of labor, and, and they started to notice this, how many people were around. We don't know what sort of priests and sorcerers and spies that Montezuma seated in this group of 2,000 servants, but doubtless he implanted some of his servants. And this grand act of hospitality and gift-giving and shelter-building also contained a hidden tactic. It was better, in Montezuma's eyes, to have the newcomers sleeping on land than in their ships. Cortez and his captains dined with Tudile and his companions. Melinche and Aguilar combined to allow for a stilted but manageable conversation. Tudile wondered about the pieces of wood, which the Spaniards humbled themselves before the dinner began. Cortez explained that he was the subject of Don Carlos, king of Spain and the Holy Roman Emperor, and had been sent there by his king as an ambassador. Tudal replied that his king was no less of a king than this Don Carlos, for Montezuma was also a great lord, served by lesser lords. He then revealed a chest full of golden objects, mostly jewelry, like, and as well finely worked cotton cloth, and more food. In return, Cortez offered more beads, an inlaid armchair, some pearls, and a crimson cap with a gold medal on it, which reportedly Tudile accepted with good grace, but unenthusiastically. Cortez offered that Montezuma might sit in the chair and wear the red cap when Cortez himself came to visit, so that he could set up in one of their temples a, quote, cross and an image of Our Lady, with their precious son in her arms, unquote. Cortez promised that if anything happened, the Mexica would prosper, since they currently worshipped idols. The two also spoke of what Montezuma looked like. Tudile told him, quote, He is a mature man, not fat but spare, small and thin, unquote. Cortez paraded his men in military formation to the sound of drum and fife, and staged a show of mock combat with their swords flashing, while Alvarado led the horsemen to gallop along the beach, bells attached to the bridles of their mount, 
guards, and the Lombard guard, the Lombard guns loosed a thunderous charge of cannon, of fire. Uh, excuse me. The Mexica were overcome with admiration for the military power which the Spanish possessed, most specifically the guns and horses, and were also specifically impressed by how much a horse could eat and drink. Tudal prepared a lengthy report for Montezuma. It was complete with the work of artists who had carefully sketched on cotton cloth their impressions of the visitors, as well as the horses, swords, guns, and ships. But he made perhaps one big mistake. He answered a honest question, an answer of Cortez honestly, and that was Cortez asked Tudal if Montezuma possessed gold. He asked, since he knew that of course, gold's good for a bad heart, of course, Cortez explained. Some of his men were ill with that complaint. Oh, yes, Tudal replied. Montezuma did have gold. Nothing could have been more dangerous than that admission. The Michigan governor went home after that, leaving one of his lieutenants in charge of the servants who were commanded to maintain the several hundred huts uh, they had created for the Spanish, as well as to give tortillas, beans, meat, and fish to the visitors on a regular basis, and grass for the horses. Tudal's report reached Montezuma in a day and a half, longer than it might have otherwise taken via the relay messenger system. That's because the report was not taken to the emperor by the traditional relay messaging system. Instead, it was brought strictly by messengers who'd seen the Spanish themselves. They operated under orders of secrecy to tell no one of the, what they had seen. And it's hard to say if and if they did exactly how much that the sources might have over-represented the dread that Montezuma is reported to have felt upon receiving this news. Because those sources come from after the conquest. Um, but at any rate, Montezuma is reported to have received the information with no shortage of alarm. He probably did, like I said, know a lot about what had happened in Costur de Oro and in the Caribbean, especially on the big islands, at least more than what we know that he knew. And he almost certainly had heard everything about Cortez's activities in the Yucatan his speeches about the one true God and the great Spanish king and the Spanish hostility to human sacrifice. Humus, uh, excuse me, <laughs> Humus. Hugh Thomas says, Cortez, uh, excuse me, Montezuma, quote, must have felt that locusts were coming in ever smaller, nearer circles, unquote. One source says Montezuma almost died of fright Another says that he was filled with dread, as if swooning, and kept repeating, What will happen to us? Well, at any rate, it appears that Montezuma sacrificed two captives and sprinkled the messengers liberally with their blood upon their entrance to Tenochtitlan. Then he received the report. After that, in the House of Serpents, he tasted the Spanish food and examined an iron helmet which was part of the loot he'd received in the gifts. The messengers told Montezuma how the cannon was deafening when it was fired, that the smoke smelled foul, that the cannibals had the power to destroy trees. The reports of horses, quote, high as rooftops, unquote, and the large war dogs were also very frightening. But perhaps most distressing to the emperor was the report that the man in charge of this expedition, this Cortez, he seemed very intent on visiting Tenochtitlan. It is said that the emperor considered hiding at Sincalco, where there was a secret royal paradise and where many royals were buried. His priests, though, reportedly also convinced him he must remain at his post. Hugh Thomas says that Montezuma was left with few possibilities as to who the Spanish were. One, that the Castilians were Chichimex, the Nahuatl word for barbarians, and that that meant they were just one more powerful group of outsiders here to rob and conquer. 
much like his own Meshiga ancestors had done. This was definitely the dominant view of many Meshikas, it seems. And for that matter, the Maya in Yucatan seemed to have held a similar view as well, considering how stringent their defenses were. At any rate, Tudile and his messengers told Montezuma and that the Spanish were a new, quote, powerful, cruel enemy, unquote. A second hypothesis was that the Spanish were exactly what they claimed to be. That is, that the Spanish tried to present themselves, for what it's worth, as peaceful ambassadors from a faraway land, here only to preach and trade. Nobody really seems to have bought this. Even the Spanish allies seem to have been more interested in the Spanish as warriors than as trading partners. The Totonacs put forth their own hypothesis, however. And this might have been a big part of Montezuma's concern. The Totonacs were going around telling everyone that Cortez and his companions were sent from heaven, that they were immortal, and that they were definitely Tules, or gods, great supernatural creatures. Where exactly they were from, that wasn't important if you ask the Totonacs. Maybe they weren't from anywhere in particular at all. The Totonax thus justified whatever actions the Spanish took, good or bad. Gods weren't necessarily saints, after all. Mesoamerican Tules or gods could do terrible things like the Greek deities. Huitzitopochtli, the Mexica deity, reportedly stole the clothes from the Mexica who worshipped him while they were bathing on their legendary voyage to Mesoamerica from the north. Quetzalcoatl reportedly got drunk and seduced his own sister. All sorts of stories like that. Bernantias said that the Totonacs called the Spanish Chules, quote, which is their name for both gods and evil spirits, unquote. The identity of who Quetzalcoatl is and why he is specifically connected with the Spanish and whether or not anyone thought of this after the fact or not, well, that's a big part of why the Totonacs, at least, were so eager to put forth the hypothesis that the Spanish were divine. Quetzalcoatl may have been a religious innovator who sought to end human sacrifices, uh, but was destroyed by the conservative forces in Mexica society. Maybe he was an older god of the valley instead, whom the emperor Itzcoatl refused to accept as not warlike enough and uh, wrote him out of the histories when he destroyed so much of the old uh, of the old books. Perhaps Quetzalcoatl was a prince or a priest who in the long ago past led a popular rebellion against authorities and since that time had been transformed into legend. Well, whatever the truth was, at some point in the past, he probably was a real person. And his worship was something subversive from the uh, Mexica perspective before the arrival of the Spanish. But it's also a little bit more complicated than that, too. The people of Mesoamerica believed Quetzalcoatl was the wind, the spirit of regeneration. They called him the warrior of the dawn. Whatever his true origins, there were minor temples to him in all sorts of places, even in Tenochtitlan, where the priesthood of Huitzilopochtli was very much dominant in society. But Quetzalcoatl was still worshipped as the patron of the Kalmakaks, the schools of the upper class. So there's a lot of mystery about Quetzalcoatl, who he was, why he was venerated even by the Mexica, who had reason to fear his return. But what is clear is this. Montezuma seems to have put a lot more faith into this possibility than many other Mexica did. Whatever Montezuma might have thought, whether or not his feels, his excuse me, his fears were real or an invention made up after the fact, many other Mexica rulers, albeit in subservient rules to the emperor, were convinced instead that the Spanish were nothing more than a group of criminals to be dealt with, in the same way that a modern government might label a group uh, a new terrorist organization. Montezuma instead settled on a policy which might be considered appeasement. 
these mysterious strangers were to be given more presents. Another official emissary was quickly sent. He may have believed that uh, the god Tezcatlipoca, or quote, unquote, smoking mirrors, was angry with him, that his fate was sealed. Tezcatlipoca is something of a trickster god for the Mexica, like a Loki figure. And, and Montezuma does seem like he was quite religious. Supposedly, the emperor stated to his envoy, quote, All of us will die at the hands of the Tules, and those who survive will be their slaves and vassals. They are the ones to reign now, and I shall be the last ruler of this land. Even if some of our relations and descendants survive, they will be subordinates, like tax gatherers, unquote. Or at least one Spanish chronicler records that. I'm not so sure if that's something Montezuma really ever would have said, even if it was, to one of his most trusted advisors. That sounds uh, very apocryphal. I think perhaps likely that Montezuma held similar beliefs that the Totonacs had, that the Spaniards could be allied with and used as a powerful weapon, and in the emperor's case, to initiate greater conquests. Um, but with that said, Montezuma appears more fearful of the Spanish than others in Mexica leadership, for sure. Many of them are itching for a fight. And he will also at times maybe come across as like he might be suffering from depression, or he's more distressed, at least in the chronicles, than other Mexica leaders. But again, that might be something added after the fact. It's possible. Maybe Montezuma was just gloomy because he knew more than anyone else in the empire about the capabilities of the Spanish and their weaponry. But whatever it was that went into his decision. Montezuma did not send an army to fight the Castilians, and if he had done that, he probably could have crushed them, ultimately. Instead, he sent an ambassador with more gifts of gold, jewels fashioned of gold, golden bells and necklaces, golden models of ducks, lions, jaguars, deer and monkeys, bows and arrows made of gold, golden staffs of office. All of this was sent to the coast. So too were beautiful headdresses and fans of green feathers, some with gold attachments as well. Cloaks, wigs, mirrors, shields, masks, jackets, sticks, earrings, diadems, breastplates, aigrets, buskins with bells. A great treasure, all placed in baskets taken to the Spaniards. Montezuma sent it with the message, Go, do not delay, make reverence to our lord. Tell him that his lieutenant Montezuma has sent you here. He gives you in, here is what he gives you in, in honor of your arrival, in your home in Montezuma, unquote. Now, some of that talk, um, I should, you know, him calling himself Cortez's lieutenant, uh, that's just him being polite, it, like a phrase, like in Old English, like, Your servant, sir. An indication of courtesy more than inferiority, regardless. It's probably pretty clear that the emperor, I think, had not yet decided who he was dealing with, um, because he also gave very explicit instructions on how to feed the Spaniards. Uh, the emissary was to cook traditional foods associated with Quetzalcoatl. Quote, if he eats and drinks what you give him, he is surely Quetzalcoatl, as he will be shown to be familiar with our food. If by chance he does not like the food which you have given him, and he is desirous of eating human flesh, and would like to eat you, allow yourself to be eaten. I assure you that I will look after your wife, relations, and children, unquote. Presumably that second instruction would have basically been proof that Cortez was instead associated with the Tule Huitzilopochtli rather than Quetzalcoatl. At any rate, that emissary, named Teoclamacazzi, found that Cortez was back on the ships when he arrived on the coast. It wasn't entirely clear what goes down afterwards, but when the Mexica delegation spoke with Malinche and replied with the question of who they were with, we come from Mexico, La Malinche replied, you may or may not come from there. Perhaps you are teasing us. Now, 
I say it isn't entirely clear what happens next, because one chronicle states that the Michigans announced they'd come to see their lord and king, Quetzalcoatl, and the Spaniards began to whisper amongst themselves, wondering what this meant. Who is Quetzalcoatl? Now, at any rate, Cortes did basically dress himself up as much as a king as possible. He sat on his finest chair on the deck of his ship, and so that it appeared he was something like a lord. Uh, Teotla Makansky and the other emissaries offered to sacrifice ten slaves for Cortes. He refused. Curious, though. If he were a Tule, the Mexica would have thought, why would he refuse such a sacrifice? The Mexica dressed Cortes in conventional Mexica clothing. They put a dragon's head of gold on Cortez's head, a rich cloak of feathers, rings of gold and silver on his ankles, green earrings in the shape of serpents on his ears, ornaments were laid at his side like a mirror of obsidian to be attached to his back, a tray of gold, a jar of gold, fans, a shield of mother of pearl. They asked Cortez what other lords were aboard his ship, and a few captains were also similarly garbed as Tule's. Alvarado, in particular, made an impression on the Mexica. He had striking blonde hair and was from that time nicknamed Tonatilla, the Sun, a compliment in basically any country, but a particularly outstanding one in Mesoamerica. He moveth forward the sun a little bit, was a common expression meaning he, be he becomes a small child. And now the sun is overturned, meant a ruler had died. At any rate, the Mexica, first and foremost, wanted to know Cortez's intentions. Cortez, with Malinche translating, stated he intended to go to Tenochtitlan, see Montezuma, and enjoy his presence. Now that's the sort of news that was going to make Montezuma very unhappy. But on the other hand, the delegation saw that while the Spaniards ate most of the food offered to them, the traditionally prepared tortillas, as Montezuma had requested, with just a little bit of human blood sprinkled on them, well, the Spaniards avoided those. So they also could report back to their lord that they were not dealing with tules. Now, as one final tap, one or more of the Mexica bled themselves, probably from the ears or wrists. They filled a cup shaped like an eagle with blood and offered it to Cortez. The Cordilla became angry, or at least he pretended to be angry, and he beat the Mexican who offered it with the flat of his sword. He then continued to bully and berate the Mexicas after that. And he had the Lombard fired off several of them fell to the floor and fainted. After they were all revived, Cortez, Cortez followed that up by challenging them to a duel. He uh, stated he intended to joust one of them in the morning. Now, presumably, he didn't really actually have any intention of entering in personal hand-to-hand -hand combat. He was just trying to scare the Mexica and maybe see how they would react. Um, but the delegation ended up leaving the ship promptly paddling in their canoes as if all the devils in history were after them, and when they reached Tudile in his town, Quetzalcoatl, they refused to stay, though the Mexica governor offered his hospitality, saying they must instead go back to Montezuma as fast as they could. Quote, we must give news to our lord. We must tell him what we have seen, which is terrifying. It has like nothing has been seen before, unquote. Montezuma decided to continue with his unusual strategy. He would try to keep the strangers from Tenochtitlan while, simultan while simultaneously he would continue to give them gifts of food and treasure, perhaps as a way to bribe them to stay away, which in retrospect is probably a terrible idea because each ounce of gold he sent literally only served to make the Spanish even more eager to reach his capital. Simultaneously, a delegation of 20 Totonacs reached Cortes and his camp. They came from the city of Kempoala, which was forced to pay tribute to Montezuma. And, of course, they hated the Mexicas. The door was open for an alliance. Right at this moment, though, Cortes was much busier trying to prevent mutiny. 
because his men were quarreling over all the gold they've gotten, as conquistadors are wont to do. The emperor was also uh, employing magicians and sorcerers against the Spanish, but they were reportedly ineffective. Presumably, the conquistadors were too paranoid to allow sketchy-looking Mexica priests to get close enough to be ensorcelled or poisoned or whatever it was that these magicians were planning, but at any rate, they returned to Montezuma and stated their magic was not, as, was not powerful enough to deal with the newcomers. Um, Governor Tudile uh, went to see Cortez again after that Totonac visit, and he told Cortez that it, now it would be best for the Spaniards to leave Mexico. He took the 2,000 servants, which had been attending the Spanish, and promptly left. And while he gave them more gifts before leaving, food was not amongst those items. Cortes, of course, did not leave. Instead, the Caudillo oversaw the construction of a settlement. Luckily for the Spaniards, the coast abundant in shellfish, now without which they probably would have been forced back to Cuba or starved, but at any rate, Cortes gets a lot of credit for doing this, for building this settlement on the Mexican coastline. This was his goal the whole time. But the reality of the situation, just so you know, is that he may have been forced into it by his men as much as he wanted to do it. Uh, many conquistadors who were with Cortes had come specifically. They had specifically signed up because they had not gotten the treasure that they had expected in Hispaniola or Cuba or Puerto Rico or Castillo de Oro, and now the Yucatan or Mexico or wherever had promised to reserve, reverse those bad fortunes. Hugh Thomas writes, quote, their point of view was impossible to ignore. Perhaps it was more important than historians have realized, unquote. It's a fascinating question. Did Cortez, was, this, was, this, was the town on the Yucatan coast just fully a Cortez plot? Maybe. But perhaps more likely, Almost every conquistador who went on that voyage knew they would be settling on the Yucatan before they ever left. And if Cortes had, for some reason, opposed this, remember, even Governor Velasquez wanted to settle on Yucatan, he just wanted to be in charge of it without going, they would have done so anyway, at any rate. And it, either way, they named the town Villa Rica de Veracruz, the rich town of Veracruz. Kind of funny. Oh, almost obvious. Well, with that said, there were factions within the Spanish force, like I said, and regardless of their shared desire to settle the Yucatan, they were arguing about treasure. In addition, some men were loyal to Cortez, others were more loyal to Velasquez. Cortez did his best to solve the infighting amongst the men by divvying up leadership roles at Veracruz between those who supported him and those who did not. Uh, pretty clever strategy, though, regardless of that, uh, with that said, uh, regardless of whatever political considerations the leaders at Veracruz had, almost all of them were extremeños. They came from the same region of Spain as Cortes. Um, this was not strictly legal, that is, setting up, to building a town without permission. Cortes had absolutely no authority to start up his own colony, especially not one independent of Velazquez. But that's exactly what he did, simply by engaging in the act of building a quote-unquote community, communidad. Cortes could call, thus by building a communidad, call upon medieval Spanish law, which said that any community of Spaniards could thus establish its own local government. Of course, technically, the supplies to build the town were still on the ships, when Cortes and the other conquistadors founded this community, but they weren't going to let a little technicality like that get in the way. And so for a while, the Spaniards of Veracruz were a town council without a town. Cortes set off for the Totanac city of Campoalan shortly thereafter. Um, the construction of Veracruz had be begun, and... Uh, and he was visited um, on the way um, by a large delegation uh, from that city. And they brought news 
that their lord was unable to welcome Cortez himself. He was simply far too fat for such a voyage. Really, Kempoalan was a city technically ruled by the Mexica, they said, but it was also served as the seat of political power of the recently subjected Totonac people. And when Cortez entered, musicians played trumpets as he and the Spaniards entered the city. And now the chief did in fact greet Cortez, and all the Spanish agreed that, yes, wow, he was indeed very fat. They stayed several days in the palace of a wealthy widow whom the Spaniards called Catalina. Uh, the reception and accommodations astonished the Castilians, to the extent that Cortez even feared a trap was being set up. The captain, in fact, set up careful defenses in the capital where they were staying, but no attack came. For several days, in fact, the Spanish simply took stock of the first Mexican city they were invited into, and Cortez made a formal visit to the lord of Kempoalan after uh, they'd been there for a little while. And uh, just so you know, the Spaniards will continue to refer to him as the fat chief or the fat cacique, which sounds very insulting, but it is what it is. And I'm actually not 100% sure that that was much of an insult in the 1500s, um, almost more of a boast. Anyway, the chief explained his anger at Montezuma and the tribute he required. He claimed the Mexica were taking everything. They had seized all the arms in the country. They had enslaved many people. And before the conquest, people of Kempoala had lived in, quote, peace, quietness, and liberty, unquote. Now, technically, the chief was probably overstating a bit how bad things were. The Mexica taxes were known to be very fair, so that no person was overburdened. I'm not just saying that as some wacko uh, lefty, but rather the giant population of Mesoamerica was utilized to bring together great quantities of goods without all that much work uh, on any particular region. Or at least that's what one 16th century Spanish judge thought about it when he examined the Mexica tribute system. Hugh Thomas reminds us, however, that, quote, subject peoples never judge well the nature of their subservience, unquote. The fat chief went on to Cortez. He described Tenochtitlan, telling him how it was built on water, and therefore practically impregnable. But the Mexica had many enemies, he told Cortez. The people of the cities of Huexotzinco and Tlaxcala also hated the Mexica, just as the Totonacs did. So too did a powerful noble named Ixachitzotl, who had many followers. He was a rival candidate for the throne of the Mexica-allied city of Texcoco. The fat chief proposed that Cortes seek an alliance with all of these peoples. Montezuma would easily be defeated with all of their help. The conversation, of course, went slowly, what with the chain of interpreters, but this was an invaluable conversation to Cortez. Almost everything that the fat chief told him was accurate. Ixatzcoatl was a powerful noble from Texcoco, and he and his followers hated Montezuma. So too did the people of Tlaxcala. Huetzalcinco, uh, although, unlike the Totonacs or the Tlaxcalans, wasn't yet really ready to oppose Mexica rule. Uh, in the recent years, they had made uh, peace, and they weren't they were more so enemies of Tlaxcalans at the moment than they were the Mexica, but regardless, this still meant Cortes had become greatly enlightened into the state of Mesoamerican politics. He realized he didn't need to be so fearful of an attack. The reason that the Totonacs were so friendly wasn't because they were trying to lure the Spanish into a trap. They just wanted friendship and an alliance to fight against Montezuma and the Mexica. Just like that, Cortez's vision expanded far beyond the idea of breaking from Velázquez and becoming adelantado of the Yucatan. Cortez had aspired to build a settlement for a long time, but the idea, quote, of coordinating an alliance to fight an empire seems not to have occurred to him before, unquote. That's what Hugh Thomas says. After that meeting, Cortes started spreading propaganda and started telling everyone that he had come to Mexico 
Mexico, Mexico, to soothe disputes and destroy tyrannies. I want to say quickly, folks, I'm really sorry if I'm making a lot of errors um, recording a bit late at night than I usually am. I am quickly trying to drink some coffee to, to wake up a little bit, but uh, it is tough to say Nahuatl names sometimes. The Spanish spent two weeks in Kempawalan. But disagreements did pop up between these two new allies with radically different religious principles. Like when Cortes freed sl five slaves destined for sacrifice, the people of Campoalan and the fat chief were horrified. The fat chief scolded Cortes, you will ruin me and all this kingdom if you rob me of those slaves. Our infuriated gods will send locusts to devour our harvests, hail to beat them down, drought to burn them, and torrential rain to swamp them if we offer no more sacrifices. Excuse me. I drank all that coffee, now I got the hiccups. Cortez had the slaves returned. He was unwilling to break his friendship with the Totonex, and the two friars on the voyage agreed. It was not yet time to suppress the ancient rites. In addition to this information about Mexican politics, the Totonex gave Cortez another gift. 400 Totonac porters. These important bearers for the journey, which the Spaniards were about to go on, might not sound like a lot of help, but after this point, Cortez and his men rarely, if ever, had to carry their own equipment. Their presents, their guns, their tents, or their bedding. Historians agree this is a critical benefit to the success henceforth of the expedition, it, it's really almost of incalculable value, of value. Essentially what this means is that the Spaniards could march all day, arrive at a location, but having not carried anything, not be worn out, ready to fight. Anyway, and so, Cortes continues on with this enlarged force, intent on seeing Tenochtitlan, meeting the Emperor Montezuma, and the conquistadors leave Kempoalan and then march to another Totonac town called Cuiahuitzlan. They arrive there about the same time as a delegation of Mexica tax collectors. That delegation wore embroidered clothes. Their hair was drawn back. It shined in the sun. Each of them carried flowers. They were smelling them as they entered the square of the town. They carried crooked sticks and were smelling flowers specifically that were restricted to the Mexica nobility. Servants walked before these officials. They whisked away flies and mosquitoes. They walked right past the Spaniards without paying attention to them. The lord of Cuiahuitzlan trembled as they neared. After the meeting, and despite the lord's fear at the reception of the Mexica tax collectors, Cortes convinced the ruler of Cuiahuitzlan that he should arrest the tax collectors. The Spaniards would guard them, of course. This was ordered and accomplished. The tax collectors were tied to poles and imprisoned. Then that same night, Cortes carried out a very Machiavellian-style trick and released two members of the delegation. He told them that he didn't like to see Montezuma's agents mistreated and that he would be grateful if they went back to Tenochtitlan and told Montezuma of Cortez's intent of being friends. Two Spaniards rowed the two Mexica nobles in a boat to a spot outside of Totonac territory so they could return to Tenochtitlan safely and as fast as possible. Cortez may have believed that he could be allied with both the Totonacs and Montezuma, or at least he wanted to feign friendship with the Aztec emperor. Either way, the lord of Cuiahuitzlan was quite angry, as you might imagine, when he realized two of his prisoners had escaped, and Cortez did his best to calm them down. Um, it helped a bit when he offered to have the remaining prisoners lodged in one of his ships, uh, keeping them offshore to prevent another quote-unquote escape. But while Cortez's deception was successful, he still had to make a choice. The lord of Cuiahuitzlan offered Cortez a Totonac army, to rebel against Montezuma, 
if Cortez would lead his army as captain. Cortez agreed. He told the lord he valued the Totonac's friendship more than that of Montezuma. The die was cast. Co Cortez then asked, how many men could this lord assemble? I wonder what look Cortez gave, if the astonishment was visible from his face, when the reply to his question was translated. The Totonacs could assemble a force of 100,000 men. Well, suddenly, Cortez realized that he could literally gather as many enemies of the Mexica as possible and simply march to Tenochtitlan. But he had to finish Veracruz first. So it wasn't until June 28th, 1519, when the town was formally founded, and incidentally, on the same day that Don Carlos of Spain was elected via an unprecedented amount of bribery, the Holy Roman Emperor, and became Charles V. Of course, the Spaniards um, probably did very little of the town building. It was almost certainly entirely the work of the Cuban servants who were there, who would have dug at least all of the foundations. They probably would have cut all the trees, and they definitely almost certainly would have made and laid all of the bricks as well in order to build the town. And none of the sources say so, but Taino labor built the Via Rica de Veracruz. While Cortez was overseeing this, another Mexica delegation arrived, this one grander than the one before, and with another gift. They brought back the helmet which Cortez gave to two dial. Now it was full of gold dust to help Cortez cure his men of their heart sickness. The messengers brought other gifts as well, told the Spaniards that the emperor was busy with wars and negotiations. And he could not say when a meeting would be possible, so Cortez should absolutely travel slowly if indeed he came to Tenochtitlan at all. But of course, the gold dust did nothing but spur the Spaniards on faster. Cortez returned the rest of the imprisoned tax collectors to this delegation. He told the Lord of Quiahuitzlan that he should go about telling everyone, though, that the Totonax were free from the Mexica. Cortez probably thought he could keep this facade going when things would be smoothed over both sides, but not long after the Totonac town started rebelling, and then a nearby Mexica garrison uh, stationed at a nearby hillside town called Tizapanzingo attacked the Totonacs. The Mexica tax collectors and other officials in the Totonac lads had fled there when the tributary Totonac towns rebelled, and then they promptly began organizing an army to suppress that rebellion. The Spaniards were called upon to help. Cortes responded instantly. He took most of the conquistadors with him, as well as his sixteen horses and a force of Totonacs. They met the Mexica, who appeared in full battle array, feathers, paint, shields, conch horns. But the Mexica panicked at the sight of the Castilians and fled. The horses could not follow up the rocky hill on the way back to the town, and so Cortes and his men dismounted. The army eventually forced open the gates of Tizapensingo with their swords. The few remaining Mexica soldiers inside were disarmed and handed over to the fat chief at Kelpoalan. He promised he definitely would not sacrifice them. Of course, whether or not, or not that happened, I don't know. But I do know that Cortez assaulted the idols of the temple at Kelpoalan when the Spaniards returned after the battle. The Kelpoalans, according to Bernal Diaz, set up a miserable howl. They covered their faces and begged forgiveness of the idols that they were unable to protect them. This action probably wasn't a smart one. Threatening this alliance as it did, and the, a battle nearly ensued, uh, which was stopped by the fat chief. But Cortes still convinced five of the priests at this at Campoalan to cut their hair and promise to look after the Christian shrine. Cortes had uh, replaced the shrine of the temple after it was had placed a Christian shrine in the temple after whitewashing it, and a mass was performed. And, now, what exactly a haircut has to do with helping instill Christian values is beyond my comprehension, but the haircut was also necessary. Now, what I find incredible, though, to be clear, is that Cortez told five Totonac priests, who were not baptized, definitely were not baptized, 
and who presumably he believed they literally worshipped, that they were literally worshipping the devil. He told them that they were to be responsible for taking care of his Christian altar. It's a perplexing decision, in my opinion, to chide the Chempo Islands for their blasphemous religion, then put the priests of that blasphemous religion in charge of a newly painted over Christian shrine. At any rate, this rather undiplomatic event was smoothed over a great deal when afterwards the Spanish taught the Totonacs how to make candles. An incredibly important invention, since they're so much less dangerous than torches, of course, not to mention more efficient. It seems that the combination of new knowledge and the freedom from the Mexica convinced the Totonacs, ultimately, however, that all the Spanish were brutes. They were still brutes who were worth being allied with. Well, at any rate, the Spaniards soon left Kempoalan to go back to Veracruz, and the Totonacs immediately restored the shrine back to its previous condition. But, um, well, Cortes went back to Veracruz specifically to meet with a ship of reinforcements. He welcomed 60 men and several horses under the command of Francisco de Salcido to Veracruz and into his expedition. Salcido had sailed to Cuba and was planning on doing some slave raiding somewhere else when he heard about Cortes' expedition and said, Hey, sounds even more fun than slave raiding. Salcido also gave Cortes some important advice that Cortes better send some messengers back to Spain to counter the claims of Velazquez. In fact, if he had not done so at Salcido's suggestion, Cortes probably would have ended up conquering Mexico and immediately doing so for Velazquez, essentially, the moment the contest conquest ended. So Cortes ended up sending three letters back to Spain. Maybe two, it's not clear. He wrote three, one of which was supposedly a personal letter to the king, but may have never been sent, or if it was, has been lost to time. But in any way, one of the surviving letters described what had happened thus far in the expedition. Though Cortes also spent quite a bit of ink thoroughly explaining why Velasquez should under no circumstances be made adelantado of the Yucatan. Another letter documented the previous journeys of Cordoba and Grijalva in addition to Cortes's voyage. That one was signed by all of the quote-unquote citizens of Villa Rica de la Veracruz, which, compared to the land, they compared it also, the uh, Yucatan that is, to the land that which Solomon took his gold from to build the temple in Jerusalem. They also added that Mexico was full of devil worship and human sacrifice, and that those facts, of course, were going to justify anything that happened, or which was going to happen. In case that didn't convince his majesty, the letter continued by stating, without evidence, that all the Mexica were also sodomites as well, but not the Totonac allies, whose, quote, devotion, trust, and hope, unquote, meant that they would be Christians of, quote, faith, fervor, and diligence, unquote. A convenient justification. Now, that the evil which the Aztecs practiced justified whatever killings, rape, and tortures the Spaniards committed, all of course that's all coincidence. Now, that doesn't really mean they didn't believe that wasn't true. Um, but uh, anyway, that's what, what, that is what it is. Anyway, uh, and just so you know, even though all of the men signed that letter, of course, Cortez was the sole author of, of it. Um, anyway, whatever Cortez wrote in the missing letter, of course, we don't know. But judging from some of the things he says later, it's probably likely he promised to conquer, pacify the entirety of the Aztec Empire, to kill uh, Montezuma or to deliver him as a subject to Spain. Uh, Cortez also wrote a fourth letter. This one was directed to his father was sent along with some gold to his parents and some instructions to empower his father to act on his behalf to procure supplies. Along with the letters, a huge sum of treasure was to be delivered to the king. The treasures of Villarica de la Veracruz believed that the gold and silver, measured by weight alone, was worth about 22,500 pesos, a sum uh, that did not include the featherwork and cotton goods that were also sent, and which they did not place value to. 
The treasure, all of it, not just the king's share, was then set in the middle of the square. And exactly as you'd expected, the Spaniards promptly began to fight about it. The conquistadors don't leave a clear record as to what happened next. But presumably, Cortes took a cut. We're not sure if he did that before or after the treasure was placed in the center of the town, or maybe both. But not everything which Cortes received was handed over to the king, that we know for sure. Bernal Diaz specifically reports that the helmet, though, that the helmet full of gold dust, the giant wheels of gold and silver, originally constructed for Grijalva, many of the golden figurines of animals, and most of the featherwork were packed off to the king. So too were two painted books, quote, folded in the style of cloth of Castile, unquote. The receipt put on the king's fifth was for 2,000 pesos by the treasurers. That implies that the total was only 10,000 pesos, but the treasury was valued at 22,500 pesos, so if those numbers are true, then the king only received a tenth, not a fifth. Cortes sent also 7,000 pesos worth of gold, um, 4,000 to his father, and 3,500 for the two men tasked with delivering that to his father. I'm dubious that Cortes would have used his own share for that. Anyway, he probably used the, uh, shall we say, the company loot for that. Uh, at any rate, however you cut it, though, 12,500 Castellanos worth of gold is basically unaccounted for in the treasure. Fighting began amongst the conquistadors about precisely that issue. I don't know what happened. I mean, Cortes could have easily took the entire uh, sum maybe sent 7,000 of it to his parents and paid for the agents to get it there and pocketed the rest, or maybe somebody else did, or maybe just enough conquistadors, each of them pilfered just a little bit, that all over time it added up to a great big sum. I don't know. Some of the party wanted to go home after this and didn't want to go to the interior besides this. Uh, a particular some of Velasquez's friends were happy with their treasure and just wanted to go back to Cuba with the wealth they'd thus far obtained. Cortes refused permission of anyone to depart, and if you think these disgruntled Spanish conquistadors responded by graciously accepting Cortes's orders, you are sadly mistaken. In consequence of Cortes' refusal to allow everyone to leave, instead a plot developed to seize one of the ships kill the ship's captain, and go back to Cuba, God willing, where they might intercept the men carrying Cortez's letters, and more importantly, the treasure he sent ahead for his father before that ship reached Spain safely. Unfortunately for the conspirators, they were betrayed by Bernardino de Soria, one of the men who informed Cortez of the plot. Cortez had the leaders arrested, including a priest, a pilot, and some sailors. An ex-page of Governor Velasquez was amongst them as well. Two were hanged, another had part of his foot cut off, and a few received 100 lashes, but others were just imprisoned for several days and then released. Cortes was angry. He felt like he had to deal with the ringleaders, but the entire reason he was trying to keep all the men on the mainland was to keep them on the mainland as a fighting force, not languishing in prison or hanging from a tree. Cortes also took drastic measures to prevent future plots to shield a ship and escape. He ordered his captains to sail their vessels onto the sands and to remove the rigging, sails, anchors, guns, and other tackle for storage at Veracruz, and announced that the ships were unseaworthy. He probably bribed the captains of the vessels to do this. Maybe that's where the missing treasure went. Who knows? Cortes did not burn the ships, though, no matter what you have heard. They were grounded. All the sources agree they were grounded. It is entirely the fault of a Spanish historian named Cervantes de Salazar, who probably could not make out some banned handwriting, the word quebrando, or breaking, as in ships breaking, and thought that the document que meant read quemando, or burning. Anyway, grounding the ships is a less dramatic, but just as effective at as keeping everyone in Mexico, uh, and even though they weren't burnt, William Prescott says this of the destruction of the fleet, quote, It was 
perhaps the most remarkable passage in the life of this remarkable man. History, indeed, affords examples of similar expedient emergencies, somewhat similar, but none where the changes, where the chances of success were so precarious, and defeat would be so disastrous. Had he failed, it might well seem an act of madness, yet it was the fruit of deliberate calculation. He had set fortune, fame, life itself, all upon the act, and must abide the issue. There was no alternative in his mind but to succeed or perish, an act of resolution that has few parallels in history." Unquote. Finished with cutting off his own retreat, Cortes finally set out with his holy company for Tenochtitlan on August 8, 1519. About 300 men went with him. The rest were to remain at Veracruz. He had 40 crossbowmen, 20 arquebusiers, and 15 horse. He divided his men into companies of 50 men each. He also brought 150 Cuban tinos with him to carry the food, equipment, and haul the artillery. And then they were accompanied by a Totonac chief named Mamaxi. He led 800 Totonac warriors alongside the Spaniards. Cortes earlier, having assured the Totanics that there was absolutely no way he could feed 100,000 warriors, so that would not be necessary. But before setting out, um, Bernal Diaz said that Cortes addressed the army, quote, to conquer the land or to die, unquote, was his message. Three roads led from the coast of Veracruz to Tenochtitlan, Cortes and his army chose without a difficult, without a doubt, the most difficult. Now I don't know why, but probably the Mexica told, probably either the Mexica told Cortes it was the best route in order to delay him, or Cortes purposely chose that route, knowing it was the most difficult, knowing therefore it would be the least likely wherein he might encounter an enemy army. At any rate, all the towns along the road were ruled by the Mexica but they still provided the Spaniards with some food and lodgings. This courtesy was extended despite the fact that Montezuma was growing increasingly anxious at the news that Cortes was on the move and on his way to Tenochtitlan. Now, the first large city which the Spaniards reached since leaving Kempoalan was Zautla. The ruler of this city, Olintecle, gave food and lodgings to the Castilians and then got the honor of hearing Cortes' now pretty well-practiced sermon on how the people of his city and Olintecle himself should give up the practice of human sacrifice and eating human flesh. Cortes also, of course, mentioned that Olintecle should give him some gold, and in fact he might as well declare the allegiance to the king of Spain right there on the spot. Because Montezuma would shortly be a vassal as well, what was the harm in waiting to declare vassalage? Olentikle declined, probably because a large Mexica garrison was stationed inside his city. He stated that if Montezuma told him to give gold, he would do so, but until then, the gold he had was his own. Well, Cortes decided against further challenging Ah, Olentikle, on the advice of Friar Olmedo, who instead simply told the ruler that he would uh, indeed soon order Montezuna to give him his gold. Meanwhile, the Totonacs went around the town telling everyone how totally badass and deadly the horses and dogs were, and that the Spanish indeed were two lays, which seems in it to indicate that the Totonacs, more than anyone, are probably responsible for the rumors of Spanish divinity. At any rate, Cortes asked Olentecle what way would be best to go to Tenochtitlan. He had two choices, Tlaxcala or Cholula. Olentecle reckoned Cholula, of course, since it was another friendly Aztec city, and also it was on the road to Tenochtitlan. Maxi, though, the Totonac general, continued to urge for Tlaxcala instead, which was a somewhat of a side diversion, but he was insistent that they would find friends there, and eventually Cortes chose Tlaxcala. But first, the Spaniards rested for three weeks in Zautla. They witnessed a festival in which Olentecle sacrificed 50 men, apparently. Cortes does not mention the festival in his letters, 
Neither did he dwell much upon the great treatment he received, but apparently he and his men were carried in hammocks on the shoulders of Olentecle's servants for those three weeks. It's likely that Cortez just wasn't really interested in telling his king about the human sacrifice party he went to, or the fact that he was treated maybe even a little more royally than his highness was in some ways, who didn't have people bearing him on his shoulders. At any rate, during those three weeks, Olentecle continued to tell Cortez to go to Cholula, that he would receive many gifts there, and a royal welcome. If we are to give credit to for the success of the expedition, then let us not forget Mamexi, therefore, general of 800 Totonax, who continued to advise against the Aztecs, and might have prevented Cortez and his men from, shall we say, being seduced into a life of luxury amongst the Mexica. Mamexi not only argued that it would be best to go by way of Tlaxcala, but that specifically it would be fatal to continue to seek advice from Olentecle or to enter Cholula. Well, so off to Tlaxcala they went. And on the way, they encountered <laughs> Itakimaxtitlan, an important local Mexica town with a large garrison composed of several thousand families. At Montezuma's insistence, Cortez and his band stayed at the expense of the local chief, which incidentally for the people of this small town, as well as Zatla for that matter, and anywhere, the hospitality shown to the Castilians and their Indian allies must have literally been ruinous for some local lords uh, and the townspeople uh, in Mesoamerica. Undoubtedly, the maize used to feed these armies, uh, which, in addition to the several hundred Spaniards, let's not also forget hundreds of Taino slaves, and at the moment, 800 Totonac warriors as well, was supposed to be used in times of drought or famine or what have you. I'm sure a lot of people faced hunger hardships in Mesoamerica as a result of Cortez and his merry band of men traveling through, not the least of which would be the later victims of smallpox, too sick to get their own food. Cortez sent messengers ahead to Tlaxcala. When they didn't return in a timely fashion, he set off to find them. He brought... 1,000 Mexica soldiers from Itzakimax Titlan on the way to Tlaxcala. It's a tough one to say. 20 miles south of the city was a stone wall, 9 feet high and 20 piece, paces wide. It was built as a border between uh, Mexico and Tlaxcala, and walls were rare in Mexico. And the barrier existed solely as a function of the hatred between these two peoples. Cortez, in fact, thought it was a pointless fortification, but it was probably more of a symbol than anything else. The wall wasn't manned, and there was a gate, so the Castilians opened it and poured right through across the border. Not far from it, two horsemen riding in advance of the army encountered a small squadron of fifteen Tlaxcalan scouts, who began to flee when they saw the horses. Cortez and some of his men caught up with them, and Cortez tried to reason with them, to say with signs he was interested in negotiation, but the Tlaxcalans would not stop running until the horses literally overtook them. Of course, horses are very fast. They did catch up, but that didn't work out so well either. The Tlaxcalans responded to the Spanish advance by using their obsidian-bladed swords with precision. One of the Tlaxcalans struck a horse and with a single stroke sliced the poor animal's head clean off. Another horse was killed in the brief engagement, three more were wounded, and as this skirmish occurred, a much larger force of Tlaxcalans approached. Andres de Tapia claimed 100,000 opponents were arrayed against the Spaniards. But Hugh Thomas says of Andres de Tapia, quote, as with most of his companions, accurate figures were not a strong suit, unquote. No matter how many Tlaxcalans there were, there were an awful lot of them with painted faces. They were wildly leaping into the air and making war whoops most menacingly. Some men were so frightened, they asked the friars for confession. But the Tlaxcalans were also frightened, especially when the Spanish horsemen made a charge. They were able to kill somewhere between 16 and 60 Tlaxcalan men, and the army fell back cautiously as a result instead of pouncing. Cortez had his dead horses quickly buried in an attempt to prevent his enemies from discovering anything about their anatomy. 
But even with this done, he understood that the Tlaxcalan fear of the horses was soon going to be lessened considerably once news spread that one had been beheaded. The reason that a handful of horsemen were able to simply ride up and save Cortez or whoever else was there and make the Indians retreat was a consequence of the Mesoamerican tactics where the tradition of head-on combat meant that only the front rank of an army really did any fighting, and if that rank fell, another rank would replace it, followed by a third, which basically meant that a Spanish opponent on a horse with a superior weapons could stamina permitting, effectively face off against many Tlaxcala or Mexica opponents because they were basically trained to stand there and wait their turn to fight and the horses move around very fast. Now, these tactics change quickly as Mesoamericans learn to fight against the Spanish, but whenever Mesoamerican armies fight against Spanish horses for the first time, the result was usually a quick retreat as the native armies were quickly forced to reckon with the fact that they needed a very different strategy against this very mobile enemy. Of course, in addition, the Tlaxcalans, just like the Maya and the Mexica, were actually less interested in killing the Spaniards or their horses than they were in capturing them for sacrifice. Quote, to find yet one more star to be sacrificed to the sun, to nourish that fire with blood, this was a fatal limitation, unquote. That's Hugh Thomas. Finally, their swords, while initially very damaging, were able, for example, to cut the fucking head off a horse, horse with one stroke, but they also broke quickly when, when, the, when the stone blades uh, parried and sparred with steel swords or steel armor. And altogether, this adds up to serious disadvantages. Um... So on the one hand, while the Spaniards were not exactly well a well-trained Prussian soldiers or anything like that, they fought with enough military discipline that the better weaponry and the speed of their horses led to another quick victory. But it was costly. The military prowess of the Tlaxcalans was, quote, skilled beyond any that the Spaniards had yet encountered, unquote, according to Ross Hasek now. And Cortez was overseeing the burial of two horses to prove it. FYI, two dead horses was a big fucking deal for Cortez. For some time, the captain was probably a bit worried, too. The Tlaxcans were supposed to be great allies against the Mexica, according to the Totanics, but it only seemed like they weren't interested in peace at all. Of course, it didn't probably help that Cortez was with a thousand Mexica soldiers. It was also quite clear that despite the fact that they were treated, though, the Tlaxcans were capable of putting up a very large force. Even if the 100,000-man army is an exaggeration, the Castilians dressed their wounds after the battle, apparently with the fat of a dead Indian, which personally sounds almost as gross as eating a person, but reportedly that is what took place. Okay, so do not eat people, but cook them into oil and use it to heal your cuts. Got it. Two of the four emissaries which Cortez sent to Tlaxcala returned and explained that the Tlaxcalans wanted to tell the Spaniards they were sorry. And in fact, what happened was an army of Otomis, which the Otomis are an ethnic group that live in various parts of uh, Mesoamerica, and, and one of those parts is the eastern section of Tlaxcala. Well, the Otomis were completely responsible for the violence, and the Tlaxcalans had nothing to do with it. The reality was that the Otomis, who lived under Tlaxcalan rule, were sent by the Tlaxcalan lords to fight against the Spanish for precisely that reason. That if they failed, then the Tlaxcalans could claim they had nothing to do with what they were now doing. And that might also help explain the army retreating so quickly after they'd been sent out under such dubious circumstances. At any rate, Tlaxcala was about 20 miles from where Cortes camped. It was a small republic, smaller a bit than the modern state of uh, Tlaxcala in Mexico, which is a pretty small state in case you don't know, but it was densely populated. Probably 150,000 people lived in the city of Tlaxcala, according to Hugh Thomas, and many of them were Nahuatl-speaking people, just like their Mexica enemies. And just like the Mexica, the Tlaxcalans, in fact, were shown where to build their city by a bird, 
uh, not an eagle, in their case a white heron. But the Republic itself was composed of four regions. Each was ruled by a king, and all four of those kings voted uh, on decisions. And so by Republic, I'm literally talking about four dudes making decisions, uh, just FYI, instead of one. But regardless, that's still technically three more dudes than a monarchy. Um, so the Spaniards, at any rate, they felt that Tlaxcala's government was very similar to Venice or Genoa's. Um, Peter Martyr even compared Tlaxcala, quote, to the Roman Republic before it degenerated into a despotic monarchy, unquote. The emissaries who returned from Tlaxcala had more than just a message of peace for Cortes. They also wanted to pay for the dead horses, and that just sounds very nice, doesn't it? It would be nice. Of course, it was also a purposeful tactic so that the Tlaxcala could discover how much the Castilians valued their horses. But the Castilians were also learning. Uh, a debate, in fact, took place after the battle where the rank and file participated. They decided how they should proceed if they were ever again surrounded by such a large force, and it was decided that the horsemen would ride forward and attempt to scatter their enemies, that they should hold their lances vertically rather than horizontally, so that that would help prevent the riders from being seized, and at any rate, um, peace was not yet declared. Cortes soon encountered the Otomi army again. He read them the Requerimiento, helped by La Malinche and Aguilar, and in the presence of his notary Diego de Godoy, so obviously it was very official. I don't know, though, even with that translation, whether the Tosh Collins properly understood, of course, who the Pope was what his relationship with the king of Spain was, or the, what the offer of vassaldom meant. But the Otomi responded by attacking with arrows and spears flung by Adelals. The Castilians advanced, crying out, Santiago y Sierra España, just as their Spaniards had called out against the Moors in centuries past. The battle lasted several hours. The Spaniards and their allies forced the Otomi back and advanced, but that retreat was planned. The Spanish found themselves trapped in a ravine as a consequence with a large number of Otomis on both sides of it. The Tlaxcalan general named Zucotencatl had previously hidden his soldiers there before the combat began, and Cortes estimated that 100,000 Otomis were arranged against them, a figure which Hugh Thomas calls a magic figure. The more modest, Bernal Diaz states, 40,000 Indians were against them. Now that's a large enough number, obviously, that is still quite astounding, and even if that is an exaggeration, clearly a very large number of Otomis had the Spanish and their allies trapped. I want to be clear, though. The Tlaxcalans could have annihilated, or at least come seriously close to annihilating Cortes right then and there. Mesoamerican generals loved generals, but the point of America, Mesoamerican ambush was not to dishonorably strike and kill your enemies while, while hidden, generally speaking. When Mesoamerican armies ambushed others, it was in order to dramatically confront their enemies. So the Otomi didn't ambush the Spanish to throw rocks down at them and crush them like you're imagining. They did it to scare them. You can't sacrifice someone to the gods you've just crushed with, if you've just crushed them with a rock. I mean, that's just science. That's sacrifice science. In fact, much of the goal of the battle for the Atomies seems to have been to capture a horse, and eventually they did after some difficulty. First, they seriously wounded the rider, Pedro de Moron, who himself died several days later, and the, the horse was sacrificed by the Tlash Collins after the battle, in a ceremony that also involved the sacrifice of the red taffeta hat which Cortez had gifted the Tosh Collins, and which he did not realize at the time, but looked kind of similar to the Tosh Collins, to the red leather band and tuft of feathers, which Mexica rulers gifted to cities whom they had decided to go to war with. Cortez also being with a force of Mexica. Um, they didn't fight in the battle, but Cortez entered Tosh and gifted them a declaration of war. Whoops. At any rate, the Spaniards fought along the ravine, and reportedly much assistance 
was given by their Totonac allies under the battle. Between Totonac courage and the fear caused by the six cannons, and the Spanish were able to fight their way through. Several Otomi leaders died during the battle as well, and the, so the next day the Otomi did not sally forth to meet the Spanish again. Cortes sent another message asking for peace, though along with that message of peace, he also rode out with 200 Spaniards and the Totonacs, and they began pillaging and burning the countryside, taking prisoners as they did. The Castilians apparently perpetrated atrocities during this time. There were reports of people whose noses, ears, arms, and feet and testicles were cut off. Uh, priests were tossed from the tops of buildings. The Totonacs also similarly committed various outrages. The expedition was low on food. They were eating mainly little dogs at the moment, so maybe they were just very hangry, is it? Uh, I don't know. That's a terrible excuse for torturing people. At any rate, uh, Cortez expected to find help in Tlaxcala, but so far he'd only found battle. Um, so he let his men take their aggression out on the civilian population, perhaps. Um, whatever the reason for it, it's what happened. And the next day, the Tlaxcalans sent the Spaniards a large gift of food. 300 turkeys and 100 baskets of maize cakes. This one isn't exactly charity, however. The Tlaxcalans planned, instead, that, quote, once they are filled up with food, let us attack and we shall eat them. And in that way, they will pay us for the turkeys and cakes, unquote. The Tlaxcalans assembled another army, this one large enough to eclipse the sun, according to Father Aguilar, not just composed of Otomis. Better equipped and organized Tlaxcalan squadrons as well were lined up in their feathers, armor, and war paint. Each squadron accompanied by drummers and conch blowers that announced the start of conflict and a fierce battle followed. Quote, In this dangerous and perilous battle, we were in considerable confusion, said Bernal Diaz. Only the simple use of steel swords saved us, unquote. This was probably the largest and most difficult battle fought thus far in the Americas between Europeans and, and Indians, says Hugh Thomas. But the conquistadors on Cortez' voyage, and Cortez himself, devote very little time to it in their writings. Historians believe that perhaps the conquistadors did not enjoy reflecting on this particularly difficult battle. Now, later, they will fight large battles too, but they will also always do so with far more allies at their side. Still today, they did prevail, ultimately, and when the Tlaxcalans eventually retired, only a couple of conquistadors were, had been killed outright. Still, all of the horses were wounded, and so too were 60 men. After the battle, the Spaniards again tended their wounds with the fats of dead Indians. The next day, Cortes went on another punitive expedition. He burnt ten towns, one of which had a population of 3,000. Upon his return, he was just in time for another attack by the Tlaxcalans, who fought with the Spaniards again, once again with inconclusive results. Now, after this, uh, the one, uh, a, a delegation from the 1,000 Mexicans who had followed the Spanish into uh, Tlaxcala, but who were not fighting, were just kind of behind and probably amused almost watching this, they offered gifts once again to Cortes. They informed him that under no circumstances should he ally with the Tlaxcalans, that Montezuma was very pleased to hear of his great victories against such horrible people, and he was very happy that Cortes was close to his capital. But Tlaxcala leadership was reconsidering peace as well. The Otomi had a fierce reputation as fighters, but the Spanish treated them as if they were nothing. And after the next several days had produced no clear victory against the Spaniards, a resolution of peace won the debate in the halls of Tlaxcalan government. From the perspective of the Tlaxcala, this was an opportunity to create a superior fighting force that they could use to face the Mexica. The Tlaxcala delegation 
brought no gold or silver gifts. Food, incense, and slaves were all they got, along with a message of alliance against Montezuma and the Mexica. Cortez responded he was very angry about the dead horses, and so that's why he treated them so severely, but he was happy to pardon them. He then, shortly after, rode to the capital Tlaxcala, dismounted from his horse, and made a deep bow and embraced Zucotencatl, the leader of that city. Feasting and celebrations followed. The date was September 18th, 1519. Even the dogs and horses received turkey and maize, and Cortez spent 20 days in Tlaxcala. And with the important consequence of a lasting alliance being formed between uh, him and the two main leaders of Tlaxcala, Maxixcatin and Zicotencatl, the father and son who ruled the city, uh, the capital, the, those rulers apologized that the blockade placed upon them meant that they had few gifts give the Spanish, and that is why they only had daughters to gift them. Cortez's captains were very eager to accept them, and the Tlaxcalans believed, uh, for their part, that this would help them breed a warrior race to help them rule the future, I guess, um, at any rate. Later, Cortez seems to have felt bad about spending time with these heathen women himself. He after several days, decided they needed to be baptized. And uh, the last couple of weeks he'd spent in Tlaxcala, he talked a lot about Christianity. Well, needless to say, the Tlaxcala leaders apologized, but say that their people would lynch them if they just gave up their religion and tossed out the idols uh, to be replaced by these very nice pictures of the Virgin Mary, but they were going to have to decline. At any rate, Cortes seems to have been the only one, maybe, who was suddenly worried, because most of the conquistadors found female companionship at Tlaxcala, and mestizos were soon to follow, warrior, race, or not. At any rate, Cortes was also sleeping with La Malinche during this time, so maybe his sudden morality was just him taking his own feelings of remorse for cheating on his wife out on everybody else. Uh, That's what I would presume. Cortez also continued to speak with Montezuma's ambassadors as well, though. He wanted to reach Tenochtitlan without fighting, and perhaps due to this desire, he did not take the path which the Tlaxcalans laid out for him, which would have taken him to Hexatzinko, and from there to Tenochtitlan. Instead, he listened to the Mexica delegation, who said he should go to Cholula. Now, earlier, the Totonacs warned Cortes against going to Cholula, of course, but now the Cordillo had new bearers and warriors from Tlaxcala. That made his force much larger, in addition, much less afraid. Specifically, the native allies allowed Cortes to quickly consolidate gains made by his horsemen. These terrifying arbored knights were very effective at scattering indigenous forces, but alone the Spanish were too few to consolidate their gains. The Totonac army of 800 helped a lot. But now, Cortes had something between five and 6,000 flash columns at his back as well. And that's a force enough that could occupy significant territory after the Spanish cavalry scattered enemy forces. So combined, the Spaniards and the Tlaxcalans represented a very powerful fighting force, more powerful than anything that existed in Mesoamerica. So now armed with this mighty army, Cortes marched to Cholula. But he also sent two men ahead to go look for the city of themselves, Pedro de Alvarado and Bernardina Velasquez de Tapia went ahead on foot. Cortes would not spare any horses. At least they went with the Mexica and Tlaxcala guides. Cortes wanted to visit Cholula, uh, possibly also to secure the loyalty of that city, just in case he needed to retreat from Tenochtitlan. Uh, This would help ensure he did not have a powerful Mexica-allied city between him and the coast if things went well here. The Tlaxcalans, of course, didn't care about that one way or another. They just wanted to march straight to Tenochtitlan. They were actually suspicious 
of Alvarado and Tapia going to Cholula with Mexica guys with some sort of secret message, according to Tapia. Um, so the Tlaxcalans went along, and according to Tapia, they even attempted to kill him in Alvarado and the Mexica at several points during their walk to Cholula. The Mexica guides, for their part, apparently felt that Tapia and Alvarado were walking much too slowly for their liking, and at several points, Alvarado and Tapia were grabbed and pulled by the Mexica guides to hurry them along at several points of the journey. Don't ask me why. I wonder if it's possible that the two Spaniards were not used to marching at high altitude, perhaps, and the Mexica got tired of their being winded, but I, I don't know. Ultimately, the scouting party got close to Tenochtitlan. They looked at it from some distance. They uh, met with the delegation from the capital, and they were told promptly in no uncertain terms. Um, excuse me, I told him he, I said that they, he got sent to, Chal to uh, Cholula. That's not true. They, Cortez sent them to look at Tenochtitlan while he went ahead to Cholula. Excuse me. And anyway, they were promptly told in no uncertain terms by um, outside of the city that Montezuma was ill, would not see them, and so Cortez should absolutely return to the coast immediately. Now, Alvarado and Tapia returned afterwards. Um, it took a little time for this news to get back, um, but they didn't really have any news from the happenings of the city. They'd only seen the city from a distance. All they could really report was that the size of Tenochtitlan was not exaggerated. At any rate, Cortez had gone ahead to Cholula. The Tlaxcalans were unable to convince him to march straight to Tenochtitlan. Um, instead, now advised him to be wary of the streets, because they were going to block the streets of Cholula once inside so the Spaniards could be captured more easily. They also were saying that the Cholulans were starting to store stones on the roofs of their houses to attack them from above, and they gave the Cortez some advice, that if he were to meet the Mexica in battle, he'd better leave nobody alive, neither the young, quote, lest they bear arms again, nor the old, lest they give good advice, unquote. This had the Spanish a little on edge, especially because Cholula had until fairly recently been allied with Tlaxcala, not Tenochtitlan. The Tlaxcalans were not completely unaware of the de defensive capabilities of the city once within their alliance. And um, then after some time, a one woman, uh, one Tlaxcala woman who was the mistress of Alvarado told Alvarado uh, that her brother uh, was one of the Tlaxcalan military men was going to help the Cholulans attack the Spaniards. And when she told Alvarado, Alvarado, of course, told Cortez, and Cortez had this commander hanged of the supposed plot. Now, the distance between Tlaxcala and Cholula is only 25 miles, and after hanging the rebellious noble, Cortez sent word to Cholula that he was ordering the lords of Cholula to present themselves before him, or else he would consider the city an open rebellion. It's a fairly remarkable threat, considering that since the lords of Cholula had not even yet had the dignity of having a requerimiento read to them in a foreign language, how could they possibly be in rebellion? At any rate, Cortes made his threat, and afterwards some senior lords from Cholula did present themselves. They readily agreed to take an oath of vassaldom to the kingdom of Spain. That night, Cortes camped in an open field on his way to Cholula. He was visited by an expedition from that city who brought food and said they were very worried that Cortes had been listening to foul rumors about what was going on inside. When they did finally all go into Cholula, food and lodgings were made available to the Spaniards, and at least some of the Flash Collins and Totonics, to Totonacs as well, if not all of them. Cortes wrote that 5,000 Indian allies were allowed into the city, a most injudicious concession, says Hugh Thomas. He also said that the food was wanting, though other conquistadors who wrote about this disagree. They said the food was adequate at first, but regardless. After a while, the Chilolans began to bring less food to the very large army. That food was available at all was only the result of Cholula being a pretty massive city. It was a thousand years old. It consisted of perhaps 180 to 200,000 inhabitants living in 50 to 60,000 houses. 
and the skyline was dotted by 430 pyramids, or as Cortez described it, quote-unquote, very towered. Cholula was also the place where the largest and most powerful temple to Quetzalcoatl was, the god in which many believed might be returning, including perhaps even Montezuma himself. Now, Alvarado and Velasquez de Tapia had one more piece of advice uh, when they returned, besides um, that they were unable to enter Tenochtitlan, it was really big. They also told Cortez that it would be pretty easy to get from Cholola to Tenochtitlan, so even though the Mexica delegation was still with Cortez and told him that uh, he definitely should not be going, uh, Cortez was like, well, no, I'm definitely going. But at the moment, he still had other matters at hand. Cortez and his band awoke on the third day that they spent at Cholola to find that the city had no more food. Uh, or at least had no more food to give them. It would not give them food. That day, the Castilians received no food, just wood and water. And the Spanish asked the Tlaxcalans to help them find food. When Cortez realized that the Tololan leadership didn't intend on visiting him to explain the lack of food, he went off himself in search of the ruler. His name was Taquaya. Some of the fellows, his fellow Spaniards began to notice, meanwhile, too, that the Chilolans were indeed starting to close off sections of streets and were piling rocks on top of roofs, just like the Tlash Collins had said they would. Cortez had trouble finding Taquaya. Instead, he went to the temple of Quetzalcoatl and began questioning two priests. When Cortez finally found Taquaya there, uh, when Cortez Taquaya finally went to the temple to uh, meet with Cortez, he asked why everyone seemed to be ask, acting so suspiciously. Taquaya explained with embarrassment that Montezuma had ordered no help be given to the Spaniards. Well, just to make sure that he was telling the truth, Cortez promptly tortured the two priests until they confirmed, indeed, yes, Montezuma was why the city was on edge. The priest said that the emperor could not decide what to do. One day he would think about a peaceful reception for the Spaniards. The other day he would, you know, have plans to have them all killed. May or may not have been true. But, you know, it sounds might be true. Montezuma probably still not had yet fully settled on a plan of action. The tortured priests also confessed that 20,000 warriors had been assembled along the road to Tenochtitlan and planned on ambushing the conquistadors in the mountains, and that this army planned to carry the Spaniards back to Montezuma in hammocks so that they could be sacrificed. That sounds exceedingly difficult to accomplish, if you ask me, but remember, the goal of warfare in Mesoamerica wasn't necessarily to kill your enemy right away. It, and an exceedingly difficult to capture sacrifice is exactly the sort of thing that was required to stave off the destruction of the universe. Well, Cortez had a meeting with his captains and they debated on what to do. Some wanted to retreat to Tlaxcala, others wanted to reroute to Hexonzinco and attempt to pink, pick up more prospective allies. The boldest amongst the Spaniards, however, argued for a preemptive attack. The Tlaxcalans agreed with that, and perhaps due to that urging, I remember there's five or six thousand Tlaxcalan warriors alongside, now fewer than one thousand Spaniards. This is the viewpoint that carries the day. In preparation for the battle, Cortez asked the Indian allies to make themselves clear of the Cholulans, which they probably did with some sort of flower in their headdresses, though I don't know exactly what the uniform was. But Cortez assured them they would punish the city together, and to avoid confusion, it was important to make certain who was who when the fighting began. Cortez then ordered the chiefs of Cholula into the courtyard of the Temple of Quetzalcoatl so that he could say goodbye before he left, that courtyard being the normal place of assembly for the lords of Cholula, and at this request, over 100 showed up, including Tokaya. They were unarmed, reportedly. The Spaniards then closed the doors to the courtyard, and Cortez began to harangue the Tololans. He accused them of attempting to kill the Spaniards, when all they did was want to stop them from supporting human sacrifice. 
He told them that he knew the countryside was full of Mexica warriors, to which the Chilolans admitted culpability, though they said that Montezuma ordered it. Then, Cortes stated for these crimes, they must die. What follows shows us that Cortes was not a great man. Great men do not plan and execute these acts of barbarism. An arquebus was followed as a signal and it started. One hundred or so lords of the courtyard were all executed, but it didn't stop there. For the next two hours, Castilians, Totonax, and Flush Collins alike killed many, many others. The army rampaged through the city, engaging what I might call an orgy of death. Cortez states 3,000 were killed. However many were stabbed, beaten, or otherwise slayed, though that day isn't really known. The Tlash Collins, as reported by Cortez without his permission, continued to sack the town. Putting the thousand-year-old city to the torch, it burned for two days, according to Andres de Tapia. Many priests ended up throwing themselves off the summits of their temples to avoid death or capture at the hands of the Tlash Collins. Only after two days did Cortez call an end to the pillage. The treasure found in the city was considerable, and the theft of this treasure, just like the murders that took place and the burning and everything else, it was all completely justified in the minds of Cortez and his followers. After all, during the carnage, did they not free Indian slaves, some of them children, from wooden cages, being fattened for sacrifice? The gold they recovered was not the sole reason that the Spaniards executed civilians on a mass scale, no. No, the gold was proof of God's approval, don't you, don't you understand? The massacre at Chalola was undisputedly one of the most controversial events of the conquest. It leaves a mark on Cortes, a mark that I've spoken of with other conquistadors, that no matter how you feel about them, even if you can justify all the death and torture and slavery, you know, I mean, just, Cortes was just a real son of a bitch, you know. His friends, let alone people like Bartolomé de las Casas, all agreed that the reason Cortes ordered the massacre wasn't as punishment, but as an opportunity to put fear into the hearts of the Mexica at Tenochtitlan. This was the same sort of thing that Cortes himself, of course, had participated back in Hispaniola and Cuba under the direction of other conquistadors, the quote-unquote pacification of the land, a tactic he probably learned from Nicolas de Ovando during the massacre of Zaragua, and relearned again under the direction of Velazquez when he was involved at the massacre of the Chino chiefdom of Kaunau. With that said, though, we can't leave the Tlash Collins off the hook, I suppose. The reports of stones on roofs and barricades, that all came from Tlash Collins sources and may or may not have been as they said it was. Now, obviously, I don't know for certain, but probably there was some sort of plan enacted by the Chilolans to fight the Spaniards. I think it's possible that the Chilolans uh, intended to expel the army. Uh, I also think it's worth considering, though, that maybe the Tlash Collins seized on an excuse to settle old scores with Chilola, which had switched allegiance from Tlash Kala to Tenochtitlan in the fairly recent past. Ross Hassig goes further, says the massacre was purely a Tlash Collins policy. The Tlash Collins were seeking revenge on Chilola for switching sides. Uh, that only happened a year before, by the way. Writing of the incidents at Chilola, Hasig says, quote, Cortez's hand may have struck the blow, but the mastermind was Tlaxcaltec, unquote. His argument is that Cortez justified the massacre by arguing that the Chilolans were duplicitous, but the massacre was carried out on behalf in fact, in reality, it was just carried out on the behalf of the Clash Collins with their, and with their assistance. Maybe Hassan goes a little far here. Like much about the conquest, the details are a little foggy, though. Cortez may have very well been manipulated into the attack. At any rate, even if Cortez really did just plan on killing about a hundred enemy leaders and nobody else, locking 100 people in a room Hacking them to death is still a really, really shitty thing to do. If you're the type of person who would hack up a hundred people in a room, 
I'm sure you're also the type of person who would hack up many more than 100 people in a day. Hugh Thomas writes, quote, Once the bloodshed had begun, something like bloodlust must have taken over, and hundreds were killed. None of the conquistadors involved seems to have wanted to much to speak about the matter afterwards, unquote. After the massacre, Cortes went to the Mexica ambassadors, who were half dead with fear at this point. Uh, they were spared from the massacre, but they were shaking in their sandals, as it were, hiding in their lodgings as the massacre went on. Cortes told them that the chiefs of Chilola told him that Montezuma was responsible for the treachery of the Chilolans. He thus informed the ambassadors that he intended to enter Tenochtitlan as an enemy, not as a friend. The ambassadors responded that this in no way could be the case. They would have known about any such encouragement by Montezuma, and they asked to send a messenger to the emperor, to which Cortes agreed. That messenger traveled as quickly as possible to, for the 60 miles which separated Chilola from Tenochtitlan, and when he brought news of what had had happened, the emperor and the entire city was put into a panic, probably just as Cortes intended. One additional thing was made clear, though, too, to the people of Tenochtitlan from this action. Cortes, now the sacker of the temple of Quetzalcoatl, certainly could not then also be the returning Quetzalcoatl come to retake his throne. Montezuma responded with more appeasement. It's hard to believe, but the emperor rushed more gifts to Cortes, including ten plates of gold, fifteen hundred cotton cloaks, food, and an apology for the alleged rebellion. He said that the local Mexica garrison must have had some sort of arrangement with the uh, Cholola local lords. He certainly was not behind anything nefarious. Of course, though, Cortes could under no circumstances visit Tenochtitlan. He could not feed the Spaniards. Cortes replied that he must visit the city anyway. He then took the most difficult way possible from Chilolo to Tenochtitlan, a mountain pass that reaches just under 13,000 feet, known as the Pass of Cortes now, in fact. He thought it would be the least likely to be blocked by the Mexica. He left on November 1st, 1519, said goodbye to Mamexi the Totonac general, who took his men and went home. Of course, losing 800 men was not nothing, but the five or 6,000 flash columns who were coming along meant that Cortes still had a very large fighting force. Sahagoons inform us give us some idea of the average Mexica's thoughts of the Spaniards as various farmers and whatnot saw them on their route. The conquistadors, quote, stirred up the dust. Their iron lances, their iron halberds glistened from afar, and their iron swords moved in a wavy line as, they, as if they were a water course, and their dogs went ahead, panting, phone dripping from their mouths, unquote. The Spaniards passed by more cities on their way to the capital. They first stopped at Chalco, and after another day at Ayotzinco, the next stop was at the small town of Mixquic, conquered by the Mexica before the end of the 14th century on their way to the rise to empire. Then to Itzapalapa, that was on the edge of the lake facing Tenochtitlan. Finally, on November 8th, Cortes started along the main causeway across the lake to the capital. Four horsemen in traditional European armor were in front. These were probably Alvarado, Sandoval, Olid, and Velasquez de Leon, then the standard bearer, then a contingent of infantry with draws and swords, a few more horsemen in cotton armor with lances afterwards, then a contingent of crossbowmen in cotton armor with plumed helmets, followed by the last of the horsemen, and after that the arquebusiers. Cortes rode at the rear with the small group of horsemen and standard barriers, and presumably after that, his personal staff. Behind that were the tlush columns, dressed and painted for war, some carrying Lombard guns, probably on wooden carts by now. The pleasure which the tlush columns felt as they marched into the capital of their empire, as if in triumph, <laughs> must have been incredible. Now, Tenochtitlan was larger than any city which Cortes or anyone in his band had ever seen. Some might have seen cities which were close in size, Constantinople and Naples. 
but most of them had only seen Seville. And in fact, no cities in the old world would have been comparable to Tenochtitlan except a few in China. And nobody in Spain had seen any of those either. Bernal Diaz recalled that, quote, gazing on such wonderful sights, we did not know what to say, or whether what appeared before us was real. For on one side, on the land, there were great cities, and in the lake, ever so many more. And the lake itself was crowded with canoes, and in the causeway, there were many bridges at intervals, and in front of us stood the great city of Mexico. And we, we did not even number 400 soldiers. And we well remembered the words and warnings given to us by the people of Tlaxcala, and the many other warnings that they had given us that we should beware of entering Mexico, where they would kill us as soon as they had us inside, unquote. The Spaniards gawked at the city, and as they did so, the emperor came and met Cortes. Montezuma appeared born on a litter, with a canopy of green feathers, gold and silver, and gold and silver embroidery, and jade stones embedded in it, carried by noblemen. Other nobles swept the ground in front of the litter. Another walked with a symbolic stick showing Montezuma's authority. The two men exchanged gifts. Cortes placed a necklace of pearls around Montezuma's neck, and the emperor gave one to Cortes, a necklace of golden trip. It was surely a spectacle. Bernal Diaz says, quote, Who could count the multitude of men, women, and children which had come out to the roofs in their boats on the canals or in the streets to see us? It all passes before my eyes as if it were yesterday, unquote. It's actually a bit of differentiation uh, in the accounts about how the initial meeting went down, just so you know. Uh, the accounts specifically differ on whether or not Montezuma offered to become a vassal of King Charles. I think it's unlikely that Cortes simply invented a speech that Montezuma gave, but I also think that uh, it's likely he overstated the desire of Montezuma to be a vassal. Um, some of the conquistadors alleged that no speech took place until a few days later, uh, Hugh Thomas, for what it's worth, believes that the speech was made, but that some conquistadors confused it with another speech that also occurred a few days later, after the Spaniards discovered a secret catch of gold, uh, and that Cortes uh, probably seized on whatever polite words Montezuma used at this initial meeting in order to hold them to them later. Um, anyway, regardless, the Spanish expedition spent the next several days in like a state in a semi-dream state they were well fed with tortillas turkeys eggs and fresh water the horses and dogs ate well even their beds were made from flowers the man, the demands caused by feeding the large force must have been considerable but for a time they caused no resentment with the mexica the reserves of the capital were all that were required to provide for cortez and his men now, almost none of the Spaniards had ever experienced being treated to anything like this sort of luxury back in Spain. Um, their amazement was even greater as a result, as they experienced firsthand the massive grid of narrow streets of Tenochtitlan, barely wide enough for two people to walk, though these were occasionally dissected by another overlapping grid of broad avenues and canals. The large courtyards and astonishing gardens were full of fruits and vegetables and flowering trees. This was a city more alive and greater than anything they had ever witnessed before. Yet in some ways there were similarities. The flat roofs of the homes and open patios reminded the Spaniards of Seville. And, fa and the fact that Mexican women spent all day working in the home, cooking and weaving weaving being the constant task of all women in Mexico, well, that made the conquistadors feel a certain familiarity regarding gender roles. Cortes and his men were among the first Europeans to taste chocolate, if not the first, the numerous chocolate sellers being one of the many delights which the city uh, offered. To the Spaniards, Tenochtitlan seemed in other ways bizarre, in some ways familiar, they described it in ways that were familiar, though. 
quote, another Venice, or perhaps a great Venice. One Spaniard even called it Venice the Rich. Well, with all the canals, obviously, the Venice. Europeans also remarked on how clean Tenochtitlan was. Teams of workers kept everything far cleaner than the cities which the Spanish were used to, what with literal piles of human and animal feces that uh, littered the streets of Europe. Still, the hundreds of, hum of giant pyramid temples stood as a constant reminder that while some parts of familiar were familiar, some were strange, some were delightful. Well, this was also a place filled with the horrors of human sacrifice. We know far less about what the Mexica thought of the Spaniards, though considering that Mesoamericans regularly bathed in water obtained via an aqueduct or from the lake or from the numerous baths or steam houses in the city, it's likely that one of the first and foremost reactions was that the Spaniards stank. Europeans themselves rarely washed in comparison to Americans or modern people. I think it's actually very possible, in fact, that the numerous European accounts that me mention the Mexica or Mesoamericans dousing them with incense might actually be precisely because Mesoamericans were uh, offended at the smell. Anyway, Montezuma had recently completed the construction of a new palace in Tenochtitlan, so he housed the Spaniards in the old royal palace. Cortes settled in, and in the day after their arrival, the Caudillo visited Montezuma in the capital with his four captains, De Leon, Ordaz, Alvarado, and Sandoval. They were accompanied by five soldiers, amongst them Bernal Diaz, which is why we know so much about this meeting. Leon and Ordaz were followers of Velasquez. Alvarado and Sandoval were Cortez friends. Montezuma received the delegation courteously. It is this meeting, which is attributed by Hugh Thomas anyway, to the confusion regarding the various accounts of the meeting that occurred two days before, uh, and probably because the conquistadors wrote about and were interviewed much later, um, uh, sometimes decades later, about these events. And anyway, uh, Cortes gave a version of his usual speech about the benefits of Christianity and how the Mexica should absolutely stop worshipping devils, and uh, with Aguilar and Marina helping translate, of course, and beyond that, that the Mexica should end the practice of human sacrifice due to the fact that the priests and victims alike were brothers of Christ. Montezuma listened attentively via the chain of interpreters, and in the words of Hugh Thomas, quote, how much do we wish we knew what mistakes they made, what shades of meaning they added or subtracted, unquote. Afterwards, one of the emperor's nephews presented gold jewels and ten loads of fine cloth for Cortez and each of his captains, and Montezuma bid Cortez adieu. The emperor always ate his dinner alone. The Spaniards continued exploring, and over the next few days uh, found that the city was, in fact, so gigantic that the market to the city was technically once a separate city, Tlatelolco, which had literally grown together into Tenochtitlan so that they had, were now basically one city, and the size of the market astonished the Spaniards. They frequently commented on it. Cortes believed it was twice the size of the great square of Salamanca in Spain. Others in the party who'd been to Rome and Constantinople said they'd seen nothing like it. Montezuma gave Cortes a tour of the great temple to Huitzilopochtli and then to his private zoo, which had no real comparison in Europe, by the way. There were a few wealthy princes there who kept a small number of wild animals, but nothing like what existed on the scale of Montezuma. He had a great menagerie filled with jaguars and various other beasts like alligators, exotic vegetation and birds, and the Spaniards tried not to show how impressed they were, but one incident in particular seems telling. In the temple of Huitzilopochtli, the Spaniards got a good look at the idol. Uh, Huitzilopochtli's effigy was designed to be terrifying. He had fangs and whatnot. There's blood on the walls, and Cortes asked Montezuma how he could possibly worship these horrible devils. Montezuma stated that if he had known that Cortes would have said such dishonorable things, 
he would not have brought him up to see his gods. And what's remarkable about this to me is that Cortez apologized after this. It's, uh, I think, a remarkable thing in, in the life of this particular conquistador. He did not give a lot of apologies. As the days went on, though, the Spaniards began to get over being so awestruck a bit, and they started getting really paranoid instead. They were, the Slash Collins also were complaining. They didn't really like being cooped up in the palace of their oppressor, massive though it was to accommodate an army of thousands. How could they ever carry all this loot back from the city? I mean, especially considering the Mexica were planning to kill them. Some conquistadors began talking of the city as a spider's web. Ordaz noticed how easily the Mexica could raise the drawbridges in the city to keep them in. They had no boats. They couldn't flee across the lake if that were the case. Hadn't their allies warned them against coming to Tenochtitlan? Who knew what the Mexica really thought underneath this courtesy and offer of vassalage? The Tlash Collins repeatedly warned especially the interpreter, Geronimo de Aguilar, I mean, probably because they could talk to him, that the friendliness of the Mexica was wearing off. Cortez was paranoid, too. He began weighing his options. He considered striking against Montezuma. Uh, But then news came from the coast, which greatly influenced his next course of action. The Tlash Collins informed Cortez that his captain, Juan de Escalante, in charge of Villarica de la Veracruz, had been killed. So too had six other Castilians and many Totonacs. The cause, the report stated, was that Montezuma's agent told the Totonac towns that they must either continue paying tribute or they would be at war. And when they refused, saying Cortez had forbidden it, that agent, his name was Quapapaca, threatened reprisals. And when he made good on those threats, Escalante charged out to demand gold. A battle ensued. The Totonacs retreated. Afterwards, the Spaniards were routed. One conquistador, Juan de Arguello, was sacrificed. His head, complete with black curly beard, was sent to Montezuma as a trophy. It's always important, folks, by the way, if you're collecting the sacrificed heads of your enemies, of course, to not forget the special beard attachment. It's a collector's item. At any rate, Escalante returned in disorder back to Veracruz and died later of his wounds. Cortez was angry, as of course you know he was. But Cortez is also the sort of man, he was one of the most brilliant military men I have ever read about. Maybe the most brilliant. As for why I cite this as one of the examples, Cortez used this incident as a pretext to do one of the most audacious things that has ever been done in history. He went with his captains to see Montezuma soon after learning about the death of Escalante in Veracruz. He started talking with the emperor as if nothing was wrong, and then suddenly he changed his tone. He became very angry, changed the subject, and questioned Montezuma, why should the emperor have sent his men against the Spanish garrison at Veracruz? Suspiciously, this is the same thing that what happened at Chalola. He then presented a letter to Montezuma, which he stated implicated the emperor. Cortes presented Montezuma with a choice after this. He said that Montezuma must accompany Cortes immediately, without any fuss or raising his guards, to the old palace where the Castilians were staying, so that Cortes could properly forgive Montezuma of these crimes. Or, if Montezuma were to cry out or make any noise at all, then his captains would kill him. Cortes explained that his friends were becoming very annoyed and soon there would be nothing he could do to help Montezuma. The emperor was terrified. But the alternative was equally horrifying to him. My person is not such as can be made a prisoner of. 
love, even if I would like it. My people would not suffer it, is how he responded. An argument began, which lasted, I think, for hours, maybe even half the day, according to some accounts. Cortez reports that he was completely wrapped up with everything in 30 minutes, but who knows the truth, and if that doesn't sound likely. But once Cortez made his demand, he began arguing with Montezuma, and his captains began getting nervous. One of those captains was Velázquez de Leon, a particularly large and fearsome-looking man. He loudly declared that the emperor had to choose now. Either he would go with them, or he would be killed on the spot. The emperor asked La Malinche what the conquistador had said. She replied by advising him to go with the Spaniards without any trouble, that the Spaniards would honor him appropriately, and if he did not go, he would be killed. Montezuma reportedly then offered two sons and two daughters as hostages to Cortez that he could never explain such an action as going with the Spaniards to be his counselors. I mean, he could not explain this to to, to the other high-ranking men of Tenochtitlan. Cortez replied there was no alternative. Besides, he would simply be carrying on the administration of the empire from the old palace. No other changes would be taking place at all. Ultimately, Montezuma went. Hugh Thomas says, though, that Montezuma went with Cortez not entirely out of fear. Surely, fear is the primary factor, in my opinion. But perhaps there was another reason. Thomas really also, and he's the expert, believes that, in part, Montezuma was fascinated with Cortez and the Spaniards. Sure, he was afraid. But perhaps the emperor was fascinated with these military technologies of the Spaniards and believed that by going with them, he might still yet bring an alliance between the Aztecs and the Spaniards or at least learn more about their weaponry. The emperor insisted anyway that he was going out of goodwill, and not because he was afraid. He'd spoken to Huitzilopochtli, he told everyone, and he told them that Huitzilopochtli told him that it would be good for his health, in fact, to live for a while with the Castilians. However much he might try to disguise the fact, however, and whatever alternative motivations might have also accompanied Montezuma's decision, the inescapable truth is that henceforth armed Castilians always attended his royal presence. It was an obvious marker that despite his words he was not going of his own will, at least not entirely, and so the kidnapping took place. Montezuma went across town, borne on a litter, carried by some noblemen, attended by servants, but this was one of the most brilliant coup d'etats in history. Cortes now had the keys to the, the empire, one of the greatest empires on planet Earth, in fact. He was being truthful when he told Montezuma that he would continue to govern the Aztec Empire. But now it was also true. From now on, Cortes would govern Montezuma. Years later, the famous critic of Spanish colonialism, Bartolomé de las Casas, spoke with Cortés over dinner. He questioned him, by what law had he made the emperor a prisoner? Cortés laughed off the question with a comment along the lines, I, I can't remember exactly, something along the lines of, let your ears hear what your mouth speaks, and started laughing, something like that. Of course, there was no law that existed where a man could kidnap kings. Cortez, though, never doubted that what he was doing was righteous. He was a crusader for his church and his king, and in the long run, his kidnapping of Montezuma was just necessary for the Mexica to receive their spiritual redemption. If Cortez became fabulously wealthy while doing so, well, then that was just further proof that he was doing God's will. At any rate, Montezuma quickly became accustomed to being imprisoned. He developed what we might call a case of Stockholm Syndrome, or at least that's my non-professional opinion. He spent a lot of time talking with Cortez, talking with his guards, sometimes joking and 
laughing at them, and in particular he developed a better friendship with a young boy, Orteguilla, who was a page of Cortez and who had quickly learned some Nahuatl. Orteguilla and uh, Montezuma often spoke, and Montezuma would question the boy about the culture and society of the Spanish people, and in turn, Orteguilla would pass back information to Cortez about the nature of the Mexican regime. Sometimes it's actually hard for me to believe how like, submissive Montezuma seems during, his capacity, during this captivity. This was reportedly a man who was once a general in his youth. The general of an army. It, it's most of the nobility, you know, in Tenochtitlan were not fooled by the insistence of their emperor. He was not a prisoner, and they were likewise not very amused at all by the Castilian's presence. Many started refusing to see the emperor. In fact, after he moved to the uh, old palace being barred by the Spaniards. Now, the citizenry continued to provide food and water, um, but increasingly they began to ignore new orders that Montezuma gave. But this also was a crisis in the Mexica regime because Montezuma, the emperor, ruled as a despot. He was the, quote, heart of the city, a quetzal feather, a great silk cotton tree, a wall, a barricade, these were all ways that he was described. From his greatness, the people of the city took refuge. The emperor's words were often metaphoricized in works of art, literally as precious jades, as literal gemstones that would fall from the mouth of the divine emperor of the Mexica. Montezuma, Montezuma didn't just govern his people, besides. He was literally, to them, necessary for the survival of the universe. Only the emperor's devotion to the Mexica calendar and the required sacrifices to which the Lapochle kept the entire world safe. But now, Montezuma was in the hands of an evil group of visitors. Shortly after the captivity of Montezuma began, Cortes had the emperor order Popoca, the official responsible for the death of Escalante, to be delivered to the capital as a prisoner along with his sons and 15 other Mexica leaders, for the crime of having fought against the Spaniards. The Spaniards questioned Qualpopoca, who at first claimed sole responsibility for the attack. Under torture, though, he stated the emperor ordered him to attack the Spaniards. Cortes told Montezuma what Qualpopoca confessed, and then followed up that news to the fierce emperor Despite this treachery, Cortes was now so fond of Montezuma, he would never harm him, despite whatever he was guilty of. Qual Popoca, his sons, and the other 15 Mexica nobles, on the other hand, were ordered burned to death. That was carried out in the great square of Tenochtitlan before the great pyramid of the sun. The fire was made using a pile of arrows and sword holders, which had been taken from a Mexica armory in the palace in order to purposefully damage resistance efforts. Montezuma wished to miss the execution while in irons. Now, the Mexica who witnessed the burning did so in complete silence, according to the accounts. Burning people alive was common practice in Spain. You tie them up to a pole, they scream in agony until they suffocate in com just complete misery. But to the Mexica, this is the same sort of horror that human sacrifice was to the Spaniards. Even still, Montezuma continued to rule in some ways for weeks past this incident. Cortes even freed the emperor from his shackles after some time, but by then the emperor he dared not flee. It is possible he had grown accustomed to his captors, and you know, the way that an animal might become tame. But I think it's more likely that after the burning of Qualpopoca, the emperor's reputation was in such shambles, he feared assassination more than he feared continued captivity. 
the city even seemed to return to normal, or some amount of normalcy for a while after that time. Montezuma's life at Evneway went on with festivity. His diminished power and reputation aside, jugglers and jesters amused him. The emperor watched and played the famous Aztec ball game. He often played it with his Spanish captors. The game was so popular and was bet on so frequently, in fact, that the best way I think I'm going to describe it, the popular really, not the game itself, but the popularity, is literally how the NFL is popular in the U.S. and how gambling is completely intertwined with the sport. And It's played on both professional levels and people play Kids play backyard football and, and by kids. I mean, Montezuma was uh, a great sport about it, too. Anyway, he would always be cheerfully paying people when he lost, and uh, he almost always gave away his winnings when he won, often in the form of uh, jewels and girls, and sometimes to children, sometimes not the girls probably, but the, the Castilian guards. Um, he also continued presiding over the calendar of sacrifices, which Cortez pretended not to notice. Meanwhile, the Spaniards enjoyed the city's many delights. Some probably experimented with the various hallucinogenic substances available to market, though the sources are silent on that matter, but at the very least they drank a shitload of hot chocolate. Cortez continued to deal with the matters of command as well, like com replacing the commander of Veracruz, who, after Escalante was killed, was being run by one Alonso de Grado. De uh, Grado loved being in charge. He loved being in charge of Veracruz. He loved it so much that he spent his time living like a lord, gambling, eating well, and constantly demanding jewels and women from the Totonax. Cortez replaced him uh, with Gonzalo de Sandoval, and in fact Sandoval's first order in being as uh, in charge was that he was going to return Grado to Tenochtitlan in chains. Grado was put in the stocks for two days as punishment for his poor governorship, and Cortez's suspicions that someone like that might try to deal with Velasquez should the Cuban governor ever attempt to interfere with Mexico. But Cortez also began to plan the construction of ships, which would, quote, be capable, whenever we might wish it, of taking 300 men and the horses to the mainland, unquote. He put one of his conquistadors, uh, a certain Martin Lopez, in command of the construction of the ships. Now, Lopez had actually never built ships before, but some of his servants, who go unnamed to us in the historical record, did understand how to build ships. And so Martin Lopez basically supervised this and gets all of the credit. Such are the limitations of history. Lopez began the construction of four brigantines for a commission that was supposed to be 2,000 pesos, though it doesn't seem like he ever got paid. Native carpenters also aided in the construction of the boats. Uh, these were provided after Montezuma was told that the Spanish were building boats for pleasure. Each one could carry four bronze guns and 75 men. The emperor was aboard, in fact, the first uh, trial run of the sailing, which was a great success, and afterwards the brigantines constantly cruised, cruised the lakes of Tenochtitlan. Uh, this allowed the Spaniards to gain more and more information as a result of the lake's character, its vegetation, depths, and where the good harbors were to be found. And just as Cortes was learning more about the lake, he was learning about what regions of the empire produced gold. He got that information easily, too. Well, the Aztecs didn't really care as much about gold as the Spanish did, and so Montezuma told him exactly what provinces produced the gold. If, in contrast, though, for example, Cortes had instead asked Montezuma, where did he get materials for paper? Or where did the jade come from? Where did the quetzal feathers come from? He might not have gotten very good answers. But as things were, um, he got told exactly where the gold was. And then Cortez sent men to those places, uh, especially to Oaxaca to meet the Mixtec people, uh, which was an ethnic group living in what is now the state of Oaxaca, and who were the best metalsmiths in Mesoamerica as well as several other regions uh, where the empire had the most gold. And these guys brought back, obviously, as much as they could in tribute back to Tenochtitlan. Cortes also plotted with Montezuma. Um, the two often talked about how they would use all this gold to finance the conquest of China. 
Cortes himself would lead the armies of the Aztecs into Asia in this scenario, and when they were both successful, both he and Montezuma would become very, very wealthy, and even more powerful, of course. At least that's how Cortes envisioned things, and presumably talking about this made both men very, very happy uh, while they waited upon the arrival of the treasure. Now, after it did arrive, the expedition took stock of their finances again. The gold gained from the presents and seizures combined was estimated at 160,000 pesos, the royal fifth thus named at 32,000 pesos. Additionally, not counted amongst that loot was 75,000 pesos worth of gold and silver jewelry. Cortes took his fifth, 25,600 pesos of the remainder, leaving 102,400 pesos worth of gold. Cortes then reimbursed himself for his expenses, which included sailors' wages, ships, food, and horses. Money was also allocated to the two priests, to Cortes' agents in Spain, and to the 70 men at Veracruz. After that was all left, there wasn't a whole lot left to be divided. Only, in fact, one or two of the men, out of the hundreds of conquistadors present, seemed to have been at all satisfied with his share. Ordinary soldiers were offered 100 pesos, senior captains 500. Most looked at their payment as an insult. Cortes apparently managed to smooth some of them with secret payments, and in fact, who knows how much loot Cortes really had to split up before it was all officially counted. Well, to give you an idea of what might have been, Cortes' enemies, though, stated at least 700,000 pesos worth of gold had been accumulated, a far greater sum, of course, than 160,000. The truth, of course, is probably somewhere in between, though whatever the exact number is has been lost to history forever. It's still a lot of fucking gold, though. For example, in comparison, Ponce de Leon reported 22,000 pesos of gold after conquering Puerto Rico, so the king's share there was 4,000. At any rate, Cortes is not the only person accused of theft. Uh, Alvarado was charged with seizing 30,000 pesos, as well as feathers, jade, cloth, and cacao, and he paid no royal fifth on it either. Two other conquistadors, Velasquez de Leon and Gonzalo de Sandoval, uh, they drew swords and fought over this gold at this instance. Both were wounded, and after they began fighting over a set of gold plates, apparently, ultimate Cortez, ultimately Cortez jailed both of them for a while until they cooled down. The citizens of Tenochtitlan were also not idle during this time. Every day, the city fed the uh, thousands of guests. Um, well, this started to really get old. And it seems the city, generally speaking, was far less entranced with the Spanish guests than Montezuma was. And um, ultimately, the empire started making some important and secret military moves either with or without Montezuma. If he was involved, the Spanish did not detect it. Early in the year of 1520, messengers of the government reached tributary governments of the Mexica. They began asking for military aid to expel the intruders. Perhaps Montezuma was communicating privately with some important Tenochtitlan counselors, most of whom had been imprisoned, but uh, those who were free had begun to assemble an army. And Cortes was oblivious to this growing Mexica army, which may or may not have been getting put together with Montezuma's help, like I said. But in April of 1520, he received news that Vera, from Veracruz, and that tore his attention away from Tenochtitlan altogether. Ships were seen off the coast near Villarica de la Veracruz, most of the conquistadors, when they heard about this, were delighted, thinking, surely, reinforcements had arrived, but Cortes was not so cheerful. He feared, rightfully so it turns out, that uh, these ships were controlled by Diego Velasquez, the governor of Cuba, who hadn't had any news at all about the happenings in Mexico until he heard of the establishment of Veracruz a new colonial venture, which Cortes explicitly stated to be outside of Velazquez's control. 
Well, I imagine he was pretty much royally pissed off when he found out about that, or in the words of William Prescott, quote, it would not be easy to paint the mingled emotions of curiosity, astonishment, and wrath which agitated his bosom, unquote, upon reading the news of the goings-on in Mexico, and at any rate, the ships comprised the fleet of Panfilo de Narvaez, sent by Velasquez, who could not lead the fleet himself, or did not want to, because of an epidemic rate ravaging Cuba. In 1519, smallpox crossed the Atlantic de Española, and there basically ended what was left of the Taino population. In November, the epidemic reached Cuba, and according to Velasquez's own account, he felt duty to stay, to remain in Cuba to deal with the crisis. Narvaez's orders were to hang Cortez as a rebel, similarly as Pedrarius earlier treated Balboa. Narvaez commanded to help accomplish this deed 900 men, and he was no slouch himself, unlike Velasquez. Now, Panfilo de Narvaez was about 42 years old, he was tall, strong-limbed, and according to Bernal Diaz, had a very large head with a red beard and an agreeable presence, with a voice and of, a voice and conversation very deep and hoarse, as if it came from a vault. Cortez wrote that Velasquez had impressed Narvaez's army of nine hundred in service, which is far from the truth for almost everyone on the fleet. A few conscripts existed in the force, but. The reality was that the smallpox outbreak led many Spaniards on Cuba to realize that the encomiendas there were not a good investment. The native population was dwindling away, and while at the moment Pedrarius's slave ships brought captives from Panama, well, how long could that really last? Cortez's charges of a conscripted force aside, Narvaez instead brought with him an experienced group of Caribbean conquistadors, quote, of an experience as long as their reputation was dubious, unquote, according to Hugh Thomas, which is to say that unlike Cortez's characterization of the 900, these men were, that these men were forced into battle and thus poor soldiers, and incidentally this helps Cortez look better by having incompetent soldiers around him, well, they weren't necessarily very loyal to anything other than their own fortunes, but they weren't greenhorns either. Now, Narvaez's group amongst them, for example, was Juan Bono de Cuejo. He arrived way back on Columbus's fourth voyage. He'd already been on several expeditions, such as that of Ponce de Leon with the discovery of Florida in 1513. He'd served as a captain there for one of the ships on Leon's fleet. He also testified against Diego Columbus that year, so he was a favorite of the Spanish crown, regardless of his horrible behavior, and after that, uh, Cuejo was involved with trading Indian slaves and pearls from the coast of Venezuela to Cuba. He had wealthy Genoese backers who helped him finance an expedition to Trinidad in 1516. There, Cuejo and his men reportedly engaged in such terrible acts that he literally was one of Las Casas' favorite targets to attack. Another man on Narvaez's ship was Andres de Duero. He was one of Cortez's friends, but he was also Governor Velasquez's secretary. Hugh Thomas tells us that conditions in Cuba must have been bad indeed if so comfortably placed an individual should venture out on such a journey. Now, like Cortez's expedition, a third of the 900 came from Andalusia, 20% from Old Castile, and 8% from Extremadura. Many even abandoned property and wives in Cuba to join with Narvaez. Some, maybe eagerly so, since the outbreak of smallpox on the island uh, had diminished their wealth, but most, uh, especially those with families, probably left with some anxiety, uh, for conquistadors with children especially. The conquistadors themselves, however, like most adults from Spain, had immunity to the disease, by and large, by the time they were adults. None of them, though, understood they were potential vectors, sick or not, so, of course, none of them considered they might be bringing the disease along with them, as they themselves escaped the island. 
Now, Diego Velasquez apparently seized a shitload of cassava bread from the local population without paying for it in order to feed his fleet, resorting to the same sort of tactics that Cortez had gone uh, to when he engaged to leave quickly. In, in addition, he supplied them with a, a large number of Cuban Taino slaves, though I don't know how many, before sending them off. In, in reality, there were a lot more than 900 people on the ships. Narvaez led his fleet along the same path uh, on the coast that had earlier been used by Cordoba, Grijalva, and Cortez himself, and that's how he found himself at the mouth of the Grijalva River on Easter Sunday, April 7, 1520. Narvaez found Potonchan nearly empty. The few natives he could find were hostile and ready for war. Narvaez was pleased to discover this because it was the result of the bad treatment they'd received at the hand of the of Cortez and, well, Cortez's allies mainly at Veracruz. The expedition continued onwards, spreading disease as they went. And the native population of Yucatan was soon decimated as a result of the arrival of smallpox, though, of course... No one grasped what was happening exactly, and the significance of this would only really become apparent much later. Nervais swore to the locals he would be kinder than Cortez, and then sailed on. He then promptly encountered a storm which sank one of his ships, damaged the rest of his fleet, and drowned 40 of his men. Causing quite a bit of disarray before everyone managed to re-congregate off the coast of Totonic lands. There, Narvaez received an unexpected visitor. A certain Francisco Cervantes, a ship's carpenter who'd been along with Cortez, was able to vividly describe Tenochtitlan to the fleet of Narvaez. Apparently, Cervantes had been along one of the scouting groups, which Cortez had sent to the gold-producing regions of the Aztec Empire, and once Cervantes got there, he decided to stay. A decision which absolutely infuriated Cortez, of course, and Cortez Des made it a point to go to the coast when he heard about new ships arriving to greet them and to tell everything that he knew and also all about how much he didn't like Cortez. He also stated, though, that he believed that Cortez could probably raise an army of 50,000 natives against Narvaez if necessary. So Narvaez was kind to the Totonacs. But Narvaez's stated plans weren't very popular when he had them proclaimed via the town crier, which essentially was that Cortez and his men were bad men and robbers who came only to take prisoners. Narvaez was going to go to Tenochtitlan, he was going to release Montezuma, and he was going to bring Cortez back in chains. This wasn't very popular amongst the subjected Totonac people, of course, who were very happy that Cort Montezuma was a prisoner. And in fact, it wasn't even all that popular amongst the conquistadors. Narvaez's treasure even insisted that it was scandalous to speak of Cortez in such a way. The land was so peaceful. Beyond that, another man in the party, a judge in Cuba, Velasquez de Alion, had arrived off the Mexican coast thanks to the storm before Narvaez. He had been there several days early and apparently began thinking as a result of that, and maybe because he was a judge, that, you know, maybe he should be in charge instead of Narvaez. Um, and as time passed and the expedition stayed on the coast, Alion began, started having a lot of good things to say about Cortez. Narvaez had some of his agents, agents arrest Elion and placed him on a ship. Two of his friends were arrested for speaking well of Cortez as well for good measure. In reaction to this, five men from Narvaez's camp then defected to Cortez. They were going to the nearby town of Villarica de la Veracruz. Well, technically one didn't make it. He was found by some Mexica who killed him. And that became more fodder for Narvaez. He accused Cortez of allowing the Mexica to realize that the Spanish weren't Tules, but were mortals. At any rate, the Mexica were keeping an eye on the coast in case more ships did show up. And as a result of this, Montezuma was aware of Narvaez's arrival in the form of drawings on cloth and cloth very early. He then sent runners directly to Narvaez. And he kept communicating with Narvaez in secret, 
which is exactly why Nervias had learned that Montezuma and Cortez did not see eye to eye, and is exactly how Nervias had known enough to had made his speech about going to Tenochtitlan to free the emperor. Narvaez stated that, unlike Cortez, he did not want gold. He simply wanted to capture the fugitive captain, and he was not going to kill anyone. He was simply going to colonize the land on the coast, and henceforth he should call himself Montezuma, and that Montezuma should call himself Narvaez. And if that sounds a little bit weird at the end, that's because Narvaez was familiar with customs in Hispaniola, wherein two leaders, traditionally in the Taino culture, would exchange names when they made an alliance. Well, Montezuma did not change his name. But he did send food and a golden medallion back to the coast, along with the message that Narvaez was welcome in Tenochtitlan. Only then, Montezuma finally let Cortez in on what he knew. He showed him the cotton cloth with the drawings on the ships. And this really alarmed Cortez, because at this point, his agents had reported ships, but only two of them. And so the realization that a much larger fleet was off the coast was uh, very worrisome. Montezuma cheerfully added that Cortez should leave, because, well, now that there are ships here, you could take all your folks back to go to Castile together, can't you? Well, Cortez wasn't interested in leaving, but the size of the fleet led him to believe that this was definitely sent from Velazquez and not from Spain. This was here from Me from to capture him in Mexico, and both sides, uh, Narvaez and Cortez, continued consolidating power. Now, the Totonacs ended up siding uh, with Narvaez. Um, even the fat chief, as Cortez learned, was more interested in siding with the armed Castilians nearby than Cortez, who was all the way in Tenochtitlan. However, Cortez was able to secure the loyalty of the citizens of Veracruz. He uh, got them to pledge their loyalty as the governor two days before agents of Narvaez arrived in the town and suggested that they join Narvaez. That request went unanswered. Narvaez appointed himself Captain General of Yucatan shortly after that, when when Cortez found out, he wrote a letter. It essentially stated, Hey, what gives? These lands are already co colonized, man. Narvaez did not reply to that. He held the position of superiority. He felt no need to answer Cortez. The Caudillo held a conference with his captains to discuss the situation. They asked, what, senor, does it seem to you we should do? Cortez' answer was, quote, death to him and to anyone who argues about the matter, unquote. Cortez did not know that Montezuma was in direct contact with Narvaez, and so he warmly embraced the emperor before leaving the city. He said he had to deal with the bad Spaniards on the coast so that they did not mistreat the Totonacs and the Mexica. Montezuma then offered an army of 100,000 warriors and 30,000 more to carry equipment. Cortez replied all he needed was the help of God. Marina insisted to Cortez that Montezuma's sadness was pretend. Cortez did not learn about Montezuma and Narvaez's relationship, though, not until he was on the way to the coast, and that made him pretty upset. He took the precaution... Therefore, when he arrived, of distributing gold amongst his men that he took before, he, you know, before they got into any battle, it was an obvious play at securing their loyalty shortly before he suspected they might be forced to fight other Spaniards. He also hinted at lavish rewards after this. He promised that after the con conquest that the men with him would be dukes and counts and lords or whatever. He sent also a message and read the requerimiento to Narvaez basically informing him that he was to surrender immediately, for the requerimiento governed both conquest and civil war in Spanish law, and that messenger was promptly arrested, and lucky for him, that's frankly all the punishment he received. Cortez arrived at the coast, but he did not immediately attack, and in fact doing so would have been pretty imprudent, uh, considering his force was a lot smaller than Narvaez. So instead, he spent several days scouting and spying on the encampment. 
dressing and painting men as Indians. They entered and stole two horses. He sent another man in with jewels to seduce, basically, as many of Nervinus's men into disloyalty as possible. The battle finally occurred on the night of May 28th, 29th, 1520. Cortez knew Narvaez would expect him at dawn, and in fact Narvaez had such an advantage in men and Indian allies, it seems that his overconfidence became his undoing. The Totonacs warned him on May 28th that Cortez and his camp had moved to within three miles of Narvaez. They stated they knew the captain, that he would attack at night. The warnings of the Totonacs were not believed by Narvaez and his agents, though, and in fact, Juan Bono de Cuejo even laughed at the suggestion. He scoffed, Do you take Cortesillo to be so brave that with the three cats which he commands he will come and attack us just because this fat chief says so? Cortesillo meaning little Cortez. It's extra insulting. The surprise night attack was a complete success. Nervaez was sleeping on top of a pyramid. He only awoke late in the battle when a sentry ran up the steps of the pyramid and informed him that Cortez was also climbing the pyramid. So Narvaez was still dressing himself for the attack, calling to arms, when his men also heard Cortez and his men shouting, Viva el Rey, Spirito Sancto. Many of Cortez's men had snuck up the steps of the pyramid with him. His horsemen were patrolling the foot of the pyramid to keep any potential reinforcements busy. And by the time Narvaez and his men had roused and armed themselves for combat, all they were all they were able to do was engage in something in the darkness that was confused, random, and brief. It ended quickly when Narvaez shouted, Holy Mary, protect me, for they have killed me and destroyed my eye. Narvaez surrendered, his temple headquarters burning around him, his eye gushing blood, and shortly thereafter he demanded to see a surgeon. He, the victory was expensive in loop. G Cortes had literally spent thousands of Castellanos in gold, maybe, or excuse me, thousands of pesos, maybe tens of thousands of pesos worth of gold and jewels bribing Narvaez's men. In particular, the arquebusiers of Narvaez shot high during the battle. Who knows how much that cost? The cannon seems to have been mysteriously plugged by beeswax that night. I'm sure that beeswax was pretty expensive too. But it wasn't expensive in men. At the end of the battle, 15 of Narvaez's men and only two of Cortez were dead. Even the much bloodied Narvaez himself lived to see another day, albeit wearing an eye patch. And in fact, Narvaez will come back into our story again, I think next episode, as well as part of, um, he is one of, part of one of the most bizarre incidents in the entire history of the Spanish conquests. As for Cortez, in victory, he immediately worked on securing the loyalty of Narvaez's force. He didn't necessarily work very hard at it, because most of those conquistadors were actually more than happy to switch sides. Like, oh, I can get more gold if I go with you? Excellent. Well, except for 40 unfortunate Castilians. Those members of the camp of Narvaez, after the battle, instead ended up getting captured by a Mexica army from the city of Texcoco, and they were later sacrificed. And this seems to have shocked Cortez, and even if you're thinking, hmm, maybe did he order the slaughter of Nerv some of Narvaez's loyalists? Well, I'll give you this. Cortez definitely is the type to do that, but some of his own loyalists were with that group, and they ended up getting killed and sacrificed to the Mexica gods as well, so I not, don't think that's true. As Cortez pondered why the Mexica in Texcoco would dare attack his men, messengers from Tenochtitlan arrived, that clued him into the situation abroad at Mexico that kind of started to explain things. Back in Tenochtitlan, another massacre had taken place. Not too dissimilar from what had occurred at Cholola. Cortez was hearing conflicting reports about who was responsible, but whatever happened, one thing was clear. His men in Tenochtitlan were now under siege at the palace. When Cortes had left Tenochtitlan, he placed Pedro de Alvarado 
in charge of about a hundred Castilians. Cortes mentioned nothing of any power struggle, and in fact he was purposefully misdirectional when he told Montezuma and the Mexica who he was riding off to face on the coast. Not that Cortes knew much about that either, of course, but he had a pretty good idea, and regardless he formed everyone, it was the Basques. 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 Evil Basques. Well, that seems to just have been a Cortes way of basically simplifying any discussion about who he was riding off to face, but to be honest, I can't see how blaming Bosques could have done possibly anything to lessen the mysteria and curiosity of the average citizen of Tenochtitlan after he left, because once he left, rumors abounded. Had Cortes died? And not to mention, of course, nobody in Mexico knew who the hell the Bosques were, so they were very mysterious. An energy of excitement coursed through the city. And as the city approached uh, one of the most important festivals in the Mexican calendar, too, the Feast of Tuxcato, Cortes himself had given permission to, for the Mexica to celebrate before he left. In earlier generations of Mesoamerica, the Feast of Tuxcato was, quote, one more plea for rain associated with the god Tezcatlipoca, unquote. Like all the holy days, though, of the, of the calendar, the Mexica attached their own beliefs to the holiday. And so, wherein in the past prayers and sacrifices might have been made to the god Tezcatlipoca, in Tenochtitlan, the Mexica celebrated instead by dressing up a young man like the god Tezcatlipoca and then sacrificing him to Huitzilopochtli. So we know that Montezuma asked for and received permission to hold the festival from Cortes, and we know also that Montezuma asked for and received permission again to hold the festival from Alvarado as the time drew nearer. What happens next is some matter of conjecture, especially considering Cortes already ordered a similar massacre at Cholula. I guess the unanswered question here is, did the Caudillo authorize what Alvarado does at the festival at Toxcatl? Did the Tlaxcalans go the Spanish into attack? I mean, there's just a couple of unknowns about what happened. Hugh Thomas states that the Tlaxcalan allies, quote, had bitter memories of previous festivals, fiestas of Toxcatl, when the Mexica had sacrificed many of their people, unquote, and so they probably started telling stories to the Spaniards about these horrors, how trouble was going to brew for them during this upcoming festival, and at the same time, the Mexica did stop feeding the Castilians, too. Now, it's likely that feeding 5,000 or more soldiers a day eventually exhausted the food reserves of even Tenochtitlan, uh, and But when one of the young girls who did the Castilian's laundry and cleaning argued against this food stoppage, she said that even conquistadors had to eat, well, the next morning she was found hanged. Probably something done to frighten off any other Mexica from serving the Castilians. Now, food was still available. It's just that the Spaniards had to go to the market and buy it for themselves. Alvarado had one of his followers accomplish this daily in the market. According to Alvarado, one morning, though, he went out to the Great Square a few days before the celebration was due to take place, and someone, presumably a Tosh Kalan, pointed out some stakes in the ground and told him that the Mexica intended to sacrifice the Castilians after tying them up to those stakes. You know, that big one over there, that's for you, Alvarado. The Tosh Kalan presumably said something like that. At any rate, Another conquistador testified he saw many pots, pans, and axes being prepared, and that the Indians told him they were getting ready to cook and eat the Spaniards with garlic. Well, apparently, Alvarado decided he needed to inspect things further. He certainly didn't like the fact that there were effigies to Hitzlapochtli, Tlaloc, and Tezcatlipoca, which had recently been built and were being carried around on leaders. Quetzalcoatl carried four arrows in one hand, by the way, and the other was a paper banner dripped in blood, reminding everyone that Quetzalcoatl was a war god and to Alvarado specifically it seemed like devil worship. 
Suspicious though the Spaniards were, however, the show must go on, as they say. The religious festival began with a procession of people entering the great square, starting with those who'd fasted. Many Mexica girls fasted for 20 days before this festival, and so too did especially penitent men. They had fasted for an entire year. Next to enter the square were the captains of prior Mexican wars. They entered in their uniforms, dressed and painted. Along came sacrificial victims, likewise prepared in uniform and officially painted. Now, officially, there was a Spanish edict forbidding human sacrifice, and under that edict, Alvarado took three of those prisoners, likely war captives and not Mexica, and who, instead of being sacrificed, um were sort of had something uh, kind this is kind of a out of the fire in, out of the kettle into the fire sort of thing uh, we'll get into this here soon beyond that alvarado immediately had them taken to his quarters these uh, slaves that he had quote unquote freed the captives were tortured alvarado separated them and placed burning evergreen logs on their stomachs in or in effort to force them to tell him what was being planned one of the three refused confession. The Spaniards gave up only after hours of torture, mind you, and they ended up throwing him off of a roof. I'm sure he wished he had just had his fucking heart cut off and be done with cart cut out and be done with it, and that's just what happened, I guess. And this, mind you, just to be clear, this is the Spanish account of what happens. Now, the other two confessions are very difficult to take seriously. Because basically, Alvarado had the interpreter ask a series of questions like, do they say that they are going to make war in 10 days? Yes, sir, being the inevitable reply. Just take the fucking burn off my stump, burning log off my stomach already. Regardless, after securing these confessions of dubious merit, Alvarado went to, quote, that dog of a Montezuma who doesn't treat me as he used to, unquote. But the emperor merely stated... Since he was imprisoned, he couldn't do anything. The Flash Collins, meanwhile, continued to work on Alvarado's paranoia. One Flash Collins warrior reportedly told him he saw the Mexica preparing ladders that were suspicious in that they were exactly the same size as the walls of this palace. They weren't normal-sized ladders. Another told him that he was pretty sure... I could hear something. It sounds like the Mexica are boring holes in the rear walls of the palace to me. Well, by that evening, I'm not sure what Alvarado's exact state of mind was. And Alvarado was no Cortez. He wasn't subtle. Um, he wasn't the sort of person like Cortez who was going to be able to raise the morale and find allies. He was perfectly capable of enacting plans and being brutal and effective in combat. He just wasn't the strategist that Cortez was. And it, tensions were high for him, but tensions were also probably high for the Mexica. The persistent humiliation they undoubtedly had received... Um, the tensions were high on probably both sides, so it wouldn't be surprising at all if there was some sort of plot going on. And the Mexica maybe were boring holes into the palace or whatever, but on the other hand, there just isn't any testimony of the conquistadors who were there um, other than the... Excuse me, there is no evidence other than the testimony of conquistadors that any such plot was envisioned. Um... It seems likely that the Flash Collins noticed that Alvarado was getting paranoid and maybe that he was more prone to anger than Cortez. And so they just gave him the right kind of nudge that led him to seek out some violent action. Another conquistador, Francisco Alvarez Chico, one of Cortez's closest friends, mind you, also reportedly insisted to Alvarado, however, that the Spaniards simply must attack first. And that's the sort of thing, though, that makes you go, hmm. Well, maybe Cortez did know what was going to happen. I mean, probably not, but maybe. I mean, but probably not. I mean, but maybe. Anyway, the first days of the fiesta took place without further incident. Until May 16th, 1520, the sacred dancing with the 
associated with the festival then began in the precinct of the great temple. Dancers slowly filled the square, flutes and drums playing as the event started. It was an incredible assemblage of noblemen. And they began to dance, one song after another, rising in waves, according to Sahagun's informants. Probably about 400 people were dancing, and thousands of more of the nobility, though, stood to the side, clapping or otherwise participating in, in a way like that. Now, the Spaniards thought some dances of the Mexica were, quote, better than the Zambra of the Moors, unquote, which was the best dance in Spain. But others offended their Christian sensibilities. Such was this, the tickling or scratching dance what was witnessed that night, which featured, quote, so many wriggles and glances and indecent coquetry, unquote, that to one Spanish observer it seemed at least a dance for wanton women and susceptible men, unquote. During the ritual ecstasy of the dance, the Castilians, led by Alvarado, arrived in the square, fully in their armor, with swords and shields. The Mexica, of course, did nothing but keep dancing, and what were they going to do? At the moment, they were participating in one of the most important religious festivals in the world. So even if they were armed for battle, it seems unlikely they would have just stopped dancing just uh, at the sight of armed Spaniards, a not entirely uncommon sight in Tenochtitlan. The Spaniards moved to block the three entrances to the square, their ta Lashkalan allies amongst them, about ten Spaniards posted at each entrance. Alvarado and the others of his men mixed in with the crowd. He divided his men so that the sixty, so that sixty guarded Montezuma, and had the task of killing his attendant lords. The other sixty had come to the temple with him to kill the Mexica nobility as they danced. Only one Spaniard later claimed to have said they should not engage with this plot, that it was evil, that it was, and that was Velasquez de Tapia, though no other witnesses, for what it's worth, reported on this, who reported on this incident anyway, recall him speaking his mind, for what it's worth. Um... Friar Juan Diaz, who is there, and who you might expect to be a voice of morality for the Spaniards, was noticeably quiet about the plot. Now, Alvarado had the gates of the temple closed and gave the command, Mueran, Spanish for let them die. He and his men then fell on the dancers. They began with the young military captain, designated as the leader of the dance. Next, Castilian swords turned on the priests who were playing the drums. The informants of Sahagun reported, quote, they surrounded those who danced. They went among the drums. They struck off the arms of the one who beat the drums, and afterwards his neck and his head flew off, falling far away. They pierced them all with their iron lances, and they struck each with the iron swords. Of some, they slashed open the back, and there their entrails fell out. Of some, they split the head. They hacked their heads to pieces. Their heads were completely cut up. And of some, they hit the shoulder. They struck it in the shank, on the thigh. Of some, they struck the belly. And then the entrails streamed forth. Unquote. So the conquistadors busied themselves in that butchery of human flesh, in a not-so-dissimilar way that the Meshach priests did, to be honest. Only one of the conquistadors present did not bloody his sword by attacking helpless dancers. That was one man who was instead too busy hacking off the golden nose of the statue of Huitzilopochtli. One, uh, excuse me, once most of the dancers were dead, Alvarado turned his attention on the spectators. None of the Mexica were armed, and they were taken completely by surprise. Only a few managed to climb the walls and flee, and a f lucky few more feigned death and thus escaped by lying amongst the deceased in the ground. Most, however, died in terror. The blood of the chieftains ran like water. It spread out slippery, and a foul odor rose from it, according to one native source. One of the priests tried to rally. Mexicans. Are we not going to war? Have confidence, he reportedly cried out, grabbed some pine sticks to hand out so he and the others could fight. Of course, 
Those makeshift wooden clubs made little headway against the armored Spanish. The counterattack was cut to pieces, just like everyone else. One conquistador was buying food at the market when the slaughter began, and when he returned, he found a stream of wounded Indians escaping the temple district, which the Castilians were sacking. He asked Alvarado how they would get food now. Alvarado replied, The devil take the food. We have taken action. As the Indians did not take the first step, we have done so ourselves. He then continued to explain and the situation to the newly arrived Spaniard by stating that two or three thousand Indians were dead and that he who begins the battle wins. Soon after the slaughter, the drums of war were played. Atop the great pyramid, all the leaders of the various Calputin of the city summoned all males for military duty. The male citizenry went thus to the armories of the city and received weapons. And what surviving leaders of the Mexica were around directed the counterattack. O Mexica, O chieftains, hasten here, let us prepare our weapons, shields, and arrows. Hasten here. Already many chieftains have died. They have been shattered, destroyed, put to death. O Mexica, O chieftains. Alvarado himself was wounded on the head by a stone during the counterattack. The Castilians re afterwards retreated to their quarters. They found that the conquistadors guarding Montezuma had accomplished their task. Many of the lords accompanying Montezuma had, were now dead, and when Alvarado returned, he angrily stormed before the emperor. He was covered in blood from the wound of the stone which hit his head. See what your people have done to me! was the outrageous remark to come from his mouth. Montezuma replied, calmly, Alvarado, if you had not begun it, my men would not have done this. You've ruined yourself, and me also, unquote. Now I want to point out specifically what I just described is the conquistador's version of events. Uh, so they come out looking really bad, even if we believe the claims of the Mexica plot. Uh, several indigenous codexes also describe the events and do not mention any such plot by the Mexica. Uh, they just mention uh, a religious festival. This is how Sahagun described uh, what his formants told him what happened as the last of the participants, the recruits, entered the square. Quote, the others called to them, Come, comrades, show us how brave you are. Dance with all your hearts. At this moment in the fiesta, when the dance was loveliest and when song was linked to song, the Spaniards were urged, seized with an urge to kill the celebrants. They all ran forward, armed as if for battle. They closed the entrances and passageways, all the gates of the patio, the eagle gate and the lesser palace, the gate of the cane stalk, and the gate of the serpent of mirrors. They posted guards so that no one could escape, and then rushed into the sacred patio to slaughter the celebrants. They came on foot, carrying their swords and their wooden or metal shields. They ran in the dancer at the dancers, forcing their way to the place where the drums were played. They attacked the man who was drumming, and cut off his arms, and they cut off his head, and it rolled across the floor. They attacked all the celebrants, stabbing them, spearing them, striking them with their swords. They attacked some of them from behind, and these fell instantly to the ground. With their entrails hanging out, others they beheaded. They cut off their heads or split their heads into pieces. They struck others in the shoulders, and their arms were torn away from their bodies. They wounded some in the thigh and in the calf. They slashed others in the abdomen, and their entrails all spilled to the ground. Some attempted to run away, but their intestines dragged as they ran. Some seemed to tangle their feet in their own entrails. No matter how they tried to save themselves, they could find no escape. Some attempted to force their way out, but the Spaniards murdered them at the gates. Others climbed the walls, but could not save themselves. Those who ran in the communal houses were safe for a while. So were those who lay down among the victims and pretended to be dead. But if they stood up again, 
The Spaniards saw them and killed them. The blood of the warriors flowed like water and gathered into pools. The pools widened, and the stench of blood and entrails filled the air. The Spaniards ran into the communal houses and killed those who were hiding. They ran everywhere and searched everywhere. They invaded every room, hunting and killing, unquote. In response to the massacre, Mexica warriors attempted to storm the palace. They began setting fire to the door, but the Tlaxcalans proved capable of holding the entrances to the palace. The native allies wet their own cloaks and set them on the flames to prevent the Mexica from burning the army out. They did succeed in burning the four brigantines, however, which meant that Alvarado and his men were trapped. Besides the military loss of the ships... Ultimately, Alvarado stuck his dagger against Montezuma's chest and ordered him to ask his men to retreat. He did that, along with another Spanish captive, the governor of Tlatelolco, a man named Itzquahitzin. They did their best to stop the combat and largely succeeded, though not entirely. Sporadically, groups continued to assault the palace after Alvarado and the Spaniards were saved, but this was a crucial mistake on the part of the Mexica, or, if you prefer, a critical failure by Montezuma, however you want to call it. Had Montezuma not made that speech, which incidentally would have meant Alvarado stabbing him in the chest with a dagger, all the Castilians and Tlaxcalans and Tenochtitlan would have been destroyed. Instead, as outraged as some of the Mexica were, they had trouble getting organized because of the emperor's call for peace. A big part of Montezuma's argument apparently was that because so many warriors had been killed by Alvarado and the Spanish inside, well, it just simply made sense for everyone to stop fighting, right? That made the citizens of Tenochtitlan so furious that while they mainly obeyed, something akin to a modern constitutional crisis immediately occurred afterwards. And ultimately, in fact, Montezuma did not recover his authority as a result. Because when the Mexica realized that soon after uh, they stopped assaulting the palace, that they would have destroyed the Spaniards in the city had they not stopped fighting, the entire city began to view Montezuma and as a coward. He was unfit to rule. One commander, who did not die, obviously, at the Fiesta of Tixcoatl, in response to hearing Montezuma's command that because his warriors are dead that people should stop fighting against Alvarado, scoffed. He replied, What saith Montezuma, O fool? Am I not one of his warriors? Eight days of mourning followed this battle. The Mexica had been grievously wounded by the Spaniards' attack, but they were not at all interested in giving up their culture. And after a loss like this, eight days of mourning followed. Careful attention was paid to the religious duties of the city as far as sending the dead into the afterlife. Like all Mexica battles, that meant a mass cremation of the dead warriors. But unlike any other battle previously fought by Mexica armies, this one took place in the great square of Tenochtitlan itself. Now, during this time, Alvarado and his men were trapped. There was no more going to the market to procure food, and any time the Mexica were persuaded, any of the Mexica were persuaded to deliver food, the Mexica army killed that person immediately. Only Juan Alvarez, the man who had been getting the food, was able to secretly go out and get some at night, since he knew where to get it. But several bridges in the city were, had been pulled up, and the streets were practically impassable. So, other than getting food secretly at night, the Spaniards were completely stuck. At nights, the city howled. The flower of the Mexica nobility was dead. Thousands of young men, who had all gone through the best Kalmakaks, who were raised to be proud of their land, their government, and their people's achievements. Men who had been raised to rule an empire. This was a huge chunk of Tenochtitlan's future, and it was simply wiped away. 
Cortez and his force, meanwhile, rushed back to the city and arrived before the end of the eight days of mourning, which helps explain, in part, the quiet of the city that they faced. But in addition, a boycott had been issued against the Spaniards, by whom exactly is unclear, but it wasn't Montezuma. And so most of the Mexica simply hid from the Spaniards. They would not speak to Cortez or his men, and merely looked at them from behind their walls. Montezuma, in fact, was the only friendly Mexica left for the Spaniards. He'd offered up another palace to Cortez to accommodate the additional men he'd brought back, which had come back on Nervares' fleet. And as for Alvarado and his men, they were nearly starved to death, so they were fucking delighted to see Cortez. And it might stun you to learn, though, Cortez did not punish Alvarado. Alvarado apparently suggested that Cortez pretend to be angry with him. Excuse me. Frankly, like I said, it isn't clear if Cortez even really understood who was responsible. Perhaps he believed Montezuma and Narvaez had hatched some sort of plot, or alternatively, perhaps Cortez even ordered the attack himself. But, however, Alvarado did get into motion after this, and afterwards the more reliable, industrious, and less flamboyant Sandoval replaced Alvarado as essentially Cortez's right-hand man. He showed... That is, Cortez showed, however, considerable anger towards Montezuma, who would he would not speak to unless, quote, that dog of a Montezuma gave him 20,000 Castellanos, unquote. Cortez needed Montezuma alive, but it was also his to his benefit to isolate and terrify the emperor. Cortez's great hope was to keep the city and the emperor, empire together. He needed it, the, he, he wanted to hand it as a gift to his emperor, Charles V, and so it was to the Caudillo's benefit that he keep Montezuma alive, but also very much dependent upon him. And if Montezuma was afraid, well, he was going to stay dependent. It's a good strategy. Um, but when Cortez finally offered, did went to see Montezuma and told him he needed to open up the markets, the now much reduced emperor told Cortez well, that was beyond his power closed markets uh, meant that Cortez couldn't show the hundreds of men who'd arrived with Narvaez about how wealthy they could all become. Cortez had to compromise, and now it was his turn to make a big mistake. He told Montezuma to choose one of his nobles, one of them who was still alive, that, and there weren't many, that he needed to go open the market. Montezuma selected his brother, Quitlahuac, lord of Itz Itzapalapa, to be freed, and then accomplish this task of reopening the market. Quitlahuac had unsuccessfully argued, incidentally, to Montezuma from the beginning that he should attack the Spaniards, long before Cortez ever reached Tenochtitlan, by the way, and the instant he was free, he began to organize significant resistance, and he was also promptly elected the new emperor. It's not clear if Montezuma understood that this would be the result when he selected his brother, but regardless, later that same day that Quitlahag was freed, June 15, 25th, 1520, the Mexica made several attacks against the Castilians, at which point Cortez realized, perhaps I have made a mistake. Cortez sent out 300 men, parading about with the Spanish flag in an attempt to correct this error and to calm the Mexica, and that resulted in a battle. Four or five Spaniards were killed, and their commander, Diego de Ordaz, was wounded, along with 80 of the men dispatched. Battles like this continued for several days, as the Castilians set out to secure nearby residences, but each night they withdrew, uh, and each night the Mexico retook whatever positions they had lost. Now, additionally alarming to Cortez was that the Mexica were now fighting in altogether new ways than what was first experienced when the Spaniards first landed in Mexico. One big difference was that the Mexica leaders no longer wore tunics made of princely feathers from the white heron bird. In this evolving new urban war, it was now much more difficult to spot Mexica leadership. Cortez decided he needed to modify his tactics as well. On June 26th, the Caudillo ordered the construction of three mantelets, a 
basically a 16th century tank made out of wood that could house and protect 20 or 25 men, which would be carrying arquebusiers, arquebusiers and crossbows, as well as a few pikes and axes. It, it was basically a type of siege engine used in Europe previously, and it was proposed that the mantelets could move through the city by being carried around by Tash Collins, while the Spaniards inside could shoot through the loopholes or toss fire out onto the roofs of the houses. And as the war machines were being constructed, 12 Mexica lords, dressed in feathers and finery, uh, approached the, court, the palace. When Cortes saw them, he asked Montezuma to go with Marina to see who the men were, since one of them was being treated with a special reverence. The emperor looked and stated it appeared to him that Quitlahuac had been elected as emperor. But Montezuma said he didn't want to go talk to the Aztecs like Cortes asked. He bemoaned instead, What more does Malinche want of me? I neither wish to live nor listen to him, for to such a pass have I become because of him. Unquote. And uh, so, Cor Cortes would be called Malinche as the master of Malinche, by the way. Still, after enough convincing, apparently, Montezuma did go to the roof to speak, and what happens next is disputed. Cortes says that Montezuma looked down at the Mexica from the roof, and then a hail of stones issued forth from the Mexica, and though two Castilians attempted to shield the emperor, one stone stuck him right in the head before he could even begin speaking. According to some of the conquistadors, a moment of silence took place when Montezuma made himself visible. And as he began to speak, he mentioned that it was his will to live with the Spaniards and that there was no reason for war since the Castilians had promised to leave soon. Some of those sources report that one noble in particular called back in response to Montezuma's words, what is it which is being said by that scoundrel of a Montezuma, horror of the Spaniards? Does he think that he can call to us with his woman-like soul to fight for the empire which he has abandoned out of fright? We did not want to obey him, because he is already no longer our monarch. And indeed, we must give him the punishment which we give to a wicked man. Afterwards, a shower of stones, arrows, and darts rained from the sky, and the emperor was hit three times in the chest and hastily taken below. Now, I should also point out, some indigenous sources dispute this claim entirely, and they say that Montezuma was assassinated by the Spaniards after the Aztecs refused to heed his words and was not killed by projectiles launched. Either way, it does appear that Montezuma refused treatment. However he got his wounds, he preferred to die than to live. Now, Cortes was furious. His plans to rule Tenochtitlan via turning Montezuma into a puppet were over forever. And uh, when his three war machines were finished, he marched them around the city, but so many defenders attacked them with stones that the engines were nearly destroyed very quickly and forced back to the palace as a result. Daily skirmishes continued, and at one point, Cortes himself was nearly tossed off the top of a pyramid he'd assaulted. Before that, he was wounded badly in the hand. Montezuma, meanwhile, died on the morning of June 30th. At any rate, the Castilians began to get increasingly nervous about wanting to escape. Even if Cortes at first stated he would sooner be cut to pieces than leave the city, but all of his captains opposed him, and on June 24th, his astronomer, in, uh, Botello was his name, informed him that if they didn't leave that night, they were all going to be killed. Well, the idea was to leave at night, to escape undetected. But there was a question about what to do about all the treasure, and that took a substantial amount of planning. They were not able to leave until July 1st, 1520. They left at midnight. A vanguard of 200 men went in front, along with a small gathering of important mistresses like Marina and the priests. 
Next came Cortez uh, with the bulk of his army, and in the rear, 60 horsemen. The vanguard carried a portable wooden bridge. They crossed the first four bridges without incident. But then a woman going to get water saw them. She called out, Mexica, come quickly. Our enemies are leaving now that it is night. They are running away as fugitives. A few minutes later, a priest gave the command from atop the temple of Huitzilopochtli. Mexican chiefs, your enemies are leaving. Run to your canoes of war. The male population thus roused itself from sleep and in anger and confusion. The battle that followed was one in which the Mexica did not follow their normally strict adherence to capturing enemies. Alva Itzachcotl was an indigenous conquistador who wrote an account of the conquest. He reported that when the Mexica were roused, the boatmen paddled with all their might. They lashed the water until of the lake until it boiled. The cannon, many of the horses, and much of the gold was lost after the canoes began attacking. The Spaniards were forced to cross without bridges. Many drowned. One canal became so full of dead Spaniards, Tlaxcalans, and horses that those who came last across the channel were able to cross over a bridge of their dead comrades. Much is uncertain about that night, except one fact. The Castilians who set off with gold, with more gold, I should say, were weighed down, and they were more likely to be killed than those who did not. The worst fate was for those in the rear guard. As many as 270 Castilians were forced to retreat back, unable to cross a causeway. They held out for a day or two before they were captured. Then they were defeated by hunger. All were sacrificed. All in all, probably 600 Castilians were lost or killed that night or sacrificed on a subsequent night, along with several thousand plush columns. The Spanish call it El Noche Triste, the night of sadness. Despite this defeat, perhaps Cortes deserves some credit for remarkable determination. During this horrible night, he reportedly responded to reports of his losses with just one statement, a question. Did his shipbuilder, Martin Lopez, still live? The answer was yes. Lopez, like many, was badly wounded, but he was alive. Well, let us go, for we lack nothing, Cortez responded cheerfully. The march to Tlaxcala was not cheerful, however. Even if the next two nights were spent in with relative uneventful, uh, uneventfully uh, as they went north and were at least able to obtain some food, the third night was spent continuing going north from Tenochtitlan to the city of Sitaltepec. By this point, sporadic Mexica attacks were going on. Cortez was wounded in the head. Another attack that day killed a horse. That third night, unlike the first two, there were no rations to be found, and as they continued, many villages were unfriendly. As they turned around the northern shores to the lake and began heading east towards Tlaxcala, sometimes grass was the only food. Afterwards, it seems that Quitlahuac, the new emperor, made another attempt to end the Castilians. He sent a large force under the command of his deputy to fight the Spaniards. The battle took hours. Luckily for the Castilians, though, the Mexica returned now to using their tactics of capturing, of fighting to capture first, kill lighter. As such, only a few Castilians died as the battle went on. On the other hand, the Mexica army was massive and was able to surround Cortes' force completely. The Cardillo was forced to take desperate and decisive action, since the morale of the Spaniards began to wane. In the distance, Cortes could see several Mexican captains. They had their fine costumes on, stood out. He brought with him five horsemen and rode out through the ranks of the Mexica. They surprised the commanders. 
Those heavy costumes weren't exactly designed for speed either, but to appear frightening. Cortez knocked one commander over, and one of his other horsemen promptly killed him with his lance, then swept up the commander's plumage and standard. The loss of that leader, and perhaps even more, the loss of that standard, swung the tide of the battle. The Mexica army, without its battle standard, is a lot like a ship without a rudder. And the Mexica army floundered. It, it, they retired in disorder, and, uh, and once again, on the verge of victory, the Aztecs were just unable to follow through with the destruction of the Spaniards. After the battle, Cortez and his men were able to nurse their wounds, at which point Cortez made probably the most unpopular decision he ever made. He stood before his men, weak, wounded, and nearly starving, and he told them that each of them, right then and there, under pain of death, needed to immediately hand over their gold, either to himself or to Pedro de Alvarado, in order to replenish the expeditions of the, the coffers' expeditions. Apparently, 45,000 pesos worth of gold was thus, quote-unquote, recovered from the stunned army by this theft. Although, with that said, apparently a lot of conquistadors also refused the order. The men apparently weren't in the mood to hand over their newly won wealth after all they had been through. Just because Cortez started thinking about all the gold he'd lost in the canals of Tenochtitlan during El Noche Triste. The Tlaxcalans began to think, too. What were they going to do now that their war party was back on the way to Tlaxcala? In part because the Mexica Emperor Quitlahuac offered the Tlaxcalans a new alliance. And as a result, the two sides of Tlaxcalan leadership, those who wanted to continue siding with the Spanish and those who wished to join this alliance with the Mexica, almost came to blows when they debated it. One leader, Maxix Zacatzin, pushed another, Zigotancatl the Younger, down a flight of stairs. Eventually, they came to a compromise, and that was that the Tlaxcalans, though, would support Cortez, but a hard bargain would be made for this continued support. First, they wanted the Castilians to guarantee that they would hand over the city of Cholula to the Tlaxcalans. Second, after the fleet of the Mexica, Tlaxcala would be allowed to command a special fortress in Tenochtitlan, which the Tlaxcalans alone would man, in order to permanently guarantee against any future attacks. Third, they wanted to divide any booty gained by the conquest of Tenochtitlan, and finally, they wanted perpetual freedom from paying tribute for whoever ruled that city in the future. Cortez to do nothing but agree to those terms, and in return he was warmly received back into Tlaxcalan lands. The army uh, and its continued assistance was so important, in fact, to Cortez that he, uh, he would have paid nearly any price for the continued alliance. And I want to be completely clear here, if not for the impact of smallpox and other disease, these capitulations forced upon Cortez by the Tlaxcalans would have meant that the end of the conquest would have possibly ended in more of a Tlaxcalan victory than a Spanish one. At any rate, the army spent three days in at the Tlaxcalan town of Hoyetlatan, where the Spaniards were well received and the bargain was struck. That gave the Tlaxcalans rights to Cholula if the conquest is successful and the fortress in Tenochtitlan. Now, in 1529, an inquiry against Tor against Cortes will take place, and this incident is specifically will be questioned. But Cortes was absolved of any guilt for having up offered those capitulations under the reasoning that if the natives of Tlaxcala had risen up against the Spanish, they would have all been killed because many of the Spaniards were wounded and had been badly injured. The conquistador served as chief smelter of metals, Antonio de Benavidas, testified and continued, no Spaniard would have escaped the Mexica. There was nowhere else to go. After three days at Huetleoptitlapan, the Castilians went to Tlaxcala proper and spent 20 days there resting, the same amount of time they'd spent the year before, and probably around the same amount of time for which that city had reserves of food that could be used to feed such an army. Cortes and many others recovered. Four more men, however, died of their wounds, and many lived with injuries for much longer periods, and in fact, some for the rest of their lives. Cortes, uh, too, he would suffer head headaches for the rest of his life, and he blamed the head wound he suffered in the march from Tenochtitlan. 
Quitlihuac, meanwhile, made another attempt at recruiting a powerful ally, the Tarascans, another empire in what is now northwest Mexico. Uh, he sent messengers to see the leader there, Zhuangua, the Cazoni, or monarch of the Tarascans, but Zhuangua merely received the gifts of the Mexica, returned them with gifts of his own, but as for the offer of a military alliance, he said, What purpose would I have in sending my soldiers to help Mexico? We have always been at war when we approach each other. There is rancor between us. We must be ca take care, lest this be a trick. They may want to have vengeance on us by killing us through treachery. No, Tarascan soldiers would be going to Tenochtitlan. So if there was a realistic way for the Mexica to retain their empire, this was probably it. But the Tarascans were not interested. Hugh Thomas says that the Zangua was probably confident that his people's superior metallurgy was going to enable him to remain victorious. The Tarascans were fewer in Mexico, that were fewer in number than the Mexica, but every Mexica army ever sent against the Tarascans failed, and often they did so spectacularly. The Tarascans maintained a well-defended border um, with defensive fortifications, and while they did not use iron, they were very capable metalsmiths who sometimes did use copper as weapons. More on them, of course, in the episode Blood Oath, if you haven't checked that out. At any rate, though the Spaniards found food and shelter and could heal from their wounds, some were very angry. Cortes nearly had a rebellion on his hand yet again as a result of his random gold tax, so he had to make uh, amends, and he did so apparently with what was a very good speech, or at least a speech wherein he promised he had a really great idea, because he was able to disquiet this content under him, at least for some time, probably because he started mainly talking in the speech about how he intended to attack the nearby hilltop fortress of Tipiaca, the Mexica center of tribute for the nearby region, and which seemed like a great place to recover some treasure. The Castilians immediately began preparing for the assault. Tepiaca collected tribute each year as follows. 4,000 loads of lime, 4,000 loads of thick canes, 8,000 loads of arrow canes, 200 frames for carrying goods on one's back, and some of the older citizens still remembered being conquered by the Aztecs in the first place. So Cortes intended on striking against an integral part of the empire, and also one that could possibly make him a lot of allies in the process, and the battle went quickly. Cortes only had about 500 Castilians remaining at this point, 17 horses and 6 crossbowmen, and he had to leave several of the wounded men behind. Uh, but he left with no fewer than 2,000 plush common warriors, and two days after sending a message wherein he demanded the city surrender, he attacked. He moved quickly to the center of the town, while the Tlash Collins began grabbing Tiapacans off the streets into Mesoamerican slavery. And between the Tlash Collins and the horses, the city surrendered quickly, and Cortez was harsh in victory. He enslaved the wives and children of all those who were killed in battle or afterwards, something he had not done at previously. He branded those slaves, too, by having a hot iron pressed against their cheeks. Each of these branded slaves was sold for ten pesos and sold into in Caribbean encomenderos. As for the men, some Tiapacans were lanced or piked to death after the surrender in an indiscriminate fashion. Others were torn to pieces by dogs. Cortes justified this by saying that the people had rebelled against Emperor Charles V, which is preposterous. At any rate, the Talash Collins took also many slaves, though the condition did not automatically go to your children, uh, so at least those slaves were a little luckier, most of them, not the group that was selected from amongst the captives of the Talash Collins to be sacrificed and eaten, mind you. Cortes, of course, turned a blind, a blind eye to this, one conquistador, Diego de Avila, even went so far as to allege that during the conquest of Tepeyaca, Cortes himself had personally thrown Indians off a roof so that the flash columns could blow, could take and eat them. There were even rumors in the aftermath of the battle that some Spaniards celebrated with the flash columns by tasting the flesh of the sacrifices. Well, 
the bloodlust of Cortez and his army thus sated. The Cordillo went around to conquer the surrounding province, and more atrocities followed. One city, Quechula, decided not to fight, and when about 2,000 men from the city came to Cortez at his command, he had them executed. Afterwards, 4,000 women and children were enslaved from that city. Similar atrocities occurred at Izucar, another town, which accepted fealty to Charles V once the Spanish and Tlaxcalans columns arrived, yet still faced pillage and enslavement. Other towns, such as Tecamachalco and Acapetla Huacan, were similar to the reduced slaughter, enslavement, branding, and sacrificial cannibalism. Enemies of Cortes later stated that between 15 and 20,000 were killed or enslaved in Tepeyaca and its surrounding environs, and that a similar number was given to the Tlaxcalans. Cortes, in his letters, gave a rather bland account of these battles. He stated merely that the people had rebelled against the king and that matter-of-factly reported, quote, I have made certain of them slaves. I gave a fifth part to your majesty's officers for they are all cannibals. I was also moved to take those slaves so as to strike fear into the Mexicans, and because there are so many people that, are, that if I did not impose a great and cruel punishment, they would never be in reformed, unquote. There's a lot to admire about Hernan Cortez as far as his ability to strategize, his daring, his ingenuity, but man, he is a real shithead. Other Spaniards had to say uh, little. Even Bernal Diaz stated almost nothing of the battles, and Hugh Thomas tells us that, quote, Friar Aguilar seems to have been especially forgetful, writing just one single sentence, quote, Tepeyaca gave fealty to the Spanish king without offering resistance, unquote. Huh. Now, that's funny that he would say that. Cortez reported it took 20 days to reduce Tepeyaca and his provinces. I think it's likely that the Spaniards were ashamed of this genocide. At any rate, Cortes had recently come so close to defeat after El Noche Triste, and considering there was no action, which he was not prepared to take, uh, that this was just what he did to reconsolidate his power to achieve victory. The Mexica did what they could to prepare for another eventual return by Cortes. More fortifications were built. So, too, were long lances built. Uh, uh, cut for usage against cavalry, the same kind they saw Cortes make prior to his leaving for battle against Narvaez. But there were disadvantages. They didn't know when that these defense would be needed. And in some ways, it seems that Tenochtitlan still wasn't as concerned about defense as it should be. It was also concerned about restoring its wealth and prestige. A great amount of effort was spent rebuilding the great temples and returning the idol to their own place the idols to their places and getting rid of the Spanish shrine to the Virgin Mary and St. Christopher and this was all probably important for morale, but maybe not necessarily all that helpful for the war effort. Cortez prepared as well. He set Martin Lopez to the task of building more ships. And then the Cordillo went to visit Maxix Katzen, his ally in the Totanic government, who was also dying of smallpox. Now, we're not going to be getting fully into the impact of smallpox until next episode, but the disease was already beginning to have a massive impact in the New World. Thus far, the disease had spread from Hispaniola, starting in 1518, first through the Caribbean and via a certain Francisco de Ejuya, a black porter on the Narvaez expedition, uh, and that is how smallpox reached the mainland. Now, wherever Narvaez stopped in the Yucatan, basically, the result as such was that smallpox had a devastating effect on the local Maya. The Totonacs were next to be struck by the disease. Native remedies for illnesses in, in, consisted mainly of alternating baths of hot and cold water. That has absolutely no effect on smallpox. And they also liked to rub the herb bitumen on their sores. That was custom. Similarly, no effect at small on smallpox. Um, now, 
Native Americans suffered from gout and cancer and paralysis and stomach disorders. They could become blind or lame or break bones. They had all sorts of treatments for these infirmities. And when they fell ill, they called for priests or sorcerers, medicine men, to uh, apply cure, cures and hallucinogenic plants or tobacco. But th th there was no viruses that existed in Mexico prior to smallpox. And some new cure was effective. And in fact, the medicine men who called in to help the cure, simply caught the disease themselves. They became vectors and themselves would fall ill. The Mexica describes smallpox as the loss of their soul. Many believed gods were punishing them for whatever imagined blasphemy they believed they had committed. Yet while religious ceremonies might be conducted to appease the gods, no prayers were capable of stopping the spread of the smallpox virus. Town after town in Mexico became depopulated. In many places, there was no way to collect the corpses. Officials began burying people by bringing the homes down to collapse around the deceased inside. Hugh Thomas writes, quote, The smell was almost as bad as the despair, the suffering far greater than anything which the con conquerors had previously wrought. Those who did not die but who had caught the disease frightened the survivors merely by showing the pits all over their faces and bodies, and in some place, half the population seems to have died. Famine often followed. Unquote. In September 1520, the disease reached Chalco in the Valley of Mexico. For 70 days, the plague devastated the city. Farmers and serfs died, so too did kings and noblemen. By late October, the disease reached Tenochtitlan. Tenochtitlan, Montezuma's successor, the war-ready Quitlehuac, was amongst those killed. He died quickly, so even his royal name has been forgotten. So too were his looks and his character. Unlike Montezuma, we know almost nothing about him, except that he was against being friendly to from the Castilians from the beginning, that he inspired an attack on the night of their retreat, El Noche Triste. But he was unable to follow up on that success and crush Cortez on the road from Tenochtitlan back to Tlaxcala. And finally, that he left behind a wife, a son, and two daughters. The king of Tacuba died as well. He was Montezuma's father-in-law. So too did the Ch king of Chalco. So too did Zengua, ruler of the Tarascans. The borders of his empire proved insufficient for Den for defending against smallpox. In contrast, most Castilians by adulthood had already contracted smallpox and had either lived or died as a child from the disease. And in fact, by adulthood, the average conquistador would have survived numerous epidemics, not just smallpox. So in Mexico, the disease spared almost every single adult Castilian while ravaging the natives, which seemed like an extra punishment of the gods of the Mexica uh, and others. Now, for their part, the Spaniards understood that an epidemic was happening, but they didn't really seem to quite grasp the significance or let alone how to stop it. But um, even still, the epidemic gave Cortes an incredible amount of power in the region. The uh, death of the kings in the Teapaca region, along with the chaos generally of the disease, meant that Cortes had become a kingmaker in the region. When kings died in parts of Mexico, near to where Cortes and his forces were, I mean, he basically got to choose who was going to be in charge next. So, for example, when the king of Izucar died of smallpox, Cortes decided to replace him with one of Montezuma's nephews. The Codex Florentine says that in Tenochtitlan, the pox was killing a vast number of our people, Sores erupted on our faces, our breasts, our bellies. We were covered with agonizing sores from head to foot. The illness was so dreadful that no one could walk or move. The sick were so utterly helpless they could only lie on their beds like corpses, unable to move their limbs or even their heads. If they did move their bodies, they screamed with pain. A great many died from this plague, and many others died of hunger. They could not get up to search for food, and everybody else was too sick for them, so they starved in their beds. Unquote. 
Cortes spent time writing back to Spain during this time. He was trying to control his political future as best he could, and meanwhile he was slowly receiving reinforcements. A series of six small expeditions, in fact, arrived at Veracruz, the first from Cuba, captained by Pedro Barba. It arrived with 13 men, one horse, and plenty of yuca bread. Technically, they were supposed to resupply Nervaez, because Diego Velasquez had not yet heard about that bad news, but Barba and his men were quickly to join. So, too, were another small vessel from Cuba, captained by Rodrigo Moreon de Lobera, who likewise fell into Cortes' camp after, uh, at Velasquez's expense, apparently. Uh, Lobera brought eight soldiers, six crossbowmen, and one horse. Lobera apparently also had a big store of extra twine for bowstrings, which the conquistadors made great use of. The third arrival was Diego de Camargo. He had set off as part of a fleet organized by the governor of Jamaica, Francisco de Garay, to make a fortress somewhere north of Veracruz. In total, 150 men left in three ships under, had left Jamaica under the command of Alvarez Pineda, along with seven horses, some guns, and construction materials, but they were promptly defeated by the local Indians, re-embarked, and one ship sank. Many men drowned, Alonso Pineda amongst them. Camargo was the new commander, and he arrived at Villa Rica with a ship full of ill men, but nevertheless, once restored, those 60 survivors gained became part of the expedition of Cortes without hesitation. Garay also thereafter sent a ship to relieve the Alvarez Pineda expedition. This was captured by Miguel D.A. Ox, a hearty, arrogant, rich, and fat conquistador, apparently, who had been one of the first colonists of Puerto Rico in 1511, had obtained a very valuable contract to ship silk clothes across the Atlantic, and sailed along, unable to find the fortress of Pineda, because of course he didn't, what with Pineda being dead and at the bottom of the ocean. He then eventually anchored at Villa Rica de la Vera Cruz. He, his 50 soldiers, seven horses, were warmly welcomed by Cortes at Tepeyaca. Next, Francisco Ramirez the Elder came, also by means of Garay, to resupply Pineda. He brought 40 soldiers, 10 horses, many crossbows and other ornaments too. Finally, Juan de Burgos reached Villa Rica from the Canary Islands at the request of Cortes' business friends in Seville and his father. This was the only ship out of all of the six that I've mentioned which Cortes was even expecting. It was laden with muskets, gunpowder, crossbows, and bolts and several horses. Although the recent arrivals added about, altogether, the recent arrivals added about 200 men to Cortes' force. Though, of course, the newcomers were instantly hated by the original conquistadors, and even those who'd arrived with Narvaez now weren't very fond of them. And, you know, the kind of rivalry that developed between veterans and rookies developed, as often does. Supplied thusly, however, Cortes was so confident that he even now allowed some members of the expedition, mainly some of Velasquez's allies, to return back to Cuba. Uh, there's still a lot of resentment towards Cortes, remember, because men accused him of stealing gold, and so not everybody was happy to remain. And in addition, Cortes also sent two agents back to Spain with letters to the king and orders to try to secure uh, royal support for the conquest. Back in Tenochtitlan, meanwhile, the Mexica installed a new emperor named Cuauhtémoc. He was to secede Cuitlahuac, and he was also, uh, like his successor, or uh, like his predecessor, excuse me, um, staunchly against the Spaniards from the beginning, and he opened his reign as Mexico by promptly killing several of Montezuma's sons, probably to make sure nobody started arguing for appeasement towards the Spanish. He was also from Tantalalco, the city, which I said what is it, was it earlier, separate from Tenochtitlan. The two had grown together. And in fact, was uh, the fact that he was from Tantalalco, not Tenochtitlan, was probably important for a continued Mexica unity. At any rate, he was elected by whatever powerful nobles were left alive at this point. Cuauhtémoc's name means the setting sun, or the falling eagle. The Falling Eagle, excuse me. And it's a fitting name, I think, because he holds the distinction of being the last of the Mexica emperors. Cuauhtémoc attempted to make allies, just as Quitlihuac had done, but he too failed. 
He sent another appeal, for example, to the Taraskans, but the new ruler was just as suspicious as his predecessor has been, and that new Kazoni named Zinichao, Zinka, Zinkicha, excuse me, responded to the request for help by sacrificing the delegation. He had no intent on helping his Mexica enemies. Quetemoc and the Mexica were left to realize that all the old diplomatic sway which the emperor had came from fear. And now, as the Spanish power grew and Cortes began naming kings, well, fear of the Mexica was coming to an end. Additionally, while Quetemoc was very much pro-war with Spain, he does not, like Quitlihuac, come across as having a great military mind. And as such, he wasn't really prepared to take on what was approaching, which was an unconventional war, a European-style siege with a blockade. Cortes was planning to take the city via a deliberate weakening of the population, cutting off the supply of food and water if possible, so that then he could offer it as a jewel, as a feather to his emperor. But at any rate, Quitlahuac was perhaps better suited to this, but the Mexica made by with what they had. In contrast, siege warfare was something Spaniards were very familiar with. The great captain, Hernandez de Cordoba, triumphed uh, famously in 1495 with siege warfare in Italy, and then again in 1503. One of his detractors claimed the real victors were a ditch, a parapet, and an arquebus, uh, to let people know of his distaste for the careful entrenchments and defensive works which the Spanish used to secure victory. And now, Cortes had with him 80 crossbowmen and arquebusiers, 40 horses, 8 or 9 field guns, and though he was a little short on gunpowder, including the crossbowmen and arquebusiers, 550 infantrymen. He assembled these in 9 companies of 60 men each. In addition, and despite the death of Max Katzen, the leadership of Tlaxcala provided a tremendous army. It was reported that Cortes was offered an astonishing force of 80,000 warriors, in fact, but he was unsure of how he would feed so many warriors and ended up taking just a quarter of that. And even if that number is exaggerated, we're talking probably at least 10,000, if not 20,000 Tlaxcalans who accompanied this march. For the Tlaxcala, Hugh Thomas says, the prospect of destroying the Mexica was intoxicating. Now, Cortes gave a speech where uh, he told his allies and his forces that he reassured them that they would be free of the Mexica soon. And from the Tlaxcala perspective, though, they probably thought they would kick Cortes and the Spaniards to the curb once their great war with the Mexica was finally concluded. Of course, they had no idea that this smallpox was just the start of many plagues that were going to decimate their population in the very near future. Cortes set off on December 27, 1520. Perhaps the most important part of his scheme, however, was not yet complete. Martin Lopez was still working on building more ships when the army left Tlaxcala, and on the way, uh, the Tlaxcalans cleared obstacles from the roads which the Mexica had placed to slow the army, and Bernal Diaz reported that they all swore they would never again leave the Valley of Mexico unless they did so victoriously. Now, when the army reached the city of Cotepec, the ruler of that city came out in the night to Cortes and stated that that city intended to fight on his side against the Mexica and gave him a golden chain as a sign of peace. And thereafter, Cortes had another powerful ally, though it's unclear what size exactly he mustered. It is clear that the crumbling of the Aztec Empire began. On the 30th of December, Cortes was next alerted by his horsemen, who rode ahead as scouts, that seven lords from Texcoco were coming, carrying golden banners of peace. Now, that delegation was met peacefully, but Cortes and the Spaniards were still suspicious. On the next day, however, 30, the 31st, when they reached that city at noon, they were well-received, just as the lords had told him. The streets, though, were empty. Cortes was a little suspicious about that, and in fact, from the lodgings they had, he saw that most of the population was now moving out of the town in canoes across the lake to Mexico. The empire was crumbling, yes, but it had not yet entirely collapsed. 
Tezcoco was one of Tenochtitlan's oldest allies. And while this wasn't exactly maybe a trap, the population of the city had largely escaped to Mexica-controlled lands and was therefore able to provide much-needed reinforcements. And Cortes was not very happy about this. He permitted the city to be sacked as a result. The few men found were killed, the women and children declared slaves. This is unfortunate to historians everywhere because uh, the Tlaxcalan spent much of their time during the next three days with the army spent in Texcoso burning the city's palaces. Uh, and one of those palaces in particular uh, contained extensive maps, codices, and genealogical records for the empire. The city served not just as archives, uh, you know, just for the Texcocans, but for all of the Mexican kingdoms. An extraordinary amount of data regarding the history of Mesoamerica was lost as a result of this sack. But the Castilians certainly weren't bothered about it. They were too busy setting up a new puppet king in the empty city. A literal child was chosen this time, so uh, this young boy was uh, basically completely under Cortez control. At any rate, the lords of the two other Tezcocan towns, Huexotla and Cochlitinchan, came to see Cortez and beg his forgiveness. You see, they were merely towns of merchants, they explained. They just wanted to continue running their trade routes, and they didn't have a big problem with Cortez. Texcoco and the surrounding environments were just some of the wealthiest parts of the city, or excuse me, parts of the empire. And so many of the Mexica who lived there were far more interested in maintaining their peaceful position in society than in fighting Spaniards and Tlaxcalans on behalf of Tenochtitlan. Cortes kept much of his force camped in Texcoco for some time, but he left uh, pretty shortly after getting there with 200 men and three to 4,000 Flash Collins on a 20-mile march to Itzapalapa. There, a battle took place where the people of that city came out to face uh, Cortes in arms, and in fact, the Mexica took very drastic measures at Itzapalapa. It's a city on the lake, and... As the Spaniards attacked the city, a massive dike was breached by the Mexica in a dramatic attempt to flood the Spaniards and destroy Cortes. But it just didn't work. Cortes and his allies were riding around on their horses through the city, killing people before withdrawing, before the water became too deep, and perhaps had the Mexica waited longer, they could have drowned the Castilians, who planned on spending the night. However... Had that been the case, many more people from Iztapalapa had died, would have died instead of fleeing, which is what they did do. Another sack followed. Cortes blamed solely on the Flash Collins. The next few weeks were spent similarly, with the lords of some towns like Ozumba and Tepacaluku, for example, offering, offering vassalage to Cortes and for forgiveness. They began supplying maize to the expedition, a critical part of the conquest. The lords of Chalco and Tlamanalco sent word, too, that they would like peace, but that the Mexica garrisons in their cities needed to be dealt with first. The offer of peace from Chalco is an especially noteworthy as a big change in the, in the power uh, I guess, uh, between, the, with the, between the Aztecs and the Spanish, I guess. Cortes sent Sandoval with conquistadors under him to remove the Mexica there. And after several battles, Sandoval was able to emerge successful. Much credit, apparently, is deserving to the Flash Collins, who apparently fought extremely well in these battles as well. And these secured additional maize fields, uh, too. The uh, Tenochtitlan, in fact, was starting to run out of food. Chalco promptly declared itself independent after being uh, after losing the Mexica garrison. At any rate, Cortes offered peace to Tenochtitlan, but Cuauhtémoc was determined to fight to the end, and no answer came of the offer of peace. And by the end of January, rather than attempting peace, he was busy deepening the channels beneath the bridges, making entrenchments stronger, and preparing as many darts and as missiles as possible. In addition, by now the Mexica actually had quite a few weapons from the Castilians. They'd killed hundreds of them, after all, and El Noche Triste, and so Spanish steel was now found on both sides of the battle, albeit the Mexica had a far, excuse me, smaller supply. 
Guatemoc also sent out Mexica forces to try to secure the support of other towns of the lake. But when he did persuade two such towns to his side, Cortes just set out again, scattered the Mexica armies, and the leaders of those towns ended up apologizing to Cortes, receiving pardons, and they promised to never help the Mexica again. Tenochtitlan was increasingly becoming isolated. In February, Cortes's army reached the western side of the lake. He visited two more cities once there, Teayuca, Teneyuca, excuse me, and Azcapotzalco. Five days after leaving Texcoco, he then also reached Tacuba. Tacuba is the smallest of the three cities of the Triple Alliance, but it was one of the main cities of the Triple Alliance. Heavy fighting ensued when the Spanish and Tlaxcalans tried to enter the city, and when they succeeded, the Tlaxcalans burned Tacuba as a punishment for helping Mexico. The next day, Cortes went out and looked at the causeway where so many of his comrades had died last time they escaped Tenochtitlan. It had been rebuilt. He and his men, uh, and so he and his men rode farther than they should have done down it, and the Mexica began attacking with addle addles from rooftops of the small island which the Spanish were on. Several conquistadors were killed before Cortez ordered a retreat. Day after day, however, Cortes did that same thing. He continued sallying forth down the causeway, fighting skirmishes over the course of six days in a row, during which time the two enemies' uh, armies taunted each other. In one instance, a Castilian shouted to the Mexica, they would all die of hunger. In response, the Mexica said when they needed food, they would eat Castilians and Tlaxcalans, and promptly tossed some maize tortillas to Cortes in contempt. Take and eat this if you are hungry. We are in no need of it. Perhaps because it seemed like Tenochtitlan was on the verge of surrender, the Spaniards once again had a lot of time to consider how Cortes had been stealing gold from them. Mutiny erupted once more within the ranks of the conquistadors, this time under a certain Antonio de Valafaña, who was supposedly planning to kill Cortes, and that's when one soldier told Cortes about it, and in fact also that Villafaña had already gotten the agreement of 300 men under his command. Well, Cortes had Villafaña arrested and condemned to be hanged after the confession, and he also made a brilliant play. He had obtained Villafaña's list of co-plotters. Yeah, three fucking hundred of them. Well, Cortes pretended that Villafaña, though, had swallowed the list of mutineers, and so that Cortes never got to see it. He told everyone he never saw it. And so half the fucking army, just about, mind you, was then free and clear of any potential charges. It also meant that that half the army wasn't suspicious that Cortes might later try to enact some revenge for their signing up for the mutiny, except for one plotter, the shipmaster Diego Diaz, who was going to be taking some of the other mutineers back to Cuba, was tried and hanged as well. But at any rate, Cortes's army was still growing because a seventh expedition arrived, in, uh, this time with additional supplies under the command of Rodrigo de Bastides. In 1500, Bastides had discovered the Gulf of Urabo with the infamous Juan de la Cosa, who was very concerned, and he was very concerned that all of the slaves he had was dying of smallpox. His principal occupation, in fact, was slave trader. And so when uh, Bastides heard about Cortes' expedition, he saw an opportunity to get into, I guess, a new line of business, or a slightly new line of business. With three ships, Bastidas brought many arquebusers, gunpowder, and swords. Sixty men, six horses, no, two, excuse me, two hundred men, sixty horses, and one Father Pedro Melgarejo de Urea. I specifically mention Father Urea because he had with him papal bulls with the power to absolve conquistadors of anything which they should have confessed that they did, and so Urea returned Seville a very wealthy man. At any rate, on April 13th, Cortes left for the city of Tepustlan, which could only be entered by bridges, which of course were down, but two locals betrayed to the Spanish where that one one of the bridges uh, was not, excuse me, one of the crossways was not deep, and so the town was taken via this this secret path. 
The leaders there offered themselves as vassals, like so many other towns had been doing. Next, Cortes went to Xochimilco. They found uh, another difficult battle. But once again, Cortes's army proved victorious, and by this point, Cortes had defeated or subjugated nearly every city on the lake, and so he went back to Texcoco, reassembled his forces, and prepared to deploy the brigs. In order to launch said brigantines, thousands of men from the towns near Texcoco were had secretly working on digging a canal 12 feet deep, 12 feet wide, and a mile and a half long. That enabled the ships to launch from their equally secret construction site into the lake. All this secrecy, of course, being necessary because the Mexica, with their thousands of canoes, just would have destroyed the ships had they seen them being built on the other side of the lake. As it was, on April 28th, 12 brigantines were launched. Each could carry between 25 and 30 men, and each carried a small bronze cannon in the bow. Cortes uh, then split his army into four divisions, three on land and the fourth to be under his direct supervision, divided onto the brigantines. When the navy was, before the navy was ready, Cortes had been sending part of his force to try to level a causeway in order to allow the army to enter Tenochtitlan, but had been being attacked by canoes. Thirty Castilians had thus far been injured in the process, but on June 1st, the tide of the naval battle changed. The brigantines were launched, and in fact, thanks to the Mexica having destroyed the dike earlier, all the lakes were connected, making naval operations much easier. So began a great siege that was mainly fought in those days of uh, late May, early June by Tlaxcalans and other native allies. Um, often the brigantines would penetrate the city and their crews would burn homes on either side of the canals, but despite bite fighting all day, little Spanish movement seems to have occurred in the other than the naval action during the early days of the siege, the main occupation of Cortes and his army was to try to block the north causeway out of the city. That was the last road in and out of Tenochtitlan, which was controlled by the Mexica. It took some time for Cortes to get troops to the north causeway, and this critical lifeline therefore allowed the Mexica to continue to bring food into the city. But eventually, a force under the command of Sandoval arrived with three brigs, 23 horses, 18 crossbowmen, 100 foot soldiers, and after a few skirmishes, the northern route was taken. Tenochtitlan was surrounded. On June 10th, Cortes made a push into the city. He led 200 men up a causeway, right ahead of a huge army of Indian allies. Cortes is 80,000, but that's got to be an exaggeration, still, if even if it was just one-tenth of that figure, 8,000 men charging down the causeway would be a terrifying force. Cortes and his army burned and destroyed homes on their way to the great square of the great temple, where the captain then set up some guns, fired them off, and then chased the fleeing Mexica to the temple compound itself. By this point, however, the horsemen started retreating back to their quarters, and the Mexica rallied. They drove the Spanish back from the temple and ultimately drove Cortes right back into the street, leading to the causeway, and Cortes was forced to retreat so hastily that he had to leave one of the cannons in the square. The Mexica tossed it into the lake. A seesaw battle ensued. Later in the day, the horsemen returned. The Spaniards again reoccupied the temple for some time before withdrawing at dusk, the Mexica threw and dropped stones from the heights of the city as the Castilians retreated. Cortes' dream of handing over this great Venice was becoming less and less likely as a result with each engagement. Instead, he was faced with the prospect that victory might very well mean the destruction of Tenochtitlan. The Indian allies continued in a different side of sea saw battle. Each day, men from Cholula, Pascala, Texcoco, and Huitzinco were filling in holes in the causeways, and each night, men from the Mex Mexica men went out from Tenochtitlan and did their best to deepen the causeways. But over time, this was a losing battle. More warriors arrived to Cortez's side every day. Substantial numbers of men from Xochimilco came. So too did Otomi peoples from the north. All offered forgiveness for their delay in offering vassaldom to the king of Spain. On June 15th, 
Cortez made another major attack into the center of the city. The Mexica there continued to make breaches in the roads and causeways, but Cortez was able to sail brigantines close to the breaches, and the, the ships gave great cover to the army as they crossed the gaps. So before long, once again, the Spaniards were in the main square of Tenochtitlan. Once again, they were met with a tremendous level of opposition, and the Mexica ultimately pushed the Castilians out of the city again. But this time, the uh, counterattacks against the Castilians were less effective because the Indian allies were more uh, were were prepared. They were clearing the escape route of obstacles before the retreat even began. By the time Cortez lost this engagement and was forced out, he fully realized the opposition he faced, though. The Mexica were going to destroy the Spaniards or be destroyed themselves. He would not be handing over a jewel of the city, and in fact, he wasn't even sure he'd be recovering the gold he previously left here anymore. Cortez set fire to the palace of Axayacato, the palace which he had previously stayed on, in the square on June 15th. Previously, uh, this was just an outrage, too. Uh, the, the Mexico were probably just actually just started fighting harder, if I can imagine, as a result of this. And days of destruction followed. Cortez's army set about deliberately, carefully, and methodically taking the city apart, building by building. The Clash Collins could not have been more eager to participate. And in fact, none of the Indian allies were all that bothered by it. And only some of the Castilians seemed bothered, like Cortez, mostly because of the loss of potential profit, rather than, say, a humanitarian crisis which they were causing. Or much less the destruction of, you know, priceless archaeological treasures. Cortez said, uh, or excuse me, Cortez saw he could not win otherwise. True, Spain might reign triumphant regardless, but for him to succeed, he needed to do so with this campaign, and as he saw it, this was the only way. Hugh Thomas tells us one change immediately noticed was the result in the result of Cortez's new policy was that in addition to the noise of gunpowder, the shouting of the Mexican war cries, the neighing of horses. Now there was also the sound of the destruction of great buildings by fire, the smell of dust, and the shrieks of men and women caught in falling masonry. Com uh, Cortez accomplished uh, the task of um, demolishing the city mainly by splitting his force. He attacked the city to penetrate it from multiple directions at the same time now, escorted by his brigantines and day by day an increasingly large naval force in as well of Indian allies and canoes. But the Mexica were still not yet beaten. Despite the odds, they continued to fight and to adapt. On June 23rd, they set a trap and managed to impale several brigantines and posts set in the water. The men who retreated had to leave, in fact, so quickly that five Spaniards were left behind and were sacrificed. And in fact, had it not been for some timely horsemanship and cannon work, according to Alvarado, who was commanding this group, the disaster would have been worse. Alvarado didn't do such a good job of commander during the siege as he would have, you would have wanted him to if you were Cortez. I mentioned him specifically that Cortez probably should have fired him a long time ago. During this siege, he reportedly, in fact, didn't in fact always have time to fulfill all his duties as commander namely making sure his soldiers were properly filling in holes in the causeways necessary to allow the army to move quickly. Um, Cortez apparently lectured Alvarado on the importance of doing this. Alvarado apparently replied that he was too busy going to Tacuba each night so that he could ensure a proper supply of crossbows and other equipment. But if that sounds suspicious to you, it is because it is suspicious, and the real reason he was going apparently was that his mistress was in Tacuba, and Alvarado preferred to get back early after a nice day of fighting to her. Anyway, the Mesha continued to use hidden water traps, and later in the month they were able to ground and attack another brig as it traveled down one of the back canals. Fifteen Castilians on board were captured, many of the others seriously wounded, and if it hadn't been for the fact that another brig was there and the second was able to bump free the other one, uh, the ship was saved. And I think we've got to admire the ability of the Aztecs here to continue to find new strategies to deal with the Spaniards. I mean, these brigantines a year ago were something they had never seen before and were drawing on 
uh, cotton as floating mountains or floating temples. Um, regardless, Cortez' victory was near, and he began to believe again that the Mexica might even surrender. By that point, the supply of food from the countryside was cut off completely. Many of the Chinapa farms of the lake and the city's canals were destroyed, and by the end of the month, the brigs had been able to almost completely stop the, low, the fishing and low-scale hunting, which Mexica men did on the lake uh, to get a lot of their protein. Now, they did have stores of maize, the city did, but this meant strict rationing. And as a result, a group of noblemen led by two more of Montezuma's sons tried to negotiate with the Castilians, and Cuauhtémoc had them executed. In return, some of their followers murdered the high priests of Huitzilopochtli and Texdepoca in revenge. Now, Cuauhtémoc was prepared to fight to the end, but the ability for the Mexica to wage war was ending. By the end of that month, they were forced to abandon numerous precincts in the city to consolidate their power in just a few neighborhoods, and before long after that, they were forced to consolidate themselves again into just a single section of the city, uh, part of Tlatelolco that represented about an eighth of the entire city's size. Still, day after day, brave Mexica men rallied, fighting attacks on three fronts. They, day after day, redug ditches in the causeways, and day after day, generally inflicted more damage on their opponents than one might have even supposed possible, considering their weapons were merely sticks and stones. Even after a full month of siege, it was impossible for the Spanish to travel down streets wherein the buildings had not been demolished or burned, but by this point, political power amongst the Mexica had shifted entirely, basically, to the citizens of Tlatelolco. That's where everybody was holed up, the majority of the surviving population, in fact, by this point, was people from Tlatelolco, uh, which is probably why Cuatema came from there, not Tenochtitlan in the first place. Um, the emperor moved his headquarters to the city at some point during that siege. We just don't know the exact day. But as difficult as things were for the Mexica, they still had hope. As July began, the attacks of the Spanish began to falter for a few days, and the Mexica even captured a Spanish battle standard. For a few days, they really did begin to hope. Was this not an event, an omen of good things to come? Then they nearly got an even greater prize. Cortes, when he attempted his next major push into Latalalco, he and the army were stopped on the causeway. The Spaniards were pushed back, and the Allies, instead of rushing in behind them, just smashed into the Spaniards, essentially, and the whole army began to panic on the causeway. The Mexica responded brilliantly. They sent a raid of canoes into the water quickly, and those Marine commandos proceeded to start capturing a lot of Castilians and Indians. One Mexica even grabbed Cortes himself, the great Cordillo, the architect, of what had been up to this point perhaps the greatest military adventure of all time. Well, now he was found himself being dragged off the causeway to be led to the sacrificial stone. His life was saved by Cristobal de Olea, a clever swordsman from Medina el Campo, who, with a skillful and timely stroke, cut that Aztec's hands off as he was dragging away the greatest prize in Mexico. Then Olea, along with Cortes' bodyguard, were able to help Cortes back to safety. The Mexica also had heroes in these battles. One was a warrior named Ekatsin. He belonged to the military order Otomitl. These were composed of men who swore never to retreat. Ekatsin was reportedly such an outstanding launcher of large stones that he personally killed and wounded countless Spaniards, and they began to fear his throws. He bedeviled the Spaniards, though. Throughout the siege, sometimes he wore his costume, and other times he was disguised as a common soldier, his head always uncovered, as was the custom of the Otomito, like a reverse Mandalorian. This defeat was terrible for Cortes, albeit he was still alive. Twenty Castilians, including Olea, were killed in the battle. Another fifty-three were captured, and 200 Indian allies lost their lives. One cannon was lost, and another brig had been burned. That night was especially depressing and mournful for the Spanish army, too. Bernal Diaz wrote, quote, 
when they got them up to the little square in front of the shrines of the gods, the pyramids of, Mex of Mexico, by the way, were designed so that religious events like sacrifices could be witnessed from far away, quote, we, placed them, we saw them place plumes on their heads, and with things like fans, they forced them to dance before the god which to Lepochtli. Then they placed them on their backs on some stones, and with large flint knives, they sawed open their chests and drew out their palpitating hearts and offered them to their gods. They kicked the bodies down the steps, and Indian butchers, who were waiting below, cut off the arms and legs and flayed the faces with the beard still on for use in drunken fiestas, while the bodies were eaten with mole. The stomachs and guts they threw to the tigers, lions, and snakes, which were kept in the wild animal zoo, unquote. The Florentine Codex says that some Castilians wept, some sang. One went about crying while striking his mouth with the palm of his hand when it was all over. The Aztecs strung the heads of the Spaniards on a skull rack, along with the heads of four horses. The Castilians sat glumly as they watched these things, accompanied by the constant and terrifying beat of drums for hours. Here, in fact, we see perhaps just how powerful this symbolic warfare of the Mexica could be, the flowery war. I mean, there's plenty of times during the conquest with this obsession with capturing people and the elaborate costumes are doing nothing good at all for the war effort, and in fact might even be literally, are literally hindering the war machine. But in the early days of July, 1521, the pomp and circumstance associated with human sacrifice transformed this moderate success, success against the scamp Spaniards into just a crippling defeat for Cortes and his army. They literally seem unable to do anything except for listen and watch as the sights and sounds of sacrifice and celebration went on for four days Literally, four days, and the Spanish army just sat there, paralyzed in fear. Guatemoc, in contrast, used that break in hostilities as an opportunity to send messengers to the chiefs of Chalco, Xochimilco, Cuernavaca, and elsewhere, so he could showcase the flayed heads of his bearded war captives, as well as their hands and feet, in an attempt to gain allies. He said horses' heads, too and assured the lords half the invaders had been killed and the rest were wounded. Huitzilopochtli had not abandoned the Mexica. The messenger stated instead that the Tlaxcala and other Indian allies had fled Cortes during the night. Beyond all of this, the Mexica were now learning to use crossbows, and in fact, Quantahamac had captured five crossbowmen whom he spared the sacrificial stone, intent instead on turning them into a force against their own brethren. Those five Spaniards, when ordered to shoot their comrades, instead shot high into the air so that the arrows missed. The Mexica ended up killing them, of course, and tried to learn how to use the crossbows themselves. Now, at any rate, Cortes realized the Mexica were rallying support, and each day brought news of what he termed rebellions in his letters. His chief problem was the city of Cuernavaca, which had accepted Castilian rule in the spring when Cortes visited, but now had been attacked by a Mexican army, which had been spurred into the action by the heads of the dead conquistadors. The city needed help, and providing that sort of help in, that sort of in this sort of situation was the key to Cortes keeping the alliance of city-states he had under him united against the Mexica. Now, it also probably didn't help that Cuernavaca, from Cortes' perspective, was on the trade route to the gold-producing regions of Mexico. So Cortes was especially keen to help right away. He sent Andres de Tapia with 80 foot and 10 horse south to restore the loyalty of the city, a campaign which Tapia conducted with a remarkable success, apparently. He managed to force the enemy army out of the city and into hiding in the surrounding hills. Cortes also forced another expedition south, or excuse me, was he was also forced to send another expedition a few days later in support of his Otomi allies. They were battling resurgent forces of Quatemoc as well. In addition, another portion of his force had to turn back uh, to Tlaxcala. They were running out of food and other supplies. 
So when a Mexica army from Tulla then approached Cortez's forces from the rear, and he had to spend yet another uh, legion of troops to meet them face to face, um, well, in short order, Cortez went from having Tenochtitlan completely surrounded to being fearful of a potential counterattack on his headquarters. Uh, his forces were now spread so thin, but the Spaniards uh, there at the camp were even envisioning a second Noche Triste after June 30th. But no attack came from the front. By the middle of July, it was clear to Cortez and the other Castilians, in fact, that because the Mexica were now short of food and water and exhausted, they weren't able to mount the attack necessary to defeat the Castilians in this moment of weakness. The Tlaxcalans, thus, were perhaps the first to realize that their enemies were in the throes of defeat. The Spaniards were still tending their wounded and dreading whatever nightmares another night of sacrifices were going to give them when the Tlaxcalan commander, his name was uh, Chichimactecle, made a raid into the city without Spanish participation at all. For the first time, as far as we are aware, uh, that uh, a native army performed such an action without Cortez commanding them. But the Tlaxcalan native bowmen attacked, captured a bridge, and made a strategic retreat at nightfall with many prisoners, and it was this victory, it seems, more than anything else, that seems specifically responsible for knocking the Spaniards and Cortez out of the funk that they had gotten themselves into after witnessing 50 of their friends get sacrificed. Daily battles continued, as the Spaniards returned to skirmishing in the city with their Tlaxcalan allies after that initial raid, the Mexica became less effective than they had been in the past in reopening the defensive fortifications at night, and by now, Tenochtitlan simply had far too few people remaining. There was too little food and too few left alive to fight the Spanish any longer. A few days later, in fact, the, Sp the Mexica were forced to stop rebuilding the fortifications altogether. There just weren't enough warriors left to do that. And to make up for the lack of manpower, the women left alive were pressed into service as warriors. On July 22nd, Cortez and Sandoval led an ambush against the Mexica, and in the morning they succeeded in fully driving the last of any Mexica resistance from the major roadways. The entire city was under Spanish control, except for that one little section, what was left of it. Still, the Mexica continued to fight. On June 27th, Cortez sent Alvarado in command of his forces to take the market. He and his men fought a motley collection of merchants and women, with mixed in with whatever soldiers were left. And in the, later in the day, Cortez saw smoke coming from the temple of Tetelalco. The next morning, Cortez rode with Alvarado around the square. He climbed the steps of the great temple of Tetelalco, yet still there was no surrender. The courage of their enemies shocked and impressed the Spaniards. They reported that the Mexica, this late in the war, were still taunting them and the Tlaxcala for burning the city. They told the Tlaxcala that the Tlaxcalans would rebuild it either by Mexica or Spanish overlords, and even in their weakened state. They continued to find energy for fighting. They remained a dangerous foe for folks on the ground, boots on the ground, I guess, even in these late days. And it's not like the Mexica didn't debate on what to do. They wanted peace for what it's worth, it seemed, but even the emperor and his captains wanted peace, but they just... They seemed, for some reason, unable to just make any gesture of surrender. The Aztecs were a people too proud. They owned too much might too recently to surrender. The shock of a recently won empire just suddenly falling apart just meant that they were just unable to stop fighting. Their pride was too great. But ultimately leadership did realize that if they could not personally ask for peace, then they must at least abandon the city. On the morning of April 13th, the emperor, along with many other Mexica, fled across the lake in their canoes. 
they were probably going to retreat to Atsapazalco, where perhaps the emperor might have raised the standard of the Mexica against Cortes and continued to fight. But news of the emperor fleeing the city was not hidden. The Spaniards found out, and the brigantines began patrolling the lake to look with him for him with strict orders to take the emperor alive. When Cortes entered the precinct that had up to this point still been controlled by the Mexica, he wrote of the conditions that, quote, it was beyond our understanding how they could endure it, unquote. But the suffering of the Mexica was not over. The Tlaxcalans killed a large number of the remaining citizens. A few more were captured and then sacrificed, and finally, on that day, the 13th, most of the remaining Mexica surrendered without a fight. Quatemoc and other leaders had departed in 50 canoes with as much gold and treasure as they had remaining, as well as food, women, and children, but they were captured on the lake. All but one of the canoes, in fact, stopped when a brigantine approached. The Spanish captain gave chase to the remaining canoe. When it did not stop, he loaded and aimed his cannon at them. Finally, the rowers asked for peace. They stated they had an important person aboard, and the emperor, Quatemoc, stood. He armed himself, and even this late in the stage, he prepared for battle. Though finally now, as he surveyed, personally, the number of Spaniards on the deck of the brig, he finally surrendered as well. When Cortes greeted the fallen empire, he had only one thing on his mind. What of the gold? Cortes asked. In return, he received all the gold which had been in the canoes. Is this all? The Cardillo grew angry. This was a trivial sum in comparison to what he had lost in El Noche Triste. Cortes pointed to the bridge where he had lost his fortune. You forced us to drop it there. You will produce it all. The captains were nervous, but they could produce nothing of what Cortez asked. It isn't even clear if they were aware of what treasure he spoke of. In the days that followed, Tlaxcalan and Texcocan warriors continued seeking retribution for past crimes as the Spaniards continued to search for gold, which they nevertheless really didn't recover much of. Perhaps it was at the bottom of the lake. Perhaps Montezuma had it recollected and hidden. But Montezuma was dead. No one could ask him. At any rate, Spaniards scavenged for gold to the city like pigs. But the only treasure they found, which they desired anyway, was human flesh. Their surviving Mexica became Spanish concubines, if they were desirable young women, or they were branded and sold as slaves, if they were men or otherwise undesirable. The estimates for the casualties vary widely. Father Lopez de Gomara suggested that the Castilians lost only 50 men, six horses, and that the Mexica lost 100,000, quote, not including those who desired, died from disease and hunger, unquote. Bernal Diaz, on the other hand, put that number higher. He said just a sh little bit less than 100 Spaniards died during the, uh, the final siege. The Florentine Codex states that more than 30,000 Flash Collins died and that over 240,000 Mexica died, including almost every single member of the nobility. The siege lasted nearly three months, and probably 100 dead Castilians might be just about accurate, though in the two years since reaching Mexico from 1519 to 1521, 1,000 out of 1,800 Europeans who entered the country were dead. The Mexica civilization were brutal and warlike, but it was also artistic in ways that kind of remind me of ancient Greece or Renaissance Europe. It's a poem I have here that was written shortly after the conquest anyway, and it gives us, I think, insight into both the profound loss which the Mexica felt, and in fact how they processed that defeat within the terms of their own worldview. Quote, it was called the Jaguar Sun. Then it happened that the sky was crushed. The sun did not follow its course. When the sun arrived at noon, immediately it was dark. And when it became dark, jaguars ate the people. The giants greeted each other thusly. Do not fall down, for whoever falls down falls forever. Unquote. 
The Castilians had a banquet rather than write poetry. The next day was a drunken revelry. Two days after that, uh, or excuse me, the two days after the conquest, the next day after that, the conquistadors had a mask and a mass and celebrated the birth of New Spain. So ended the Aztec Empire, and so fell the Mexica. Hugh Thomas leaves us with an excellent passage that gives us some insight into the mind of Hernan Cortez, and I think allows us to reflect on what occurred. Quote, the sense of triumph felt by Cortez at these moments was touched with melancholy. Time and again in his account of the last stages of the siege, he had used phrases such as, we could not be but saddened by their determination to die. There was also the destruction of Tenochtitlan to consider, the prospect he had once had of capturing a beautiful city of which he had first learned when he was still at Veracruz had surely fired his imagination. Now it was rubble. Sacred books had been destroyed in hundreds. Cortes had organized a complicated siege. He had inspired the brigantines, built an unlikely alliance with Indian subject peoples through clever diplomacy. He even made an alliance between Extremeños and the Castilians. He had seen friends killed. He'd won a great victory with modest losses to his own men. His fellow conquistadors had fought bravely against what seemed, especially in the beginning, to have been enormous odds. For a time, he and his friends seemed to have looked upon by some Mexica at least as being reincarnations of deities. But the in, in the end, to be honest, it had been the Mexica who fought like gods, unquote. This was the end of one empire and the start of something new, but of course that is a story for another episode, our next episode, in fact, The Conquest of New Spain. We're going to focus precisely on that. There's still questions left, like what happens to Cortes? Does he receive the legal justification he requires for the crown? What about his companions? Did everyone get along as, started, as soon as they started divvying up the gold fairly, or did they start keep fighting? What about the remaining Mexica? The Tlaxcalans? What about the other peoples of Mexico? Well, all of that and more will be coming soon. As for us, let us end by considering who is responsible for the conquest. Now, Hugh Thomas, the undisputed master, in my opinion, raises Cortez above all others as the crucial element in this mixture to Thomas, Cortez was audacious. Obviously, I agree with that. Cortez was filled with, quote, a hint of imagination, impertinence, a capacity to perform unexpected, which differentiates audacity from mere valor. Cortez was also decisive, flexible, had had few scruples. One does not have to be a believer in any special theory that great men dominate history to see at once that Cortez's combination of intelligence, prudence, bravery, and originality were decisive in the extraordinary events of Mexico, Mexico between 1519 and 1521, end quote. I couldn't agree more, except I also keep going back and wondering, well, what if Cortez wasn't there? I mean, don't the Mexicas still lose eventually? Well, my answer is yes, of course they do. So as great as Hugh Thomas is, and if you want even more detail, again, I definitely recommend his book. The conclusion he has is full of shit. I mean, just completely full of shit. I mean, he's not wrong in stating that Cortez is a wily son of a bitch and not a great person to have as an adversary. An adversary. Cortez is, in fact, not just a dangerous opponent and strategist, but literally one of the greatest strategists of all fucking time. But at the same time, had Cortez failed... Well, the Spanish would have just simply conquered Mexico anyway in a few years of that. I mean, once smallpox hits, and that was going to happen no matter what, and it makes the conquest, well, inevitable. So yuck. If I think the conquest was inevitable, then that means I almost agree with William H. Prescott, who's right, but also so, so fucking wrong. Cause he's, I mean, he's right for the, all the wrong reasons. Prescott was certain the Spanish won because it was inevitable 
that Christian civilization would triumph over barbarians. And Prescott is a great historian, a great writer. He's also a racist, and he doesn't know shit about... He literally does not know beans about disease. Disease did make the Spanish victory in Mexico inevitable, but Christianity sure didn't. And in fact, Prescott's actually so racist at times. Whenever he describes Mexican, these temples, the Chinapa farms, or any of their achievements, he has to go on these long side rhymes to justify his creation of a quote-unquote middle tier of civilizations so that he can place the Aztecs, you know, below the Spanish. And like I said, he doesn't understand disease at all. Now, my theory, that disease, not Cortez, and that's not my theory, really, but it was responsible for anything, is still echoed by people like Hugh Thomas and these great historians. Hugh Thomas, don't get me wrong, attributes a lot to disease. He just thinks, I think, I guess, Cortez should be rated higher than smallpox, which is wrong. And if I want to get in a fight with Hugh Thomas anyway about it, though, I better get in line, because Bernal Diaz made it quite clear who was responsible, that it was the Spanish under Cortes, the soldiers, not the Caudillo, who won the conquest. And at any rate, I'm not sure he's right either, though, because I'm not sure if Cortes or the Spaniards deserve the majority of the credit. Um, even as a racist as William Prescott state it was, he stated, quote, it would be unjust to the Aztecs themselves, or at least their military prowess, to regard the conquest as directly achieved by the Spaniards alone. This would indeed be to arm the latter with the charmed shield of Ruggiero, or the magic lance of Astolfo, or of returning its hundreds at a touch. The Indian Empire was in a manner conquered by Indians. The first terrible encounter of the Spaniards with the Tlaxcalans, which had nearly proved their ruin, did in fact ensure their success. The Aztec monarchy fell by the hands of its own subjects, under the direction of European sagacity and science. Had it been united, it might have bidden defiance to the invaders. Its fight, fate may serve as a striking proof that a government, which does not rest on the sympathies of its subjects, cannot long abide. That human institutions, when not connected with human prosperity and progress, must fall. If not before the increasing light of civilization, then by the hand of violence. By violence from within, if not from without. And who shall lament their fall? Unquote. Prescott is not alone in this opinion. Ross Hassig makes a very compelling case that it certainly wasn't Cortez, and it frankly wasn't the Spaniards at all. It was the Tlaxcalans and other natives who made for the key ingredient in the recipe for the conquest. If it weren't for the tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of warriors who aided Cortez, in fact, well, where would they have been then? I'll tell you where. Cortez would have had his chest split open, and his still beating heart would have been given to Huitzilopochtli. That's where. Hasig writes, quote, in the final stage of the conquest, the siege of Tenochtitlan, the Spaniards amounted to less than 1% of the total forces, and perhaps less than one-half of 1%. What made the conquest of Mexico possible was not Spanish military might, which was modest, but the assistance of tens or even hundreds of thousands of Indian allies, laborers, porters, cooks, and especially soldiers. Unquote. That's absolutely true. But here, too, I can't entirely discount the fact that before the Clash Collins were allies and the Tex Cocans were allies or anybody else, the Spanish defeated them in battle first, or at least forced a draw. Now, that doesn't mean natives were forced to ally with the Spanish. On the contrary, the experience fighting the Spanish just seems to have taught them the various people of Mexico of, hey, you know, I think I should be friends with this guy with the boomstick over here. And so I'm considering that, and, and so considering this, I'm again left with the opinion that without smallpox, the conquest would have had very different results for people like, say, the Tlash Collins. But now, okay, with all of this says, part of me realizes this, what I'm doing is not very fun. So let's discount disease. 
We're going to break this down mathematically for a second. And really, what other podcast tries its best to never have a second six-hour episode and follows that up sometime, somehow with a seven-hour episode, and then at the end of a seven-hour episode decides to let's have some quote-unquote fun by breaking this down mathematically. Look, this is just straight-up quality entertainment here, let me tell you. You just don't get this anywhere else. Well, okay, for now. Let's say we all agree that disease makes a Spanish victory inevitable over time. Let's just take the short period of time, starting in 1519, ending in 1521. We're not talking about what could happen anymore. We're talking about what did happen. Now, obviously, what Cortez did was very important. Everything Hugh Thomas says about him is true, except that he is the key to understanding the conquest. Let's give him 15% of the credit. But I'm also very swayed by Bernal Diaz, that it was the soldiers. So let's give them another 15% of the credit. And I can't in any way, with that said, give the Tlaxcalans and the others less than 15% of the credit. So with that said, I think the weapons, and especially the dogs or the horses, maybe even more than the steel and the gunpowder, deserve a little bit of the credit too. Let's say 5% goes just to the weaponry of the of the Spaniards. I think that puts us at 55%, but it's uh, been talking for seven hours. Now, that gives us... Let's le- go with Montezuma. Now, I guess we could say he gets the blame, not the credit, but I think in the same is, a, is uh, for the Mexica tactics and less effective weaponry. So I think let's give them both 10% of the blame, but that adds in this you know, 10% credit or blame, however you want to say it. 10% each. That gives us 75%. Not counting disease from the years 15, 7, 1519 to 1521. And you might be wondering where I would assign that last 25% portion. Where should that go? So whoever gets that last 25%, well, I can assure you that person, if it indeed is a person, is a great man in history. Or more specifically, a great woman of history. In the late 15th century, a woman was born in Mexico to a noble family, and I can't prove it, but it is my belief that she was probably educated far more than the average woman in Mexico of her day who would have been tasked with essentially nothing but weaving cotton, making tortillas, and raising children. Instead, perhaps her father or a male sibling taught this woman some of what he had learned or was learning and uh, topics that normally only men learned in Mexico. Young noblemen in Mexico, in fact, attended very prestigious Kalmakeks where they learned, most importantly above all, how to rule a great empire. Now, at any rate, I say that because later in her life, this woman will display a remarkable amount, not level, not just of intelligence, but of political savvy that to me, I think, indicates education in fields like politics. Even if I'm wrong, though, she displays a remarkable level of intelligence, judging by her ability merely just to learn new languages. Her family, which may or may not have been secretly teaching their daughter things which normally only men would learn in the 16th century, was led by a father who angered a very important Mexica official. And as a punishment, his daughter was set off to be married in a far-off realm in the backwater, hundreds of miles from Tenochtitlan in the Valley of Mexico, which was the center of culture, art, and everything that a young noble woman like herself would have been accustomed to enjoy in life. And instead, as a punishment, she would live in the Yucatan, in a colony near where the Maya states were, which were experiencing what might be best described as a dark age. This woman, of course, is Melina, Melanali, La Malinche, whatever you want to call her. When she met Cortez and the Spaniards to serve as interpreter and mistress, 
Cortez's plans included secretly starting up a colony on the coast of Veracruz to break free from control of Diego, um, Diego Velazquez and to get wealthy while doing it. But his plans certainly did not involve gathering an army of native allies, taking it to Tenochtitlan, and making himself king. But when Melina attached herself Cortez, that soon began to change. Cortez soon began to talk about gathering an army of allies, of going to Tenochtitlan, of conquering a capital. Before Melina, the Spaniards were a powerful force, practically a force of nature in Mexico. But they were ignorant and directionless. Once Melina attached herself to Cortez, suddenly the expedition didn't just have an interpreter, and I mean a better interpreter than Alec. Aguilar. I mean, she knew Nahuatl, and she didn't, and that was in critical, uh, you know, knowing Nahuatl is of critical importance in and of itself. But Molina was an interpreter with an impressive background in Mexica society. She was more than a translator. She was capable of navigating Cortez through a political geography of numerous cities, kings, and provincial lords with all the skill and cultural capital of a high-ranking noble. Melina was someone who not only had the intelligence and cultural sophistication, too, to lead Cortez through a diplomatic maze of building a new alliance, but was someone who clearly and specifically had an axe to grind against the Mexica. Who knows? Maybe if it was even the emperor himself who had sentenced her banishment. Melina could explain nuance and metaphor to Cortez. She could explain translations. This is what he said, but this is what he means, sort of thing. She was also someone who could make sure that every gesture and phrase which Cortez spoke to potential allies sounded just perfect. But at the same time, she could inform Cortez when she thought or wanted him to think, maybe, that the Mexica might be lying to him. If a delegation or Montezuma from Mexico said something to Cortez, perhaps Mel Melinche might have responded, well, that's what he said, but he's lying and this is the truth. Well, the more I think about it, You know, I'm, I'm not normally the type of person who likes to give credit to just one person or just one part of a story as a critical element. But, you know, the more I think about everything I've just said, well, that adds up to about 25% right there from Alina, great woman in history, translator of Cortez's army and the secret architect of the fall of the, fall of the Mexica. Hell hath no fury like a woman scorned, as they say. Well, until next time, my friends, or in Nahuatl, if you prefer, Timo Itzake. Hey, fellow the pirates, come and listen what I say. The captain is a tyrant and I know like girl. I'm sick of taking orders from the madman in command So let's drop him on an island and leave him in the sand Cause it's a mutiny It's a mutiny It's a mutiny And now we're taking over the ship It's a mutiny It's a mutiny It's a mutiny And now we're taking over the ship What's happening here? You're no longer in control and we're drinking up your beer. This is now a democratic, eagerly tearing pirate ship. So enjoy your trip. Oh. Cause it's a mutiny. It's a mutiny. This is a mutiny. And now we're taking over the ship. It's a mutiny. It's a mutiny. It's a mutiny. And now we're taking over the ship.
the ship. 